everybody. To day three of the NEC Wheelchair Tennis Masters, I'm Paul Walker broadcasting courtside from the beautiful national campus here in Lake Nona, Florida, home of the United States Tennis Association. And today we've got uh, a wonderful day of tennis as we finish up our round robin portion of the competition where there is much at stake for the positions into the semifinals tomorrow and ultimately the finals on Sunday. We're looking at the live feed here of center court and behind me uh, the broadcast booth is court number two where our first action will take place today. We'll be We'll be going to the coin toss on court two as we have Heath Davidson of Australia versus Koji Sugino of Japan in the quad completion of the round robin format here. Taking a look at Heath Davidson right there from Australia. He is in his second ever NEC Wheelchair Tennis Masters event. And across from him on the other side of the court, Koji Sugino from Japan, who is making his NEC Wheelchair Tennis Masters debut. These two great players in the quad division have a limited but uh, decent head-to-head -head record against each other with Koji having a slight edge at three wins to two. All of those meetings having come in this year in 2018 with the most recent uh, meeting going to Heath Davidson. But uh, as, it's, as I mentioned, it's been a back and forth head-to-head -head battle between these two. It was uh, Sagino who pushed world number two Dylan Alcott hard yesterday in a very competitive two-set match. And it's Heath Davidson looking for his first win uh, here at this year's NEC Wheelchair Tennis Masters. I expected a credibly competitive match today as these two in their recent head-to-heads have split sets two times with Heath having won one of those three setters and Koji having won the other. So I expect a really great and competitive battle. As always, we've got a, an incredibly busy day here at the national campus as we complete this round robin format in the quad division, the men's division, and the women's division. As I mentioned earlier, there is much at stake. Uh, the winners today will likely move on into the semifinals, and uh, those that don't, well, uh, their NEC Masters hopes are probably dashed. Uh, today is a day that uh, is completely what we offered the players when we talked to them about coming to sunny central Florida to participate in this pre uh, prestigious event. It is sunny, it is warm, and there you're taking a quick look mm -hmm. at today's center court schedule. Beginning at 11 o'clock this morning, we'll have Andy Lapthorne versus Lucas Satoli, followed by Julia Capocci, Lucy Schuker, and then on to the men between Gustavo Fernandez, Stefan Hude, Shingo Kunita, world number one versus Gordon Reed, followed up by Yui Kamiji and Kotso Montjane from South Africa to finish our coverage on center court today. I would also like to invite you to participate with us as you're watching at 1030. There will be a very prestigious presentation on center court of the ITF Brad Parks Award. And I won't give too much away on that, but just know that that is uh, one of the more remarkable awards that the ITF presents in the weir uh, world of wheelchair tennis. And it is going to a very honorable man and very deserving recipient this year. So we'll look forward to that presentation at 1030 on center court. But our focus is going to continue to be on court number two right now as Koji Sugino and Heath Davison complete their warm-up portion of uh, their match and will soon be competing in that head-to-head -head quad singles match. If you were with us a little bit yesterday, you saw some of the best tennis that there is to see. Uh, in particular, I would talk a little bit about the Stefan Olsen victory over Shingo Kanita, um, by what most standards would be considered an upset. Shingo having come in with a 28 to one head-to-head -head match over Stefan Olsen, but that meant nothing to Olsen yesterday as he played some of the best tennis of his career to get that win over the world number one. 
and put Koji, uh, correction, put um, Shingo into a spot today where he probably has a must-win match against Gordon Reed in order to advance into the semifinal round. And Gordon being a former world number one and defending Paralympic gold medalist, uh, that is sure to be an incredibly competitive match today. And one of those guys will be going forward and one of them will be done. On the women's side, uh, Dita DeGroote has continued to be the class of the field as she is currently sitting in 2-0 in her pool play uh, and has pretty much dominated both opponents that she's played so far with straight set victories over both. Uh, but likewise, it's world number two, Yui Kamiji from Japan, who has, oh, had a little bit tougher schedule with a tough three-set win over Anik Van Koot yesterday. And so uh, it's um, Yui coming out with a 2-0 and o record so far in round-robin play. And uh, it looks like those two are probably on a collision course. Uh, but there's a few other players in the women's draw that would like to derail their hopes and get in the mix as well. We're going to have some continued activity here on the national campus as we've got another kids' day. Uh, day number one, we saw a military appreciation day here on the campus, giving some uh, lessons and some court time to some of our military veterans that are in the area. And yesterday we had 200-plus uh, kids on the campus from one of the local elementary schools, and we'll kind of compete. Uh, we'll kind of repeat that again today to give them some exposure to this phenomenal sport. So it's going to be a great day for the kids. It's going to be a great day for the athletes. And uh, hopefully you're going to be able to spend some time with us as you make your way into your weekend, wherever you are around the world, listening and watching at home. We'll be joined at various times throughout the day by some additional voices on the broadcast. Uh, much like we have over the past several days, we're attempting to get some different voices on the broadcast just to give you some different perspective about the world of tennis uh, and how it relates to wheelchair tennis. We'll have some players, past and present. We'll have some coaches. We'll have some tennis administrators. You know, all the people that just make the great sport of tennis move forward in the world here. Uh, most of them are revolved around the national campus here at the United States Tennis Association. Uh, but we'll get some flavor from some people from all around the world as we continue to give you live coverage here at the national campus. You're continuing to get a nice look and we'll get repeated looks throughout the day at the entirety of the campus. It is a phenomenal 100 court facility here in central Florida with our focus now shifting to court number two. And I think we're just moments away from our opening match. So I'll be quiet for just a second as we get the players ready to go and I'll pick up coverage as they throw the first ball into play. Looks like Heath Davidson's prepared to serve. Koji Sugino on the receiving end, point number one. First point of the day goes to Koji Sugina, and I'm proud to announce that I'm joined here in the broadcast with Mark Jelena from the University of Central Florida, and where he heads up and is uh, instr instrumental in the, the professional tennis management program over there. Welcome back to the broadcast, Mark. You were with us on day one, and so I'm excited to say that uh, we didn't scare you away, and, and uh, you decided to come back for a little bit more, huh? Good morning, Paul. Uh, great, great to be back. Uh, you've uh, you need all the praise. You've certainly had your nose to the grindstone. You're uh, you're a real workhorse, and uh, it's really uh, 
you put in some hours here the last couple of days, haven't you? We've had a couple of full days, but it's been a labor of love, I'm not going to lie. Uh, I love the sport. I love the players that are competing here. I love the environment. Uh, it's the most, one of the most prestigious events in the world, so it's, uh, it's well worth the time putting it in here on the, on the broadcast for those that are able to watch and listen uh, from you know, places all around the world. And we're finally getting some Florida weather. This is what we promised the players and uh, everybody. Then we said, hey, come to sunny Florida. And it's 30 love uh, to Koji Sugino as he uh, looks to get this first game here in this quad round robin match. So just to get you familiar, Mark, with the players, you got Heath Davidson from Australia, the right-hander, and Koji Sugino, the left-hander from Japan. So you know who you're looking at there. And we'll be able to bring some continued insight into the sport and how much as you get exposed to it, uh, you see some, some interesting things. Getting a good look at Heath Davidson there from Australia. He is a Paralympic gold medalist in doubles, along with his partner Dylan Alcott, who's the number two seed here and uh, off to a really good start in his quad round robin competition. But it's Koji Sagino right now who's in control of this first game and looking for a break to kick this first match of the day off. I have a feeling today we're gonna have a lot of spectators. Yeah, I think, I hope the crowd size uh, blossoms a little bit. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, a little bit on the broadcast, we've got uh, another kids day. And so I'm sure at some point we'll get a great shot of all the activities that's going on in the Nemours Family Center uh, off to our left. And so uh, it's, a, it's a vibrant campus day, isn't it, Mark? It's a beautiful day. One of my favorite things is looking at these beautiful Mexican fan palms we have here. <laughs> Yeah, the players are getting warmed up on court as they just complete their first match, or first uh, game of the match today. And uh, over there at the Nemours Family Center, as I mentioned, it's Kid Day. And so we have 200 plus kids from one of the local elementary schools, Moss Park. And so they're going through a series of uh, stations where they're introduced to service animals. As we can see there, the shot that they're getting briefed on what service animals provide to folks with disabilities. And uh, behind them, uh, you saw about a lot of activity on the court, and that's them going through some tennis stations and athletic agility drills and everything like that and then ultimately they're all going to make their way over to the stadium and over to court two to view some of today's great action between our world-class athletes great to have the kids here on the campus and you can see some kids participating in some of the grills today uh, it's our intention to get these kids hooked on something in life and, and as great a sport as tennis it is why not get them hooked on that beautiful dynamic stretching and having fun down there and the teachers are right in the middle of it all and so now we're back to our live coverage on court two with Koji Sugino serving for the first time in this match the left-hander from Japan uh, he's got a lot of action on his serve it's it's one of his certainly one of his weapons along with his big forehand Let's see him pump in a big first serve there and on cue, he drives a forehand down the line for the forced error and continues to kind of have the initial edge here in the opening going. He spreads out a little wider on that uh, ad side to try and swing him out wide on his slice serve, I see. Yeah, really trying to maximize that left-handed magic that those guys have on the ad side, Mark. And so uh, Koji almost sets up as if he's playing doubles over there. He's willing to give up all that space and say if you can take that backhand down the line, I'll give it to you, but I think it's gonna be a problem for you. So yeah, he really does try to maximize it. What a difference two days makes as we sat here on day number one uh, in some of the opening matches, I think. We were, we were bundled up, we were layered, and now it's all about you're in shorts and you know, got the, just got the light top on and it really feels good. And uh, I think the players are, are really gonna enjoy going into the weekend, getting a little bit more Florida sun and Florida heat as Heath Davidson continues to kind of give Koji a, an early fight on his service game. 
Koji having gotten the break of Davidson in the first game to go up one love. But right now it's Davidson 30-15. Koji with the easy forehand winner to the open court there, Mark. Uh, looked pretty comfortable with that shot, didn't he? Yes. Uh, that left serve, if you don't take them out wide, you aim at their hips and you try and jam them up, that's just as good a serve as taking them wide a lot of times. Yeah, I think everybody pretty much anticipates the wide one. And then uh, with his skill, ability to control the ball with his mostly side spin on the serve, uh, he's able to kind of spin that ball into the body. Just when you're looking for it out wide, here it comes in on you. And so very effective. He gave uh, world number two, Dylan Alcott, uh, all he could handle yesterday in a 7-5-6-4 loss, but uh, really pushed uh, the Paralympic gold medalist around quite a bit. And I think uh, Dylan was, was happy to get out of that match with a straight set victory as, as competitive as it was. I always tried to get a lefty in my regular games at least once a week, just to get, stay used to that spin coming at you. It is, I, you know, as I coach uh, around the country and around the world, I, I always have a, a phrase uh, whenever I come across, particularly lefties in, in camps that we're working on, and I, and I tell them straight up, nobody likes you, you know. Nobody <laughs> likes lefties. And uh, it's nothing personal, it's just that uh, they just give us such a problem. And, and uh, we're, we're 90, you know, probably 90 to 95% of the time we're used to seeing right-handers, and uh, that's our norm. And then when they get in the mix, it, it just is very disruptive. Heath takes that half volley and just kind of pushes a little bit wide. So, you know, Paul, my uh, middle son Mitchell's a lefty, and he uh, he hits a lot with Martina Navratilova. And uh, we were down in uh, Miami, and I said to Martina, he he wanted me to ask her a couple of questions. So I said, Martina, have you ever seen four lefties on the court all together in a doubles match in in your time in the game? She thought for a minute, she said, no, I don't think I ever had. And I said, well, when I played a national 40s, I witnessed that. We all came and watched because just the way they spin it, the way they cut it, it's just a different animal. And, and for those of you who are looking and watching at home, uh, there's our court two schedule for the day. We're currently on pace uh, with Koji Sugino and Heath Davidson, our first match, followed by Dita DeGroote, women's number one versus Sabine Ellerbrock. Followed by Joe Girard and Takashi Sonata in a critical uh, third round robin match. And Stefan Olsen currently undefeated against Nicolas Pfeiffer of France. And then followed on by two Dutch women, Anique Van Koot and Marilyn Baus. Again, that match having great implications as to who's going to advance out of pool play in the women's division. We've got some good matchups today. Yeah. I mean, you know what? Again, in a tournament like this, NEC singles masters where you bring in the best eight men best eight women and the top six quads uh, really from the get-go you have nothing but great matches and, and that's what makes this event so spectacular for our viewers uh, for the players I think they know uh, they need to hit the ground running and there's no tuning up there's no warming up it's like uh, all right uh, at any given match I might be up against a, a world number one pretty much everybody's top uh, five here uh, or has spent time probably in the top five in their career with a few just having made it into the top eight but uh, the majority have been around for a while and have really established themselves as the as the great players in the game koji taking a big cut at that forehand but uh, really missing that one pretty big but you're not going to see him stop swinging uh, he's up 2-0 in this early going of our opening match here on court number two and it's going to be him looking to dictate play most of the day, and Heath, who's got some great chair skills, looking to defend and force Koji into hitting one more ball. Nice angle, beautiful angle. Yep, look at uh, where he was on the court. That's what kind of offers and affords him the ability to hit that angle kind of deep inside the baseline, uh, well into the blue, and uh, no answer from Davidson with that shot. Yeah, 
Now, great depth right on the baseline there with that backhand shot by Davidson. And he's going to continue to have to hit shots like that. Uh, but that's put him up 40-15 to get his first look at some game points. The early going of this match. Quad division, final day of round robin competition. Day three, the NEC Wheelchair Tennis Masters. Another great shot by Heath. He really working Koji around the court and uh, kind of dictating from kind of well behind the baseline, stroking out, but uh, able to string together a number of really great shots there and finish that point with the forehand. He tried the delayed approach shot. It just didn't quite work that time, but that's a good maneuver. Loop it up high and then look for a short ball, or maybe you can even go in and take it in midair. So on the first changeover of the day, it's Koji Sugino up 2-1 over Heath Davidson, but uh, I think both players are probably just kind of settling in a little bit, getting comfortable with the conditions here today. Uh, there's a little bit of smoke in the air as there was some, I think, uh, a burn project going on uh, in, in some of the development that's going on around the campus, I think, as they're preparing to uh, get that resort that's going to be uh, really one of the great marquee pieces of uh, the puzzle that's part of the development plan for Lake Nona in its entirety. There's going to be nice trails coming right over the national campus. Um, they've cleared out that woods in uh, a two-week time period. They've got it to where it's at right now. That's going to be special. It is. It's going to be, I don't know, uh, I think what the timeline is, it's probably got to be at least a, a two-year project before that resort is up and running. It's going to be a world-class elite resort with lagoons and five-star accommodations. And so... Uh, Put it on your calendar uh, probably for about 2020 that uh, that piece of this puzzle will be put together as it's kind of going to be sitting right on the outskirts of this national campus and will make for some really great events that we'll be able to host here uh, in the future. Great point. Koji tried to drop something short to bring Heath in, uh, thinking he might not be able to handle that, but uh, he looked pretty comfortable with that shot as he goes backhand cross court off the sideline for a clean winner. Really well executed by Heath, looked very comfortable with that shot. Just like able bodied tennis, you have to get off to a quick start. Those first couple of pumps will get you up to that short ball. He got up there and angled it off nicely. Yeah, he's got some great mobility, he really moves the chair well, one of his great strengths. And so uh, Koji's going to have to continue to hit some really great shots to get Heath out of position throughout the day. I always like that saying by Rick Macy, if you're out of position, you better be a good magician. <laughs> it's got a nice flow. I'm going to, you know, I, I had somebody say they were going to steal something from me uh, uh, yesterday, and, uh, and I think I might just have to steal that one. <laughs> That's a good one. Out of position, you better be a magician. Speaking of evil magic, that left-handed <laughs> overhead right there from Koji looked like it had some magic on it, didn't it? Really, really utilized the slice. That just uh, When a lefty's going to slice it on an overhead, you want to watch your left side. When a righty is going to slice it, you want to watch your right side. And he really carved that ball, didn't he? Sure did. Looked like me carving up the turkey last week. <laughs> Thanksgiving. 30-15. Game number four of this opening match as we're uh, only minutes away from our presentation on center court, which we'll be happy to bring to you live. And uh, ultimately we'll have our ITF Brad Parks recipient up here with us to have a little interview, talk to him a little bit later in our broadcast. Uh, it'll, be a, it'll be a special time to share some thoughts and listen to him talk about uh, all the things he's done in the sport of wheelchair tennis in his lifetime. You promised me I could meet Brad, the legend. 
Uh, Brad's not going to be here. This is the Brad Parks Award, oh. okay, in honor of Brad, the legend. Oh, I want to uh, meet him. But the man who's <laughs> receiving the award is is uh, is a legend in his own in his own right. So uh, uh, one day you'll meet Brad Parks, uh, and when you do, you'll be you'll be as honored as everybody else is to meet him because he's just uh, always been a special guy, uh, very humble for all that he's contributed to this sport. I mean, there's there's few people that can say that they've been the founder or the originator or the you know the foundation of a, of a sport. It's just really unique. Well, when you can win an award that's named after him, that's special. One of the highlights of, of my career is I met Arthur Ashe on about four occasions. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're talking legends, he's, uh, he's really uh, on the top of the precipice as one of them in, in the great sport of tennis. Uh, all that he's meant to certainly American tennis, but I think Arthur Ashe is one of those people that kind of transcends nationality. Uh, and so... He really is uh, bigger than just uh, an American tennis icon. He is a tennis icon and uh, a humanitarian and somebody that uh, is uh, universally just respected and thought of as really one of the one of the great, great humans that we've ever had the experience of, of spending time with on this earth. Now the NCAAs will be coming here in May of 2019. Well, when I was a a young guy in uh, 1966. Great shot by Koji there as he pumps his fist uh, and takes game to lead 3-1 in this opening set. And now back to 1966. Excuse me, Paul, but uh, good. Arthur Ashe came into Michigan State University and uh, played the NCAAs there, and I ball boyed for him. And uh, he had his rackets down, and I reached down and grabbed one of his sweatpants and started putting it in my pocket. And he said, son, may I have that sweatband back? I was embarrassed. I had to pull that out of my pocket and give it back to him. <laughs> but I wanted that for a souvenir. No doubt. No doubt. Little piece, Arthur. I reminded him of that story years later when I was traveling with Aaron Crickstein and came in touch with him. And uh, he laughed. He said, oh, I'll get you another one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, nowadays that's pretty commonplace for the athletes uh, to finish in the Grand Slams uh, courtside to rip off those soaking wet sweatbands and everything and toss them to the crowd. But they're uh, they're a souvenir for if you can get one from a Federer, or Djokovic, or Nadal, or Serena, some of the some of the big names in the game. And it's Heath Davidson, who's now got a two-point advantage in this service game against Koji Sugino. But Sugino with the 3-1 lead in the opening parts of this first set on court number two, our opening match of today. Uh, but we are probably getting closer and closer to our presentation on center court. Have you been commuting to Lakeland, or have you been staying here in Lake Nona? No, the days have been long, uh, and so even though it's just a little bit over an hour uh, to get back home to Lakeland, um, that's two hours a day that I'd rather have in the hotel room in bed. And so uh, typically our days have finished here over the course of the first couple at uh, about 9 o'clock. Our coverage has ended, so by the time we get back and get cleaned up and everything, it's, it's about 10 or 10.30. And so at that point, I wasn't looking forward to an hour drive, and so I've been staying here in lovely Lake Nona. You know, Oprah Winfrey, she said that if you ever want to move to a community that's really growing, she said, go to Lake Nona. Oprah said that. Oh, yeah. She, this is one of the fa 10 fastest growing communities in the country. That's phenomenal. I, I mean, I didn't know that. I know Orlando is, is always put on the map as a, as a place that's growing, but specific to Orlando, uh, Lake Nona just kind of being, I guess, what we would call almost like a suburb of Orlando. Uh, but certainly I know the developmental plan for, for this community is phenomenal. And so it is, uh, as a, we're literally watching it being built before our eyes, aren't we? We sure are. With this, uh, with this national campus being one of the centerpieces of that development plan. I think they thought Medical City was going to be the centerpiece, but I think they're realizing the national campus is <laughs> what's doing it all. Forty thirty here for Koji Sugino. Uh, up 3-1 over Heath Davidson currently on court number two, our opening match today of coverage of the NEC Singles Masters.
great look of Koji going from deep in the baseline all the way up into net and then back out again. And it's the unforced error by Davidson that gives Seguino the 4-1 early lead here in this opening set. Nice all-court game. You can beat them in different areas. That's a valuable game to have. Yeah, I was able to, to. I was really impressed with Koji yesterday as I watched him play Dylan Alcott, who I certainly thought had the advantage going into that match. Uh, ultimately, was the victor. But I was impressed with Seguino's ability to cover the court uh, as I've watched him kind of progress as a little bit of a newer player on the scene. Uh, his mobility skills have continued to improve. His kind of understanding of the court has continued to improve. Uh, I know that they're putting a lot of time and effort into training him. He's uh, probably played as much. Uh, tournament play as any other quad in the world as I think uh, I looked online yesterday he's participated in 22 tournaments on the Uniqlo tour this year so that's about half the year I mean 26 weeks in a in a year is half and he's been on the road for 22 this would make 23 right here so that's a that is a full plate and full uh, I know plate. that he's got uh, Tokyo 2020 on his on his radar and he wants to be ready to compete for gold there on his home soil I think that's more tournaments than Federer played this year no doubt. Well, without question. Yeah, the Fed just kind of eases his way into the ones that he needs to, gets himself warmed up for the majors and some of the more significant ones. But, uh, yeah, that is a that is a heavy load there. There's not many people on the on the Uniqlo Tour that are playing as many as, as Koji. But that's the commitment. That's what it takes to, to get yourself into the top ten. Uh, it's the match play. It's the match toughness that you're developing. So it's Koji serving at 4-1, uh, but as I mentioned earlier, we'll leave the coverage on court two in a moment after this point, just to, to get over to center court and see the presentation of the ITF Brad Parks Award. And it's Koji Sugino with a 15 love lead as, as we now go to center court. Welcome everyone to the NEC Wheelchair Tennis Masters event here in Orlando, Florida. Uh, we have a special presentation today and we'd like to welcome a few of our special guests. First of all, Chris Dent, the ITF Senior Executive Director of Professional Tennis to my left. Kurt Bender, the ITF Wheelchair Tennis Committee member. And our honoree today, Rick Draney, who is the recipient of the ITF's highest wheelchair honor. Thank you, Tom. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great, great pleasure to present a very special award to a very special gentleman in the history of wheelchair tennis. The ITF Brad Parks Award is named after California's Brad Parks, who was a founder who founded the sport of wheelchair tennis in 1976. The award is presented annually to an individual or organization that has made a significant contribution to wheelchair tennis on an international basis. Rick Draney was instrumental in the development and promotion of wheelchair tennis quad division in the 80s and 90s. His contribution to the sport both in the U.S. and internationally is immeasurable. Rick began his own wheelchair tennis career in 1984. Then the quad division became an officially recognized classification in the USA in the, in the late 1980s. Among the many clinics and demonstrations Rick was involved in leading were clinics at the Stoke Mandeville Games in the UK in the early 1990s, which were the catalyst for the international growth of the quad division. As an administrator and influencer, along with the likes of Brad Parks, Rick worked with the USTA and the ITF to recognize the quad division and its development led to the introduction of the official quad world rankings in 19. 98. Also in 1998, a quad event was included in the World Team Cup for the first time. As a player, Rick won two World Team Cups while representing the USA, as well as major titles including multiple US Open and British Open Super Series crowns. While still playing, Rick also took on the role of the US Open Super Series Tournament Director for the best part of a decade. From the advent of the computerized quad division rankings, Rick spent more than 120 hours, 120 weeks, probably more than 120 hours, as a quad singles number one between 1997 and February of 2002. Rick's influence and pioneering work has a significant bearing on the quad divisions, singles and doubles medal events that he obtained 
in the Paralympic Games in Athens in 2004 for the first time. Although he never got to play wheelchair tennis in the Paralympics himself, Rick influence burned bright in Athens where fellow American David Wagner won the quad singles silver and quad doubles gold medals. David's own introduction to wheelchair tennis had come just five years earlier at a clinic organized by Rick Draney. On behalf of the ITF Rick and the wheelchair tennis family, I am delighted to present the ITF's Brad Parks Award to you. Thank you, Kurt, and thank you, Chris, very much for this award. I am humbled and honored and flattered and appreciative to be recognized by the ITF. Um, I recognize that it's my name receiving the award this year, but I know over the years there have been many, many people that were involved with me and everything I tried to do to give back to a sport that gave so much to me. I truly appreciated all I was able to accomplish as a player, but found even greater reward in trying to do something positive to help influence the direction of the sport going forward. And my thanks to the USTA, uh, my home country, for all that they have done and all that they are doing, and to the ITF as well over the years for all that they have done and are doing now, and I see great things going forward. Thank you very much. All right, well, we're back to our live coverage here and broadcast at Lake Nona, the USTA National Campus. Uh, it was a great time spent there on center court honoring uh, a really truly great man, Rick Draney, as he receives this year's ITF Brad Parks Award for his contributions on a global scale to the sport of wheelchair tennis. And so it's, uh, it's with guys like Rick having put in the, the work and uh, countless hours that has uh, made it possible for events like this to be taking place here at Lake Nona. And so I hope that the players that are participating in this event maybe get a chance to thank an iconic figure like Rick, who is really uh, one, of the god one of the godfathers of this sport, uh, really beloved among all the people that he's ever had an impact on over the course of his years involved in the sport. Uh, truly just a genuine individual. And uh, we're going to hopefully get a chance to speak with Rick a little bit later as he'll get up maybe and join me in the booth and share some thoughts about some of the early days and the foundational days of wheelchair tennis and how different it is today and uh, what it means to be on the NEC tour for these players now compared to what it was like back in the day when he was a player and uh, someone who was kind of pushing the sport forward for years and years. Laying the foundation for these guys like Koji and Heath Davidson, who are participating in their round robin match on court number two. It is really uh, something spectacular to have had Rick with us here today. And we resume coverage on court two as Heath Davidson throws a serve into the backhand of Koji Sagino. And then gets on with the court. Koji coming forward, pressing the action, taking the volley with a nice point at the net there. Well, when you move in, you can weaken yourself a little bit um, defensively, but you sure have the offense when you're up there if you can put a little angle on your volley. Which Koji was able to do, and in that one, he goes behind Heath, who's not been able to get the chair around. So a good job of mixing things up by Koji at the net there, once going into the open court, and the next time going behind Heath, which is a, which is a great tactical play in wheelchair tennis. It's always good to use a scrambled egg technique. Mix it up a little. Mix it up a little bit. Exactly right. Yeah, variety, spice of life. How many other cliches can we come up with? Right. So it's Koji Sugino uh, with a commanding uh, one set to love lead. There it is. First set in the books for Sugino. 6-1 over Heath Davidson as they go to the set changeover. They're continuing to take pictures and 
honor Rick on center court, but we'll stay right now with court number two in this opening round match. But just to give you a little heads up, in about 15 minutes, they'll have cleared the ceremonial podium on center court, and we'll be getting on with action there with an additional uh, quad division round robin matches. They finish up their round robin today. That matchup will be between Andy Lapthorne of Great Britain, who had a great win yesterday against world number one David Wagner, uh, as he competes against Lucas Satoli, who's going to be fighting to possibly have a chance to move forward into the semifinals as he's already down love one but with a win against Andy that would put that pool into uh, an interesting situation as all the players would be one and one and it would come down to some tiebreakers that I'm not aware of uh, what the format is for breaking that tie to determine who's going to be going on to the semifinals but uh, that would really make for an interesting situation. That's the beauty of this event you don't get knocked out you just keep playing you'll seek your own level but if you have one loss, you're not out. Yep, it is. Uh, so, you know, it, there's, a, there's a lot to be said to those that can kind of take that early loss and then kind of regroup and then come back and, and fight it out in their remainder of their round robin play and possibly put themselves into a position to advance into the semis on Saturday and, and possibly ultimately into the finals on Sunday. So uh, a lot at stake there between Andy Lapthorne and Lucas Satoli, the match that will be coming up on center court at 11 a.m. Eastern time. You know, sometimes uh, a setback is a step back for a comeback. So uh, these these players can come back in these situations, take the take the second set after losing the first set, and they're still in good shape. But uh, you got to regroup. You can't uh, get all discouraged and toss in the towel. The match is a long match. This is. About the midway point in this match right here. He jammed him with that lefty serve. The slice is a is a tough ball to read, especially coming off a left-hander's racket. Many times it's going to come in and jam you, which it did on that one. There he got the wide serve in, and the return was hit back, but then that opened up the other corner. That's a, the typical typical uh, X pattern. You go wide, and then you go to the opposite corner, see if you can get the player out of position. So Mark, uh, I know you haven't seen a ton of wheelchair tennis. Uh, you, you've had enough to know and get familiar with it, but uh, from day one to day three, uh, what are some of the observations that uh, you've kind of come away from? What are some kind of the similarities or, or differences that you're seeing uh, as, as you've spent the majority of your life in the tennis industry, but uh, this is something that's uh, it's not some place in the tennis world that you've spent a lot of time at? Well, the thing I've noticed is just the different styles. Mm -hmm. Like able-bodied yep. tennis, you play all different styles. Some players hit with more topspin. Some players slice it more. Some players are a little more aggressive. And um, it, there's no, no difference. Um, yep. and these players got to figure it out. It's a, it's a game of chess. Mm -hmm. One player might get a move, and you get the next move. So you got to figure it out. And what that are, move right there, the slice backhand by Cody Seguino, <laughs> it was a nice move on the chessboard. Yeah, I like, I like to use... Uh, the analogy of, of tennis being a boxing match and a chess match all combined because there is a physicality to it. Uh, not that they're literally changing, changing blows uh, like it would be in a boxing match, but it is that physicality that happens. And then of course the, the mind of the chess board and the, the move that uh, is just not one move, but it's possibly one move to set up two or three down the line, right? And that's kind of classic tennis is one shot is, is designed to set up the next two or three. And the thing that really impresses me is how they have to recover after every single shot. If you stand and you're an observer for just a little bit of time, you're not going to get back. Stand or in a chair, you're not going to get back in position. So you've got to recover quickly. 
There's Heath recovering right now, as you as you mentioned, and getting as much court coverage as he can. Koji waiting to see where Heath is uh, leaning a little bit. And again, going behind him, which is really one of the great plays. And off to a good start here in the second set, having already captured the first set convincingly 6-1. But I, I think you're right, and I think as, as people that I've experienced uh, who are tennis people uh, get a look at the sport maybe for the first time or the first couple times, especially at this level, they really start to see that uh, how much the games are similar. I mean, despite the fact that it's taken place uh, in a wheelchair, uh, the movement is different, of course, but you're right, playing styles, uh, the shots and the strokes, all the components of the game of tennis are really uh, very much the same. Uh, the grips and all the things that are technical related to the game, very much the same. The same principles apply whether you're in the wheelchair or uh, standing. And so it's uh, it's just who creates the tactical advantages and is able to kind of finish off points. You got to figure it out. You've got to be a detective. You got to find out what's my opponent doing to me? What can I do to them to counter the game plan? And uh, it's no different than able-bodied players. Yeah. yeah, I think with a lot of young players that I work with, uh, I, you know, they get so focused on their side of the court, right? That's, that's just typical in the development of, of a young player where they're like, okay, what am I doing? What do I need to do? What am I doing, right? And, and so at some point there needs to be that transition of, well, what is my opponent doing? And, and having awareness of what's going on on the other side of the net to say, all right, it's, it's not just me, it's, it's what they're doing that's kind of forcing me to do something or, you know, I'm forcing them to do something. And so it's uh, when they become, that light bulb goes on and they have that awareness of what's going on on the other side of the court, that's when you see some real development in young players. You know, the old time player, Bill Tilden, he had a good story. He said, every time I get done playing, people would come up to me and say, Bill, I never play good against you. I never play good. And Bill would look at him, he'd say, you know what? I make you play bad. I do the strategy on you to break down your game. So it's not what you might think. I'm making you play the way you are playing. Yeah, it's not by chance. It is by design that uh, I'm able to access certain ac areas of your game that you don't like. And uh, the best players pick up on that stuff quickly and uh, really get on that attack. Strength to weakness. It's all about strength to weakness matchups. And so far in this opening match today, it's been the strength of Koji Sugino and a few of the weaknesses of Heath Davidson. And certainly it's Koji who's had the edge on exploiting some of those. I'm not going to say that Heath's got weaknesses, but it's the matchups that Koji's been able to implement upon Heath that's given him the early advantage here in this opening match. No, that was definitely an unforced error, that <laughs> last shot. Well, not that one. No, nothing, <laughs> nothing unforced about that. No. That was, uh, that's the big Koji forehand that we saw a lot of yesterday. Uh, that one was the, the flat driven one that he hits with a ton of pace. And uh, we did see some examples yesterday of him able to spin it in as well and create angle with it. So it's really, it is really one of his significant weapons without question. Heath just missing the mark there a little bit, a little bit uh, kind of like disappointed in himself, looking a little frustrated as he goes down to love in this second set, having already lost the first set 6-1. So we'll see if he can get something going here. He desperately needs to change the momentum here or else he's going to be out quickly. Well, back in about uh, 1988 is when they started charting unforced errors. And uh, for the listeners, an unforced error is simply when your opponent does nothing to make you miss, you just miss the shot. And uh, he, he's had a few unforced errors, but uh, if he can regroup, he can, he can still get back into this. Yeah, we've seen some, some moments of brilliance from him. I mean, he is obviously uh, a great player in his own right, but uh, it's been all Koji today. It just seems like the matchup is, is something that's giving Heath, as we've talked a lot about it today, matchups, it's something that's given Heath a lot of problems as you see him there just shaking his head and frustrated and just He's not getting any type of read on, on Koji and doesn't just really doesn't seem to know where any of his shots are going. I think he's guessing a lot of the balls are going to an area, but Koji's hitting to the same spot twice and uh, hitting behind him a little bit today. Yeah, that seems to be the predominant 
tactical strategy that I'm seeing Koji is uh, I'm going to make Heath reverse out and, and go behind him pretty much all opportunities. And, uh, and then about the time that Heath looks like he's sitting on that one, it's Koji that goes into the open court. And so when you got a player guessing, uh, you are at a significant advantage, and that's what's produced the, the big gap so far today. Heath takes a swipe at that missed first serve. A little bit of frustration there, and sometimes you just got to get it out. There's a great shot by Heath Davidson. Forehand up the line. Koji can't track it down, so that's the kind of shots that Heath's going to have to repeat here. It can't just be a one and done. He's going to need to string a few of those together. Koji will come in if he gets a, if he gets a chance. He'll, he'll use that sneak attack. Yeah, he's not afraid. Uh, we've seen that and, uh, in both his match yesterday and in, in the early going today. Certainly not, uh, not shy about getting into the net. Uh, I think that comes from having been a former uh, player outside of the chair. Got him twisted around on that one. That's how you do it. It's a little bit breezy here today as I'm looking at the, the flags and the banners of all the players that are here for this competition. The, the USTA and the event staff did a phenomenal job of, of creating an individual banner for each of the players that's here uh, representing themselves, their, their national governing bodies, their countries. And so uh, it, it really does set the tone for a great environment to understand who these athletes are. And so as spectators come in to participate in the event, they'll get a look-see on the banners first. Uh, then they get to see the live action on court. When they saw those banners when they came in, I bet they had a gleaming grin on their face when they saw those, huh? Yeah, I think, and you can see some of them waving in the in the side of the court there as we're looking at action here on court number two as Koji Sakina on the changeover second set is up 2-1, but that's a critical game for Heath Davidson right there. Uh, possibly get himself in the mix in this second set and look to extend and get into a third set if possible. And so as a reminder, here's our center court schedule for today with some of the great action we have. You see a uh, quad match coming up at 11 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, and that's 4 p.m. GMT, Greenwich Mean Time. There's a quick look at Lucas Satoli, who's preparing for his match on center court. He'll be joined shortly by Andy Lapthorne of Great Britain as those two guys battle it out, uh, having had a great career head-to-head -head matchup, many great matches between the two of them. And so we'll be joining that coverage on center court shortly. Uh, we anticipate We anticipate those two lefties to have an outstanding match on center court as you see Andy Lapthorne of Great Britain joining his opponent, Lucas Satoli, over at their respective benches, getting prepared to go out in the center and receive their coin toss and begin that match. We'll be joining that coverage with the coin toss and live action there on center court. But right now, it's back to court number two and our ongoing match that started this morning at 10. Uh, opening match of the day, day three of the NEC Wheelchair Tennis Masters. It's Heath Davidson throwing a first serve into Koji Sugino of Japan. Paul, every time I see that big shot of the campus, I start thinking, Heaven on earth. <laughs> tennis, heaven on if, earth. If, if, you're, if you are into tennis, if you oh, like anything or all things tennis, uh, that's, uh, you're right, Mark. That is, a, that is a great view. And, uh, you know, once people tend to be kind of, uh, they, they get the tennis bug, right? At some point in their life, all those that play tennis, it's like, I got the bug. And uh, for many people I know who have visited the campus for the first time, they're just like in awe and just are amazed at the magnitude of, of this facility. There really aren't very many like it in the world uh, that have a uh, facility as big with as many courts, the variety, and certainly the atmosphere. So uh, really, really great that we could have this event here for these tremendous athletes that have come from all over the world, Asia and Europe, South America. 
uh, North America, Australia. So uh, uh, there's seven continents by my count, and I think we have six of them represented here. Uh, maybe we don't have any. Oh, we do. KG on Jane is from Africa, so we do. We have six of the seven continents represented in our players here at this tournament. Pretty remarkable. No Iceland. No, <laughs> no Antarctica. That's the one. That's the only one that's I mean missing. Antarctica. <laughs> that's the only one missing. For the for the viewers, we uh, are witnessing a few moon ball techniques today too. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's a great technique, and so uh, that's the first sign of real great positive emotion we've seen out of Heath Davidson right there. As uh, we mentioned, he kind of got himself going a little bit to get this thing now to two all in the second set, and so uh, he's got a little fire in him right now, and so we might be in for a little bit more of a match than than the first set indicated. We're going to be going to coverage on center court here momentarily uh, as we're on the break. I think we'll uh, be joined in the booth here shortly. As I mentioned before, where we're going to be honored to probably be able to spend some time with Rick Draney, uh, the recent, I mean, I mean very recent recipient of the ITF Brad Parks Award uh, presented annually to uh, an individual who has given great love, passion, blood, sweat, and tears to the sport of wheelchair tennis. Uh, that award named after the founder and uh, an originator of the sport. And we'll now join center court. We'll go live there for the coin toss uh, to begin the opening match here on center court between Andy Lapthorne of Great Britain and Lucas Satoli of South Africa, two members of the quad division. Uh, so that I think that our guest in the broadcast booth, Rick Draney, will be able to speak very eloquently about and so I will say to the viewers that, Rick, welcome to the broadcast. Congratulations on your much-deserved award. Uh, it is an honor to have witnessed that uh, presentation. And so uh, I'm just honored to have you in the booth with us here for a little talk. Thank you very much, Paul. It's great to be here. And again, I am humbled and flattered and honored to receive the award and appreciate all that's been done alongside me as I've tried to give a little something back to the sport, but the USTA and the ITF both to see where we've been. You and I are old enough to kind of know what it was like back in the day and compare that to where we are now and see the good and positive things going forward is, is wonderful to be a part of that. Thank you. You know, when you started uh, in the sport so many years ago, uh, did you ever envision that it was going to get to the level that it's at right now? I don't know that any of us could have realistically thought, you know, maybe always dreamed and wondered. Well, there you see a live shot of us here in the broadcast booth. Uh, it's myself here in the hat and Rick Draney not. Uh, so you know who's who in the booth, but it's Rick Draney who is the recipient of the ITF Brad Parks Award. And we're honored to spend a little time with him, Rick. So again, continue on with uh, the dreams that you once had about what wheelchair tennis could be. Well, and again, I, it's beyond anything I maybe realistically thought when I was playing, but how awesome is it to see growth, development, professionalism, inclusion, opportunity, everything that takes place these days is incredible. To be here at the USTA National Campus as part of the NEC Wheelchair Masters and to see the level of professionalism, the quality of play, uh, the facility is phenomenal. Everything is just wonderful about this. And how could you not have a great time being here? 
And so you joined, uh, you got in late last night from Utah, which uh, for those around the world is out on the western side of the United States. And so uh, how does it feel to be in a little bit of sunshine uh, with uh, Utah having been blasted with its wintry uh, time of year? So is it good to get a little sunshine in your life? We were in the low 20s when I left, and uh, I'm going to be going home to plenty of snow on the ground based on the weather report. So, yeah, to be here, I don't care what time of night I got in and, and how I might be feeling this morning. It's just great to be here and uh, at this facility and enjoying this event. Yeah, maybe maybe you'll have a flight delay or cancellation that just happens to pop up. Oh, looks like I'm going to have to spend a couple extra days in Florida. Sorry, I won't be home. I suppose I could do that, but I do hey, need I, to get home. But got, it, it will be great to be here through the to weekend. That card. Yeah, it will be. Yeah, so we're great to have you. So so we're getting ready to look at some uh, quad match that's going to take place here on center court. Um, we're looking right now live on court two, another quad match between Heath Davidson and Koji Sugino of Japan. Uh, all nodded at two all in the second set, but the first set having gone to Sugino. Uh, 40 all there at Deuce. Uh, what do you think about the quad division? And is that has evolved because certainly you were one of the instrumental people in, in the development of that division and really making that division an integral part uh, on what is now the Uniqlo uh, wheelchair tennis tour. So what do you think about the quad division and how it's evolved over the years? It is great to see the international flavor to the event and this division these days. Early on, you know, a lot of wheelchair tennis really was in the United States, and that's where it started, and that's where a lot of the growth began and then spread to the rest of the world. But to see, I mean, we have one American competing here in the quad division. The rest are from other countries, and oftentimes when I played back in the day, it might have been one or two from other countries, and most of the quad players were U.S., and so to see that international flavor is, is amazing to see that quads have taken up this sport and, and gone forward with it from those early days right and you know i give uh, i think i talked about it in one of the earlier broadcasts all credit to the the itf uh for their their really um specific effort to do that and in other words to go into areas around the world and say hey listen here's this sport of wheelchair tennis that uh you can play and so to really encourage people who uh might require uh the you know might require playing in the quad division uh, if they didn't qualify for the men's or women's division and give them that additional opportunity as you mentioned uh, we're, we're looking at representation here from um, on court number two you're looking at Asia you're looking at Australia you're looking at Europe and you're looking at Africa so four players here that are getting ready to compete in their matches uh, all from four different continents around the world and that's that's remarkable without the ITF's commitment willingness dedication to make this happen it would not have happened and you know hopefully we none of us ever forget that or take that for granted to again think about where wheelchair tennis started its humble beginnings in southern california with brad and his wife wendy and all those involved in the national foundation of wheelchair tennis but now to look out over the landscape of wheelchair tennis internationally is remarkable yeah the program for years that the itf had was was called the silver fund and then now it's called the ITF Wheelchair Tennis Development Fund, where they go into areas, support those areas, look to develop uh, and, and lay down the foundation for grassroots programs, continue to support them in many capacities, and then the, the you know really just sow the seeds in some of those areas. And now we're looking at, as you mentioned, we're looking at those seeds having come to fruition now in these players that have that have evolved over the years and come into the top level of this sport. And so it is great to see uh, the fruits of those labors. It is, again, remarkable is probably the word. I, it might be overused, amazing, wonderful, anything like that. But it, it almost defies description from where wheelchair tennis started. I don't know that anyone could have envisioned this, maybe dreams and, and hopes of it someday. But to actually be around and still be involved in some capacity and see it coming to fruition and where it is is, is really wonderful. And it's now coverage on center court between Andy Lapthorne of Great Britain and Lucas Satoli of South Africa. It's Andy, the left-hander from Great Britain, throwing the first serve into play in this last round-robin match of the tournament prior to going into the crossover matches and semifinals. That'll take place tomorrow here at the national campus. And it's two great left-handers battling it out on center court. You know, just about everybody here I've seen very little of if any, for some of these players. Uh, most of them came along after my days as a player and now as a former player uh, coming back and watching this. I'm 
personally excited just to get a chance to watch because I've not seen some of these players play and compete. But the fact that it's still tennis and we are still here with everybody else is is wonderful. Yeah, these are the these are the young bucks. <laughs> the, the next generation, maybe two generations. Yeah, they, they might be right involved. Yeah, both phenomenal players in their own right, Lucas and Andy. Uh, as I mentioned, both left-handers have a significant head-to-head -head matchup career, uh, having played 26 matches against each other over the years, dating back to 2012. And uh, this is their first meeting here in 2018. Imagine that, that uh, throughout the entirety of this year, both playing a full schedule on the Uniqlo Tour, this is their first matchup. And uh, what an important matchup it is as uh, the winner of this one uh, will certainly punch their ticket into the semifinals. And the loser will probably be on the outs. And so uh, it's, a, it's a critical match for both of them. There is a lot riding and on every match, as we know, as tennis players. But, yeah, when you get right down to it, sometimes it's, it is that winner-go-home time of competition. And that's where we are here today. Yeah, on the third day of round-robin competition, uh, unlike the first day, the third day is pretty much a knockout situation. You know, if, uh, if you come away with a, a little loss on the third day at the end of of the round robin, it's, it's likely that you're going to be out. Uh, the first day, a loss won't kill you. It doesn't knock you out. Uh, you stay alive, but you're pretty much up against it from that point going forward. And it will be interesting to see how much nerves come into play. They both look a little tentative and, and a little unsettled early on. And the challenge will be which one of them can raise their level of the game to what they want to do and what they're capable of doing and whether or not that's going to be enough or the other is going to respond and react. And, into a battle. Well, that was a great replay and great shot of Lucas Satoli taking the forehand down the line on the return of serve winner. As we go to Deuce in this opening game of this round robin match on center court between Andy Lapthorne of Great Britain and Lucas Satoli of South Africa. Uh, as I mentioned, head to heads, these guys have competed against each other 26 times in their career. And it's uh, Andy Lapthorne with just a slight advantage, having won 15 of the 26 matchups. But that means that's Lucas having come through with 11 wins, um, but it's been mostly uh, Andy Lapthorne over the course of the last couple years, dating back to 2017, and their matchups, the most recent matchups they had, it's been all Andy Lapthorne. A uh, couple of close matches in there, one three-setter, and one match that was 7-5, 7-5 last year at the NEC Wheelchair Tennis Masters in the semifinal. It was Lapthorne over Satoli, 7-5, 7-5, so highly competitive. Nice forehand there to finish that point for Andy. So, Rick, what were some of the who were some of the great players back in the day when you were competing in the quad division? Uh, give us a little history lesson of some of the names that uh, I'm sure many of these players maybe don't even know, but there might be a few listeners out there that we can we can call some of the some of the greats from the earlier days uh, in this sport. Greg Thompson was actually the first quad that was competing in wheelchair tennis. I didn't start playing until 1984, and they had a quad division prior to that. But Greg Thompson from Southern California was kind of the man to beat back in the day. And I remember my first U.S. Open wheelchair tennis championships. I lost to him in the final. Okay. Uh, and he was, he was the one that deserves some credit for helping get the quad division started. Uh, Joel Bernal, Brian Bromley were some others from those very early days. Steve Everett, who uses a power chair, yep. was one of those Steve, that, that started earlier and, and made a name for himself for many, many years. Rick Amber, Brian Hansen, um, Robbie Sanders, I'd have to, Chris Studwell, oh, yeah. uh, who's no longer with us, unfortunately, yeah, yeah. but uh, a, a I knew great Chris individual pretty and a well great competitor. And, uh, great guy. Yeah, we, we, he, is, he is sadly missed. Rick Amber as well has passed and no longer with us. But those are some of the names that I can remember. And back in the early days, the, the competition was was intense between that group of individuals. And then it started to blossom and continue. And, you know, we started in the early 90s with some of the international flavor and seeing that take place and now growing to where it is, to where, again, I don't even know <laughs> most of these players these right. days. It's a different generation, but it's still great to see them out and the sport continuing to grow. Well, it's it's not uh, your job to know them. It's their job to know you, Rick. I mean, right. you know, you being the ITF Brad Parks Award winner, they should be, uh, they should be I, I, I don't say this in any junk, uh, 
tongue in cheek, but uh, they should be appreciative of, of all the efforts that you put forth in those early days that you're talking about and referencing uh, to get them to where they are right now. And uh, I think these guys are living some pretty good lives in regards to their ability to travel around the world and compete in a sport that they love. And it's uh, because of guys like you that have put in the work that uh, has allowed them to be on the tour and, uh, you know, kind of live in a life of a professional athlete. And it's, it is great to see, and I'm grateful for the small part that I had in, in maybe helping uh, move that forward. And, and hopefully players these days recognize the opportunities they have to contribute and give back to the sport that's given them so much. That was an uncharacteristic double fault by Andy to lose that game on his serve. Yep, so uh, he is in a the littlest of holes that you can be in as he's just down one game in the opening set of this. And there's Lucas so kind to give that double fault right back to him, huh? To give it right back. That's, yeah. that's a little too generous when you go up a break. You want to try to have a solid service game on your own and, and not give that break of serve back. But again, I, I just kind of get a sense that both of them are still a little bit tentative, both still trying to find their game a little bit and get settled into to the groove you know uh both you and i know uh, one of the legends in the sport and again talking about somebody who uh, kind of left us uh, way too early and that's randy snow uh one of the great lessons that i learned from randy uh in my time spending with him uh, as a as, as a partner on the court once in a while and certainly having done some clinics and camps with him over the years is uh he had this saying that the first three games don't count and i, I really have taken that to heart over the years and, and i've kind of tried to pass that along to a lot of players it's it's the discovery phase like a it, like in a trial it's like the defense and the prosecution you know just discovering what it is that we're dealing with here both of the players feeling each other out and typically about i don't know i think the statistics say it's about 85 percent of the time it's going to be two to one somebody that it's it's actually fairly rare that it's 3-0 or love three and so we'll see how it plays out in this uh this match but my money says it's going to be 2-1 somebody and that both of these guys uh, though having played a lot of tennis against each other are still feeling each other out today and seeing who's got the goods the le the legend randy snow uh so many wise sayings and comments and he really was a student of the game and very cerebral not just gifted with physical talent and a great heart to compete but but very smart about tennis as well well, there it is. With Lapthorne having gotten the break, that guarantees our 2-1 on the changeover, there as we, stated. There we go. Gave it right back. <laughs> and again, even though those first three three games don't count that much, I think Lucas would have rather been up 2-0 than 1-1 at this point in time. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think it's just on the first changeover when they come over after three games, it's like everybody takes a deep breath. You get your first drink. You get your first maybe bite of something to eat to keep your kind of nutrition at the right levels. And then you just kind of say, all right, I got a feel for the wind. I've got a feel for the sun, the court conditions, how the court's playing, um, just all the factors that go into the things that these players need to be in tune with in order to compete at this highest level. And uh, yeah, and again, still finding their game. We're seeing, I think, a little bit more on the unforced error side than the actual winners or solid play. A lot of balls early kind of going down that middle third of the court, which isn't really ideally what you would want to have necessarily get your opponent moving around a little bit more, I think would be advantageous. But again, going through that discovery phase, as you mentioned, just trying to find their strokes and get settled, settled in a little bit. There's a nice top spin backhand from Andy to get the ball up a little higher than Lucas could handle. How much of, uh, of the top spin backhand was prevalent uh, in the day when you were competing? Well, I didn't have the, the muscle function to actually hit one very well, and so it was non-existent for me as a player and towards the latter part of my career it was starting to creep into the quad division a little bit mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily a weapon and, and uh, a regular part of the game but there were some that were starting to incorporate it more as a defensive strategy uh, when they got a ball high to the backhand side and, and weren't able to deal with it another way up above their shoulders but you are seeing it more and more uh, just as Jim Black back in the day was kind of the first one to start pioneering it in the men's open division, uh, it is a regular part of the game now, and you're seeing that more and more even in the quad division. Right, and it was Lucas Satoli with a big forehand winner there to give him the early lead in this third game of the opening set here on center court. As both players have struggled to hold serve so far, there's 
good example of two topspin backhands, one good from Andy and one not so good from Lucas, but both looking to employ that strategy a little bit more on the offensive nature uh, as opposed to defensive, which is what you kind of referred to uh, in the early stages of uh, the quad division that that shot was more utilized in a defensive manner, but these guys look to get offensive with it as often as possible nowadays. It has become a weapon and uh, more and more of the quads are figuring out how to hit that shot with their limitations in their upper extremities and possibly uh, trunk function, but it is becoming something that they actually practice and incorporate into their game, not just something they do for fun on, a, on an outside court when they're hitting with friends. Great. Here's a chance for Lapthorne to hold the serve, uh, serving at 40-30. We'll see what he does with this point. Mm, Andy decided to go with a little slice forehand there. I'm not quite sure why. I thought he had a good opportunity to probably get offensive with a little bit more of an aggressive top spin, but chose to slice it, and Lucas was sitting on it with a forehand winner to even the score at 40 all. And Andy was probably thinking the same thing after he <laughs> lost that point. He was in, and he wasn't quite sure what to do and just didn't execute well enough to, to make it an offensive shot. Became more defensive, and as you said, Lucas was right there to handle it. But another advantage to Lapthorne, and again, another opportunity to hold serve and get it to 2-1 in his favor in the opening set. Two good solid shots by Lucas. Has Andy on the run a little bit, and there's a third, and that's out of reach. Well yeah. done by Lucas. Great targeting there on the side that Lucas is typically a little bit less aggressive on, which is the forehand, or he seems to struggle typically a little bit more on the forehand side. His backhand is rock solid, but uh, nothing wrong with that forehand as he kind of drives it into the corner out of the reach of Lapthorne for a point to get it back to Deuce. Nice serve by Andy out wide. Got a ball back down the middle and put it in the other corner. That's yeah. about as textbook as you could draw it up or plan it. I agree, and uh, it's one forehand winner followed up by the other. Both players looking to kind of create their separation. I see your forehand and raise you a better forehand. Lapthorn with the advantage. Third chance to hold serve here. Nice return by Lucas to get Andy stretched out. He had to hit a little defensive and short. Lucas was able to come in behind that. Right there, he's got him stretched out, out of position. Lucas comes in and does, again, what you need to do with a short ball, and that's to finish the point. Yep, gets a little help from the let cord, but I don't think that mattered much. I think he had that one lined up either way. Backhand just wide by Satoli. Got a little impatient there. It seemed like they were both willing to rally for a bit on that ball, and Lucas went for just a little too much on that angle. Yeah, I think it's Andy that tends to be the more patient player uh, in my familiarity with these two. Uh, he's the one that will sit back and, and lengthen out some points and is willing to do that. It's Lucas that looks to be a little bit more explosive, uh, take a little bit more risk, as you see right there with that shot. That was, that was beautiful. Yeah, and uh, with with risk, there comes reward, and uh, we're just a second away on this replay from seeing the reward that Lucas got with this backhand. Paid off that time nicely. Wonderful. Really is incredible to take a ball that high above your shoulders and be able to drive it like that. Lucas finding the range on that backhand, running Andy side to side. As Andy defensive, let's see if he can finish the point off. Oh. I think that backspin wasn't quite what he expected, and uh, 
died a little bit more on him than he thought. He was stretched out trying to hit that ball back. Didn't quite execute that well enough. Yeah, Andy probably being one of the really one of the truly great defenders in the quad division. I mean, his ability to move, cover the court, get another ball back is, is kind of one of his trademarks. And so uh, he does have some offensive weapons, but I would say his, uh, his biggest weapon is his consistency and ability to just keep a lot of balls in play. And I don't think it matters which division you're in. Mobility is a huge, huge part of this game. You've got to be able to move and to cover. Yep. And it's Lapthorne with the first service hold of the of the match. Pulls him out. Goes behind. And Lucas can't answer the answer the call. So it's 2-1. Andy Lapthorne on the first changeover of this opening set of this center court match here between Andy Lapthorne of Great Britain, Lucas Atoli of South Africa. And it's Andy with a smile on his face uh, as he goes to the 2-1 bench. Let's look at some of our fans in the stands. Uh, one the of right the competitors to the left there, uh, Nicholas okay Pfeiffer right of France. He is a NEC, right. or not NEC, but a Uniqlo doubles masters champion this year, along with his partner, Stefan Houdet from France. Uh, one of the great doubles players in the world, competing here in the singles masters. Has had a tough go of it so far, coming out uh, currently 0-2 in his pool play. Uh, he is a perennial top 10 player, but uh, has had a little tough struggle of it so far this week. Well, just to go back to something we talked about with Randy Snow, I know those first three games don't count, but I think anyone would much rather be up 2-1 than down 1-2 at this point in time. So Andy's got to be feeling good right now to be the first one to hold serve and looking to see if he might be able to add to that by breaking Lucas. Yeah, to elaborate a little bit more, you know, Randy's philosophy on that was that it's just nothing to get stressed out about. You know, sometimes players come out hot. Uh, sometimes you come out cold, and so you just don't put so much emphasis on the status of things after three games. And there's just so much match left to, to happen. Uh, you know, one set has never won a match, and so uh, you know, no matter what happens in the early going, it's all about what happens down the stretch. It's kind of like uh, NBA fourth quarter, right? <laughs> the game really doesn't start until we get into the fourth quarter. Excellent way to explain that. Try to pass on as much as I can from the things I learned from Randy over the years. Uh, as you mentioned, really um, one of the, uh, just one of the great minds of the game, uh, but not only the mind, but the, but the personality and charisma, passion. Uh, he is uh, truly a one of the kind legend. That's why he's in the International Tennis Federation Hall of Fame. He's in the uh, US Olympic Hall of Fame as well. One of the few individuals that has the distinction of having both of those honors. Probably, there's probably a list of, of Hall of Fames that Randy's a member of because he, of his great participation in, in, in a number of sports. He competed um, in track and won a medal clear back in 84. Los Angeles yeah. Olympics. And uh, I know he was uh, a basketball player as well, just competitive in everything that he did. But I think tennis was his, his true passion and his true calling in life. And yeah, the impact, the difference, the influence, the example, the introspective the contributions that he made to the game are second to none yeah tennis myth to reality have you ever heard of that absolutely have <laughs> have won a copy and i have read that and it's it's a great book it was kind of the first uh, bible of wheelchair tennis uh, you know collaboration between him and his coach dr bal moore who was one of the great early uh, contributors to the sport of wheelchair tennis one of randy's personal coaches uh, the two of them collaborated on writing one of the first kind of uh, definitive books on wheelchair tennis really breaking it down into a more scientific uh, approach as to how to how to approach the game the strokes the the patterns of movement um, and, and just really all aspects and i think it was kind of the the real like i said bible for some of the players growing up in a generation uh, in the in the late 80s and the early 90s when that book came out and one of the great things about randy is i truly believe he got as much joy and satisfaction out of a clinic or a camp for others than he did winning a title at, at a match he just loved both sides of that and the number of camps that he and Bal coordinated and organized and led and taught and how many players today that are here in wheelchair tennis because of Randy and Bal. You're looking uh, and you're and, talking to one of them. And, and I mean, going on. We, we both yeah. were a product of that yeah. and, and found great passion and excitement through their energy for this sport and 
did whatever it was we did to, to help contribute along the way. But now to see everything that takes place is, again, credit to Randy and Val, a mm -hmm. lot of, for camps in particular, for that structure and that emphasis on camps and helping to try to grow the sport at a grassroots level. Yeah, it was uh, June of 1997 that I got invited to go to a, a wheelchair tennis camp at Flushing Meadows at the, what is now the Billie Jean King Tennis Center. Uh, and I never even knew that the sport of wheelchair tennis existed. I'd never heard of it before. Uh, it was uh, the Eastern Paralyzed Veterans Association, an organization uh, that's a chapter of the Paralyzed Veterans Organization here in the United States, that uh, recreational um, therapist invited me to that event. And I was like, all right, nothing else going on this weekend. I think I'll go down and check it out. Why not? I played some tennis in my life and I uh, thought, yeah, give it a go. And uh, really have never looked back. And it was from that day forward that I've stayed involved in the sport and, and continued to love it and as a player and coach. And that's it. And as we reminisce and think about the glory days, this match is tightening up a little bit. Lucas has an opportunity to level this up, get a little closer, and move forward. We are waxing a little nostalgic, aren't we? That's okay. We're allowed. Right? Yeah, we, I, we have the microphones. That's, that's they a haven't good point. cut us off yet. That's a good point. You know what? It's it's a History 101, Wheelchair Tennis History 101 here on the broadcast as the, the match goes to two games to all with both players opening up with breaks of serve and now both players uh, following it up with holding serve to get it to two all. All right, correction. Looks like 3-1. Yeah, Lucas. There it is. And Andy, you're not nice at too. Update. Well, the first three games might not count, Rick, but that fourth game's pretty critical, huh? They're 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 all going to matter more and more as from it gets this point on. Deeper and deeper into it, right? Yep, they sure do. And that's the that's one of the beauties of the sport is the uh, is the mental toughness as things get tighter and tighter, deeper and deeper into the set, knowing that any any errors and everything like that are, are going to cost you a little bit more as you get closer to the finish line. Andy had got caught in between, caught between those two bounces and put up a pretty defensive shot. Lucas had him a little bit on the ropes as Andy was facing away from the court, but he came up with a pretty good return to keep the point in play and then Lucas just overcooked it a little bit <laughs> overcooked it yeah well there's that risk reward approach again you know he's back behind the baseline trying to take that backhand down the line and uh, as most coaches would say hey listen if you can hit that uh, you're going to get the big payday but uh, if you can't there's a there's a potential unforced error staring you right in the face so uh, we'll see Lucas make that attempt a little bit more today I think though he likes to likes to create those opportunities for himself Rick, did you travel internationally uh, when you were playing, or was it was it strictly uh, or mostly uh, to the United States? Uh, as you mentioned, uh, really was the, the prominent amount of players were coming from the States back in the days when you were playing. Uh, but did you get a chance to travel internationally and, and compete? It was primarily U.S. travel for me, but towards the latter stages of my career as the international uh, embracement and, and effort and support of the quad division took hold, there were some opportunities to travel was fortunate it's nothing like the tour of the schedule nowadays and you know they're literally hitting just about every continent and uh, competing all over the world but there were some opportunities to enjoy some international travel some great memories and great experiences and some good competition uh, back then just as now some very talented very gifted and very competitive international players and that's I think what's great to see is that this truly is an international sport these days and what takes place around the world is remarkable and here we are with Lucas Satoli looking at two break points uh, having just driven a forehand winner down the line on the return of serve to give himself a chance to go up 3-2 against Andy Lapthor here on center court and with that double fault, it is indeed a break of serve, and Satoli going to the bench up three games to two. And if it's possible, we might be able to get a score update on court number two because, as I think I may have just heard, we may have just split sets over there. And 
just on cue. You see a opening set victory from Koji Sagino, 6-1, but Heath Davidson really turned it around. He was on the ropes there, uh, but really credit to Heath for getting that second set, 6-4, and now we go to the third. Uh, we'll continue to get you updated on that as we continue to focus our efforts on center court between Andy Lapthorne and Lucas Satoli, but that's a, a great job by Heath to get that match to third set. As spectators, we all love a third set. As players, we probably wish we could get them over in two. Uh, maybe don't like that stress and that challenge of, of being tested mentally and physically extending a match, but it's great to see him battle back and, and set that up for what could be a, a very exciting finish. Meanwhile, Andy here, it's, if I remember correctly, he's de de uh, double faulted two service games. And that certainly isn't helping his own cause. No, and, uh, you know, yeah, I'm sure he's unhappy about that. And you're probably seeing a little frustration on his face knowing that he's given Lucas some pretty free and easy points, uh, not forcing him into earning those points, uh, as we say. But uh, Andy is uh, is really uh, one, of, one of the greats in the quad division, so he'll make some adjustments. Uh, he is He's a really good player, so uh, I would expect that he'll fix whatever he needs to fix. But if he stays with that pattern, that's going to be potentially a long day for him. hit on that back hand side again that risk reward thing that you talked about it's it's one thing to be set up to hit a winner and finish the point but when you're kind of in the middle of a point and don't really have an advantage sometimes the smarter play is to be steady and wait for a better opportunity Neither player still seems really settled into their service games as of yet. And I think that more than maybe the ground strokes and the mobility, I think they've kind of found a little bit of a rhythm there, but it seems like they're both still struggling with service games. And that ultimately may decide at least this first set. And if they can get settled down, may determine the ultimate outcome. But service has been a challenge. Yeah, we spent a lot of time talking about that on the broadcast, and I don't know if that's more prevalent in the quad uh, division. You might be able to comment on that, uh, whereas we know in the men's division, uh, the serves are getting certainly bigger and stronger, and those guys are able to protect themselves a little bit more on their service games. It's still a challenge, but I think they're able to protect themselves a little bit more. Uh, the women's game, the service game, uh, continues to be something that some of the women struggle with a little bit, and so maybe a little comment on how hard it is to hold serve uh, in, the, in the quad division. Well, if you're asking from my player perspective, it wasn't a very, very easy thing to do as a player. I, I was not known for a solid service game. Uh, but whether it was then, whether it's now, it's one thing to just have to try to get a ball in play and get going from there and rely on your strengths. It's another thing to double fault or to serve so weakly or poorly that it's too easy for your opponent to take advantage. And I think we see that, and the men's game is a little different. They've recognized that, yeah, we need to come a little harder, stronger, and faster to not be broken as often, but I do think you still see more breaks of serve in the quad division and in the women's game than the men's game. Well, it was a wicked good backhand that got Lucas Tully the first point of his service game here as Andy had gotten off to a two-point lead there, but uh, we had a, a really great shot of Lucas executing a short-angled backhand winner to get it to 15-30. His attempt to hold serve here and extend his early set lead. It Another. looks so easy when you do it correctly. <laughs> we, we've talked about that a lot uh, and how easy it always looks from up here. And so it never is as easy as that when you're down there on the court competing and the pressure of each ball coming your way. But uh, these guys do oftentimes make it look easy. There's Andy with a loose return, just a little bit wide. And now it's uh, Lucas Satoli with a chance to, to hold serve. A little frustration from Andy, you can see that there. Yeah, he had a second serve and he tried to get away with a little too much and it ended up costing him. Now Lucas just needs to not give it right back by double faulting. Oh, 
there it is. Great hold by Lucas Atoli to extend his first set lead to two games, up four games to two over Andy Lapthorne in this quad division round robin final day. And he looked a little lethargic in that game and it ended up costing him with that defensive shot that was short and Lucas was able to come in and put that away. And he kind of rolling that forehand into the net there and taking some time to Go pick up a couple of balls and regroup, maybe get his thoughts under control. He's going to need to do something or this set's going to be over. Lucas making some equipment adjustment over there. Uh, you can see him strapping himself to the chair with some uh, belting system. And uh, what kind of a systems did you guys use yeah. back in the day, Rick? I mean, uh, you guys were the pioneers Check. of all this One, stuff. Two. What was going on back then? Around the Most wall. of it was Velcro straps back in the day. We hadn't caught on or figured out and started using the, the binding straps, the ratchet straps that they have now. Um, but again, the idea was still to stabilize your chair, yourself in the chair as much as possible to kind of unify the body in the chair. Uh, which would translate into better performance, better movement, better stability, all of those types of things. But you see some things today that we, ne again, never would have imagined or dreamed of back in the day. Yeah, the technology just didn't exist, did it? It did not. It's funny to think about some of the other sports that I think wheelchair tennis has taken some some uh, advancements, technological advancements from. You know, you talk about the bindings and things like that. It's it's from the sport of skiing, and then you take some of the some of the wheelchair designs and some of the tires and wheels uh, from the sports of cycling, right? And so it's just kind of pilfer some of those sports that were on the cutting edge of their development. And so how can we best implement some of those technological advances into our sport for the advancement of, of wheelchair tennis? And I think it's amazing that, you know, the sports have learned from each other, which is as it should be. Uh, wheelchair tennis doesn't have all the answers when it comes to equipment or does another sport. But to see that there are this many sports these days for people with disabilities to participate in, to recreate and to compete. And the technology has definitely helped them show their true physical talents as an athlete. It's no longer a limiting factor per se which back in the early days when they played in their everyday chairs and had no camber and you know they might have had fold away foot rests and and arm rests that they took off to save a little bit of weight but <laughs> you were think about trying to play this game at this level in basically a hospital chair in yeah. the early very early days remarkable and he looks like he's trying to settle in a little bit on this point and grind it out and hope that Lucas might pull the trigger too soon or make a mistake. Ooh, and no mistake with that backhand. No mistake with that backhand. Uh, you've got to give him. Look on Andy's face like, my God. You've got to <laughs> give him credit for taking the chance and hitting that shot and yeah. actually executing it. Uh, Andy did not expect that at all. Yeah, he gives the old woof. What am I going to do about that? Not much. Guys hitting shots like that, you just shake your head, clap your hands, throw a first serve, and that's your best answer. And just like that, Lucas gives it back. And then, and then you get a pretty weak effort on what looked like a pretty routine ball. It's consistency matters in sports. Andy thankful for that one to get it back to Deuce. He was potentially looking at a 5-2 deficit. Two in a row that Lucas looked a little tentative on when he had the upper hand and the advantage and just looked like he couldn't quite pull the trigger like he wanted to. Huge turn of events for Andy Lapthorne. Mm. Lucas was knocking on the door of really taking command of this set, and Andy was able to hang in there, get a couple of unforced errors from Lucas, and now uh, back within fighting distance. 
Well, Rick, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you uh, to go spend some time as the VIP here on campus, uh, doing some of the things that VIPs do. Having just won the ITF Brad Parks Award, uh, I'm honored that you were able to spend some time with us. We get to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the great things you've done in the sport. But we've got another young superstar that's going to join us in the booth here. We're going from generation superstar to generation superstar as we're going to welcome back CeCe Bellis into our broadcast and allow you to be freed up to go spend some time with some of the other folks I think that want to spend some time talking to you today. But again, it's been a real privilege to spend some time talking with you, sharing some thoughts on the great sport of wheelchair tennis and all that you've contributed to it over the years. So thanks again for spending time with us, Rick. Paul, thank you very much for the invitation, the opportunity to be up here. I've enjoyed it, and uh, best wishes to everybody for the rest of the event. Thanks, Rick. As mentioned, we're once again joined here on the coverage by uh, my partner from yesterday, Cece Bellis, Hi. young superstar American woman playing on the WTA Tour, currently recovering from a little bit of an injury that she uh, has had to deal with, but is on the mend and uh, going to be back in the sport of tennis that she loves so dearly. So Cece, welcome back. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here and watch a lot of more great tennis today. I'm, I'm sure you're just waking up today, probably just easing into the day. I'm sure <laughs> you haven't had anything to do uh, in your preparations on a, on a Friday, but uh, tell us a little bit about what your day has entailed so far. Um, I just finished almost two hours of, of fitness, so I apologize if I'm a little sweaty over here, but um, yeah, I had a good morning, just had some breakfast and did some fitness, so I'm feeling right. good so far. So what did, what did fitness consist of today? I did, because um, I can't do much quite yet with my right arm. Um, I've been doing a lot of, you know, lifting with my left arm, a lot of, uh, you know, cardio on the bike and, and some leg leg lifting too. So I did pretty much everything today. Okay, good. A feeling, lot of fun. Feeling good? Feeling good. A lot better you, today. Yeah, you you embrace the uh, you embrace the workouts, I think. Right? <laughs> I you love, love it. Yeah, yeah, I know you do. I know I've seen yeah. you working Enjoyed out a lot. On, on campus here in times past, and uh, I see how focused you are uh, when you're going through your physical training. Uh, how dedicated you are and uh, it, it, it takes that level of dedication to compete at these higher levels doesn't it oh for sure I think it has to be you know such an important part of your life and something that you know you're definitely thinking of a lot of your a lot of your time for sure mm -hmm. yeah you mentioned making it an important part of your life I mean it's not just about obviously the importance of making it a part of uh, your conditioning for your sport but but it is it's supposed to be your way of life isn't it and, oh, uh, it's just going to make you a healthier person for the entirety of your life uh, so that uh, years beyond your tennis playing career you're still fit and, and healthy and happy and uh, I think you'll always be an athlete won't you exactly yeah I definitely I definitely hope so for sure are there are there any other sports on your uh, life radar that you maybe think uh, someday if I'm putting tennis in my back pocket that I might want to try to kind of get into are you like um, maybe a golfer or anything like that I played soccer when I was younger soccer. Okay. love soccer mm -hmm. um I've never really played golf, but definitely something I'm going to want to try for okay. sure. Yeah, at it's, some point. it's another one of those challenging mental sports, uh, individual. Yeah, so uh, mentally taxing. Oh, it, I feel it like is. it is. So just from playing mini golf, I've I've yeah. noticed that. <laughs> well, you came into to the middle of this uh, highly competitive match here. Uh, we're into the we're talking about the the quad division here. Uh, who is the who are the what matches did we watch yesterday? What were you participating um, in yesterday, men's match, right? Uh, yeah. Shingo yeah, and Olsen, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That so was you, an unbelievable start for me. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah. So, yeah, you really did see the best of the best in the men's division, uh, certainly with the two guys that we're looking at here on center court and Lucas Toley and Landy Lapthorne. You're seeing two of the best uh, participants in the quad division right now. Uh, so both of them have had some great successes in their careers at Grand Slams and some of these uh, – you know, high-level events here. Uh, Andy's won Grand Slams. He's won uh, World Team Cups before. And Lucas is a perennial top five in the quad division for, for several years now. That's awesome. Seems to be a really athletic match so far, for sure. It is. It's been kind of back and forth. Uh, neither one of them really been able to separate themselves too much. It's Lucas serving here at Deuce with a 4-3 advantage, but uh, it's been most of the games going to Deuce or, or really deep into the game. It's Andy with a really great executed drop shot and a fist pump there in his attempt to get it back to four all in the opening set. Oh, 
And there it is with the unforced error by Satoli. Uh, we are now currently locked at four games all in this back and forth match on center court between two great players in the quad division. Last day of round robin competition here at the NEC Wheelchair Tennis Masters. Uh, the winner of this match will more than likely punch their ticket to uh, a semifinal round. If Andy wins, he will clearly punch his ticket and be in the top position coming out of this pool. If Lucas wins this match, that would put the pool, three members of this pool, all knotted at one win apiece with one loss. We'll come down to some head-to-head -head and tiebreaker scenarios that would put one of the players in as the second member of this pool. In the semifinals start tomorrow. Semifinals start tomorrow, finals on Sunday. Did you ever uh, compete in any type of round robin tournaments or have you pretty predominantly played knockout? What's, uh, what's your experience been in um, round robin I've competition? I've only played a few round robin tournaments. Yeah, only a couple um, in my life, but yeah, they're definitely fun. It's different, isn't it? Yeah, it's different. Yeah. It's a good, it's a good change up for mm -hmm. sure. Cause we're, we're all definitely so used to playing, um, you know, regular um, draws and brackets. So it's definitely a fun change up. Kind of get to play everyone. Mm, looks like they're probably getting ready to resume action over on court number two. As I glance over there, it's uh, Heath Davidson and Koji Sugino that are getting ready to participate in the deciding third set uh, with Koji Sugino having won the first set decisively 6-1, but Heath Davidson, to his credit, turning that around and getting that second set 6-4. You get a little shot of the scoreboard there. Uh, we'll keep you updated as that third set gets underway, but we'll keep our focus here at 4-all in a really highly competitive match on center court between Andy Lapthorne serving at the top of your screen to Lucas Satoli down on the bottom. Well, CC, finally the, the weather that we promised all these players here when we said, hey, come to Central Florida in November, early December, uh, it'll still be nice, it'll still be sunny, it'll <laughs> still be warm, and we're finally getting the all that we promised them. We finally are. It's gorgeous out today. It is. Such a change from the last few days. Yeah, I and mean, it's just been steadily on the climb. Uh, the first day of competition here, I think the athletes were, were really surprised at how cold it was. Uh, I mean, literally cold. Uh, and so... Uh, Yesterday was about a 10 degree up uptick. Yeah, the uh, the steady progression of the of the temperature has been nice as we ease into the 70s today, and uh, I think there's a, a hint of 80s tomorrow and in throughout the weekend. Well, as, as mentioned, joined by CeCe Bellis, WTA superstar and one of the top United States women's te tennis players who's uh, currently, as you can see, recovering from a little injury that she's sustained on her wrist. But she'll be back in action uh, as soon as she physically can. So, CeCe, as we mentioned again, welcome to the, to the broadcast. Thank you. Oh, goodness. I'm so excited to be here. Already watched some great tennis in the last, you know, couple of days. So excited to see what today has in store for us. Well. Wow. It's it's I'll tell you what's in store. It's it's intense competitions. What's in store is we've got <laughs> a couple of great matches going on here uh, in our opening matches on court two and on center court. We've got a third setter going on to court two and in center court here. It's five games to four uh, in favor of Lucas Satoli from South Africa over Andy Lapthorne. It's been a back and forth battle between these two great players in the quad division. And we're going to see if Lucas can close this set out and take an early one set to love lead. But uh, it's been really just some great tennis so far today. Great view of our facility here. Uh, the white tent in the center is where we're broadcasting from. We have the luxury of being able to look out over center court or do a complete 180 and glance over to the action on court number two. The two main courts being utilized for the matches here at the USTA National Campus in Lake Nona, Florida. As we present to you the NEC Wheelchair Tennis Masters as part of the Uniqlo Wheelchair Tennis Tour. The closing event on the tour this year as all the best of the best throughout the world are represented here. 
to compete for this year-end Masters title. A lot on the line. And right now it's Lucas Satoli with uh, a chance to close out this opening set in this match, having just gotten the first point of this critical game here. Uh, Andy desperately looking to get it to five all. Uh, Lucas can hold serve. He'll take the first set. It's Andy who sends another one long to give Lucas a two-point advantage in his attempt to hold here. So what's your what's your thoughts on uh, holding serve at four four five there, Cece? You've been in that position a number of times, so yeah, definitely, um, definitely nerve-wracking position. I think um, you know five four is such a such a close score, and I feel like you know if you've got a good serve, you definitely want to rely on it, and you don't want to really take any huge risks if you're if you're you know confident in your serve. I think that's what is going on here. Yeah, Lucas just uh, hit a winner for a chance to have three points to hold this serve and take this first set. Just sends that one slightly long on the baseline. And it's Andy who's fought off one of those set points. And he's got to stare down two more. And we'll see how aggressive Lucas chooses to play this down the stretch. Uh, his tendency is to lean towards aggressive play. And it's Andy who tends to uh, lean towards a little bit more of a grind it out format. So we'll see which one is able to implement game style upon the other. I think those are the best types of matchups. I do. I do to love to. Those. I do love to watch those matchups. It's like a, a good MMA match between yeah. a between a boxer and a jujitsu or a wrestler. It's Lucas who does intend, uh, indeed try to be a little bit more aggressive and produces the unforced error. And it looks like Andy's content to get some balls in play and, and make Lucas hit the winning shot to close out this set, which is oftentimes tough to do. I've seen Lucas hit a lot of backhand winners so far in this yeah, match. That is his go-to shot. Yeah, yeah it, yeah, it seems yeah, like it. Given the opportunity. Very solid. Really. That could be it right there. And there it is. Andy can't handle the deep driven backhand. Center court hooks it a little bit out. And it's set number one to Lucas Satoli of South Africa as the two go to their set break. 6-4 to Satoli in the opening set. So really some great competition as you get a good look at the sky uh, above center court here at the national campus. A little bit of cloud cover, but the sun is keeping us warm, as we've commented a number of times. It's a it's a beautiful day here in Central Florida. So we've got the best seat in the house here. We can see every court. We do, right? Yeah, it's good to be us. It's awesome. It is. <laughs> yeah. So you're in a you're in a physical training block, CC, and yep. so uh, what kind of a program are you on working with the trainers here, the the uh, strength and conditioning coaches, some of your teammates? Um, so how how detailed is that training? I was able to observe some training that was going on between some of the men uh, earlier today over at the at the player development center, and it, it was just so specific. I was amazed at how scientific it is as they were going through an instruction for one of their strength and conditioning coaches on just one specific crossover move and, and just lifting right leg, taking a cross over planting that leg and driving off it and then stopping and that was it just that one piece you guys get really specific with your movement and your training don't you yeah it's so specific and especially you know movements on court like what you're explaining and um we do a lot of stuff like that like very specific movements for for you know during points and you know maybe after serve or return type movements we also do you know if we have an area on our body that's maybe not as strong as we'd like it to be you know the strength and conditioning team really, really targets that area and tries to build it up as much as, as much as I can and as much as everyone can. So I think that's the biggest thing is just kind of targeting weakness and in weak spots and just building those up. So, you know, it's, it's definitely injury prevention too. Yeah, yeah. It's a huge thing. And just, you know, having confidence that you can, you know, play a bunch of matches in a row and not, not break down and um, not feel tired. So I think that's the biggest thing. Yeah, sustain, sustain the physical grind exactly. of, of competing at that highest level. I think that's you. the hardest part, for sure. Mm -hmm. Definitely for me is, um, you know, playing day in and day out at the later stages of tournaments. 
but um, that's what fitness is for. Yeah, so. <laughs> that's it. That's why you put the time in, right? Exactly. Yeah, you, you, you've got to put the time in on the front side. You know, as they say, uh, there's an old saying, you got to get the hay in the barn. Yes. You know? <laughs> so uh, that's, a, that's a great saying. Definitely. I love that one. And it's Andy Lapthorne here uh, attempting to hold serve in the opening game of the second set. Lucas Satoli having secured the win of the first set, 6-4, to four, in a really competitive match here on center court. Andy a little bit frustrated, doesn't seem to be kind of completely on his game uh, so far today, but uh, we'll see. He had a great opening round-robin victory yesterday over American David Wagner, uh, having defeated David in straight sets, which is a, a great win for Andy, uh, having defeated the number one quad in the world. Seems like Andy's going for a little bit more in this first game of this second set here. Yeah, maybe feels like he's got to kind of let it out a little bit to kind of try to find his game. A little more aggressive. Uh, we'll see. See if he wants to, how he sustains that. But it's totally with a couple of quick break points right out the gate. Andy seems to be uh, in a little bit of a rush. That's, that's, that's my sense of it. Kind of in a, almost in a hurry to get these points over with. Kind of literally just kind of throws that double fault in there to give that game away and uh, go down early. I wonder what he's thinking here. Yeah, sure. Wheels over to collect his towel. He's got his coach up above him. Hi, this him, is maybe. Andy Dunscombe. Once again, live from the USTA National Campus, the home of American Tennis. Hi, this is Andy Dunscombe, live from USTA National Campus, home of American Tennis. Once again, back at the NEC Championships Tennis Masters. I got a lot of friends around me today. I got Joe Wylan. How are you doing, Joe? Good. How are you today? Very good. I'm very excited because I have a lot of new canine friends today from the Canine Companions for Independence. Help is a four-legged four word. Did I get that right? Yes. Very excited to be with you guys. May I ask your name? Uh, my name is Mary. Hi, Mary. I'm Andy. And Hi, what, Andy. what are we doing here today at Kids Today? Today we were uh, presenting some information to the kids on the kids level basically teaching them about what we do and what Canine Companions for Independence does. Very awesome and I'm gonna go down here and talk to my, my friend Alex. Alex how are you? Good. And who, who's here? What's, what's this, this pup's name? This is Wright. This is Wright. This is Wright. Wright. Alex what is the, are you having a calming effect talking to Wright and petting Wright here? Yes. And what have you learned today about Wright and Roller Wright's buddies? The puppies usually start training at a young age, and they usually are almost fully trained at two. Very good job. You've learned a lot. You guys have done a great job here. What, what else have you learned about Wright? He's, He's very calm around other people and cute. That's maybe the most, most important part. Very. <laughs> Very cute. So this is part of Kids Day activities going here on day three of the NEC Master Championships. Joe, what else can we expect here today for the kids? I know we got a lot of things lined up. They've done Canine Companion. They've played some tennis. They've um, made posters for all the players and they've done letters for the players. So this whole week they've been working on researching the players, which I think is really cool and understanding that people in a chair can be just like people standing up playing tennis. So they're going to go have some lunch, eat that great food, and then they're going to go out and watch the matches. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much to the guys. Uh, this is Andy Dunscombe, once again, live from the USTA National Campus. Here we are. Thank you so much, Andy, for that great coverage about what's going on here on campus with the Kids Day as we are, uh, have a couple of activities revolving around this great event. I'm sure the kids have been excited to participate in all the things that they had planned for them today here on the national campus. It really is just kind of a typical day here on the campus, isn't it, Cece? Yeah, definitely. I think there's always so much going on. I mean, I think I heard a stat that they have a tournament almost 300 days out of the 365 in a year. So it's pretty pretty crazy here. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There, well, there's just such a, there is an opportunity to hold multiple events at the same time. You know, so in other words, it's not uncommon for there maybe to be two or three uh, events going on at the same time here on this campus. I know there's been days when I've been here and you've had a pro tournament going on. You've had a, a bunch of junior tournaments going on, two junior tournaments running up at the same time, maybe a collegiate match going on over at the collegiate center. And so when a day like that happens, and I think we're going to get one of those tomorrow on campus, where there's going to be 500 people coming in to participate in a tournament. Uh, this place just turns into a just a beehive of tennis activity. Definitely. I think with uh, you know having different surfaces too, they can really 
play different tournaments at the same time. Well, it's Lucas Satoli that's got the momentum right now, having won the first set 6-4 over Andy Lapthorne on center court here. And now up two games to love in the second set, and it's uh, it's going to be up to Andy to really kind of get himself collected here and get back in this match, or else it's going to be a straight set victory by, by Lucas, which would really turn this pool upside down uh, as we go forward as to see who would be eligible to cross over. It's between Andy and David Wagner and Lucas Satoli in this pool, and uh, if they all end up at one win a piece and one loss a piece uh, it'll be interesting to see who ends up squeaking out and going in as the number one seed and the number two seed in the crossover would they then be counting games or sets uh, i think it would come down to sets one i don't know officially what the what the tiebreaker uh, status would be we'll have to maybe see if we can get the word from the the head referee but uh, that would be great to know and alert our viewers to what that might be but uh, we'll let that unfold a little bit ahead of us here this match is Got a long way to go, and, and Andy's certainly not packing it in anytime soon. But Lucas looks determined today. He's playing some really great tennis, and so it's not out of the realm of possibilities that that's, that's the outcome. It's really been the serve for Andy today that, that's uh, been a struggle. I'm uh, not keeping an official count here, but uh, I would say that's at least four, maybe five <laughs> double faults from him today uh, as we've kind of eased into this second set. And, uh, by these guys' standards, that's uh, more than what they would normally want to be given up. Like the serve is so crucial. I feel like once you get to, you know, four or five double faults, your opponent almost seems more relaxed in their return games. At least that's what I would feel for sure. Yeah, why not, right? When you when you know that based on the the pattern that's in play, you're, you're likely to be getting some freebies. I mean, until they, they show that they've got it back under control, um, you get into those pressure situations, you almost kind of anticipate that, hey, this might be another one coming my way. And after a quick 30 love lead, it's back to 30 all. With Andy continuing to kind of struggle in his service games. There's Lucas keeping the pressure on, hitting another clean winner. That time off the forehand side for another opportunity for a break and a chance to go up three games to love in this second set, having already secured the first set. Very aggressive, and he's really making all the shots that he's going for today. Yeah, I think uh, I think all the players that compete in the quad division, if you interviewed them, uh, will tell you when Lucas is on one of his hot streaks, when he's on a roll, he is an absolute nightmare to play. Oh, uh, yeah. And, and he's just one of those players that's streaky. And when his hot streak hits, it's it's almost nothing you can do about it. And there's another example with uh, Andy having thrown that one long. He's now down three games to love in this second set. And it's uh, all Lucas Satoli at this point. Long way from the finish line, but early, early advantage to Lucas. The first set I feel like was so close, and now I feel like Lucas is really running away with it. Yeah, that's kind of, you know, the, the, the ebbs and flows of, of tennis. Uh, that's the way it goes sometimes. It was that back and forth battle, and maybe it was that, that letdown. You know how uh, when you're that close, sometimes when you get blown out in a set, you almost are able to shake it off pretty quickly. Right. But it's in, the, in those ones that you go deep into the set, the 6-4s, the 7-5s, mm -hmm. the tiebreakers, where there, there's almost a little bit of a lasting effect as you carry it over into the, into the second set. Yeah, I feel like we see a lot of, you know, tight first sets and then not as close second sets, definitely. I know I see a lot of those, um, you know, not necessarily in my matches, but, uh, you know, in draws and tournaments that I play, I see a lot of those for sure. Mm -hmm. What do you, what, what's the psychology you use? Uh, do you have some particular game plans in place, whether you win a first set or lose a first set, or there are some specific um, kind of tactics that you employ uh, in the mental toughness area to kind of get yourself going in that in that second set based on what happened in the first set um I'm not sure I think it you know definitely depends on on who you're playing and what kind of their confidence level is or what their you know playing level is that day so I think it just depends on on the match every every match pretty much has to be different I think definitely oh. no need to to give up 
if you uh, lose a close first set, though, because you're definitely still in it, and there's two full mo full more sets in the match. So yeah, just got to reset. That's it. Andy is uh, far from having reset uh, in this in this match here, as he's just uh, quickly down. Yeah, look at that. He's like, I don't know, nothing working. There are there are days like that on the court where you just feel like you've got nothing, right? Oh, of and course. It's, it's a frustrating and almost like a helpless feeling, and that's where you gotta kind of fall back on some of your training and say, all right, let's kind of simplify my game and get to some something that works. One thing, maybe, right? Definitely. Yeah, I think it's always nice to have different tactics that you can go to or different, you know, maybe swinging and kind of shadowing shots to see if that'll help you. Sometimes I do that if I feel like I'm not playing as well. Go go swings that yeah. we call by shadow swings. Exactly. Go swings, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Remind yourself how you want to hit the ball, right? Exactly. We saw, I think both players do some of that yesterday, too. Some, some oh, shadow with, swings. With, with Shingo and, mm -hmm. and Stefan, definitely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yep, you'll always, yeah, often see that with uh, with both those guys. Um, yeah, I think that's just becoming more and more commonplace, the people recognizing all the tools that are necessary sometimes to get yourself on track. Uh, and it's certainly Lucas Satoli here who's on track with a 40-15 lead here in the fourth game of the second set. Uh, already up one set to love with a chance, two chances to go up for love in the second set. Now he's down to, to one chance. Andy probably desperately trying to get it back to Deuce as, uh, as the four love de deficit would be would be tough. Yeah. That's a tough one to come back from, down a set in four love. Yeah, that's a big one. Unless you're eight years old. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> as Cece uh, talked to us about uh, her, one of her greatest comebacks ever. <laughs> uh, she remembered back in the day when she was eight years old competing in a tournament out in California where she was down big, having lost the set, uh, what was it, six six love, yep. uh, four four love yep. or something like that, and mm -hmm. 30 love or something, yep. yeah, and then and then came back to win that. Uh, you know, tennis players tend to remember the, the craziest things <laughs> about certain matches in their life. I mean, we play so many, we're, we're bound to have some crazy ones like that. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, that's the truth. Well, Andy fought off... Uh, Those, uh, those those points, those service games that uh, Lucas was trying to close out, and it's back to Deuce now. Fought off those two points that Lucas had to hold. So he's still in the fight. I think 3-1 uh, would be, I mean, I mean, dramatically it doesn't sound that big, but 3-1 versus 4-0 is, is really huge. Yeah, 3-1 with uh, Andy then serving. Easy way to hold for 3-2, then it's he's right back in it. Absolutely. Is pushing it aggressively on that one, but just uh, a little aggressive with the targeting. It gives Andy now a break opportunity. So just as quickly as Lucas was on the verge of 4-0, it's Andy with a chance to settle things back down and get himself right back in the set. Great way to get back in that game there. Yeah, that might be the that might be the game that kind of flips this set a little bit here uh, with Andy. Definitely looks the, like it. Yeah, right on the verge of of going down huge, and so you know just like that flip of the switch and he's in the hunt. So it's uh, it's going to be his serve though that's going to be the critical adjustment that he's going to need to make because it's been it's been a little bit flighty so far today. All day today he's kind of seemingly struggled with it. Uh, so this this is a critical service game here. He holds three two. I think he's he's going to be full of confidence on the changeover. Yeah, I think he needs to make a lot of first serves in this game. He needs to really think about getting that first serve in and getting the point started like that. Wow, great defense there, turning it into offense. Yep, and uh, 
Andy certainly has a couple gears. He's one of those players that kind of, you know, he's just when you count him out, he's got another gear. I've seen him compete uh, for years on the tour. Uh, I know what he's capable of. He has really, uh, as I mentioned, Lucas can be a streaky player. Andy has that as well sometimes. Uh, and it's for him typically about focus. And so when he's focused and determined, uh, he is as good a competitor on the tour as there is. Uh, when he loses that focus, when it seemed like he was a little bit in that position here for a while, in this set anyway, uh, when he loses it, boy, he can be all over the place. So we'll see if he reins that in. Right now, it looks like he's got it going his way. Seems to be a lot of a big momentum player, for sure. Huge to stay positive if you're that type of a player, I think. Not get down on yourself. Just about the time we had Andy counted out in this set and possibly this match, it's now three points to hold and go to the changeover at uh, still a deficit. But boy, I'll tell you what, big difference between what we were talking about just moments ago. Crazy how it can change so quick. <laughs> I mean, it is, it's is—it's—it's one of the things that you love about the sport and, and equally drives you crazy. Definitely. How in the... I won't say it, but how in the fill in the <laughs> blank did it go from being so good to so bad? Speaking of good, that's a great forehand by Lucas right there to fight off one of the points that he's up against to stay in this match, or at least in this game. Get a little replay look here. I'm going to get a shorter ball here from Andy. Pushes aggressively in, but boy, that's a tough shot right there, that angle. And he hit it pretty pretty comfortably. Easy return to serve error there for Andy Lapthorn. So uh, he happily makes the change over here. Uh, down a game, honestly, uh, I think he'll take this based on, you know, the status just about 10 minutes ago when he was down three love and uh, and actually a couple points away from four love. So, wow, great turnaround by Andy Lapthorne. Really good turnaround just when we thought he was maybe going away a little bit. Came right back. So uh, you see Andy taking a sip of water there. Uh, I know you mentioned yesterday about water, electrolytes. Uh, what's your electrolyte drink of, uh, of choice? Is there a certain... Uh, type of drink that just seems to work well for you and in, 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 in allowing you to help in the recovery? I use um, Advocare Rehydrate. Okay. Yeah, and I use that as my electrolyte drink. And I try and have, you know, something to eat as well, like bar, banana, and then definitely some water too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Try and have all three. You uh, sure. you prepare uh, you prepare a bottle of the electrolyte drink and then have that separate, maybe a sip of that, sip of water, yep. kind of mix the two a little mix bit. Mix them up, yep. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think important to have both because you don't, I don't think you should just have one or the other. I, I agree. Think definitely, I couldn't play a match just on, you know, electrolytes. I definitely need some water too. So, yeah. What about you? What was your go-to? Yeah, I, I was kind of a, I was kind of a Gatorade water mix yep. you know, guy. There wasn't as many it's options. The best way to go. You know, I'm an, I'm an old guy, see, so yeah, it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was one as in as many option. It was like water or dirty water back when I played, <laughs> and so uh, it wasn't as many options back then. But yeah, certainly Gatorade and Powerade were the were the two uh, drinks on the market back yep. then before so many other. Uh, supplemental things came in and so uh, typically I would take a, a bottle of Gatorade maybe take a couple sips out of that and then have a bottle of water and just kind of start diluting the Gatorade because yep. yep. uh, I didn't That's like the, the taste of it. just water here's a great replay of this first point of the sixth game good depth there by Andy kind of sets things up yeah, you can see him swinging a lot more confidently there and there so yeah it looks like he's kind of righted his ship and uh, is looking... Maybe loosened up a bit. Yeah, loosened up, certainly gained some confidence. Uh, Lucas didn't close it out when he had a chance to maybe really do some damage. And so I think we're in for a fight now. That's my sense of it. Definitely. And just like that, we're kind of back to what the first set looked like, a little bit more back and forth, a little bit more of an even match. And so uh, Lucas is, uh, I think, equally determined. Now he has the early advantage here. He'd be wise to do everything he can to keep it. 
These two have played each other a bunch of times too as well. Yeah, we talked a little bit about the matchups, but take a glance at that. You got uh, access to those stats, and so uh, I was surprised to see that they have not played each other uh, at all this year, which is really remarkable for the amount of tournaments that both of these guys play on the Uniqlo Tour to think that they hadn't matched up at some point this year. A couple of seven, six, and a thirds. They also move pretty close matches for sure. Yeah, no, it's been a great head-to-head. -head. It's only uh, it's only a four four okay. match differential in the head-to-head, -head, which to me is is really for the amount of times that they've played really close. Let's see what we got on the replay here. Ah, there's the friendly net cord. <laughs> Depending on what side of the net you're on, it's your it's a <laughs> friend. Depends on who of, he likes that day. Yeah, it's the it's your friend or it's your worst nightmare. Uh, so for Lucas, it was friendly. For Andy, it's like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> but, uh, great job there for Lucas to get to 30-15 on his service game. Chance to continue to maybe extend his lead here in the second set. But gives that advantage right back. And it's now 40-30. Still an opportunity to hold serve. Mm, nice, easy forehand return to serve winner for Andy. Looked really smooth and comfortable on that one. Very smooth. Yeah. Really fluid strokes. Yeah, that one was. Yep. Yeah. Probably a shot Lucas wants to take back. Definitely needs a good first serve here. Game, Lapthorne, three games all. And as this continues to get tighter, and we talked about this pool uh, with David Wagner, Andy Lapthorne, and Lucas Satoli being the three participants here. I was just given some information by the tournament referee that uh, if it does in fact go to some tiebreaker situations, that it would be percentage of sets won and percentage of games won. So uh, everything is critical here. I mean, literally each and every one of these games is, is critical. Uh, so. It was David who beat Lucas in straight sets. It was Andy who beat David in straight sets. And now it's, uh, at best, it would be Lucas beating Andy straight sets. At worst, it would be split sets, and, and then they'd go to the numbers, Cece. That would be very crazy, very tight matches with all of each other. Yep, yep. So it, that is, again, that's one of the interesting things about the round-robin format and... Uh, you know what the outcome can be it's not not really clear cut as you're playing matches on day one you might not consider having lost a game or two to be the end of the world but right. ultimately in the end that can come back to to bite you in the backside if uh it comes down to percentage of games one and there's a couple of games that you maybe let slip away and, and didn't really worry too much about at the time but all of a sudden they're the ones that knock you out of the tournament yeah it's crazy how much importance is in each game and you probably don't realize it at the time but yeah, I think each game means so much. I think because so few tournaments are played in this format, it, it is something that you probably don't go into uh, really mindful of in the beginning. Uh, maybe some do, maybe some don't, but uh, that that that's a, a lot of pressure almost to to have on you to think that way in the early goings of a, of a round robin tournament, where you're saying, "Hey, listen, you know, every one of these games is critical." Um, that should be a mentality I think that most competitive athletes have. But sometimes, you know, you're kind of like, "All right, no big deal." You know, I'm up. I'm up four one five one or something like that. I lose a couple games. I lose right. concentration, and you don't then think uh, it's the end of the world at that time. But not at all. And, and ultimately, it might might not be because you maybe win the set, win the match, but uh, in the end, it really might be critical. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, in the moment, you're just like, "Ah, no big deal." That's what makes uh, round robin tournaments interesting. I, I agree. Think. I agree. So. 
Yep, but right now at this big uh, critical seventh game of the match, it's uh, three opportunities for Lucas Satoli to break serve. And uh, quickly it's from three to two as Andy gets a nice serve into the body and, and Lucas no reply on the return. Uh, we'll see. Lucas had a chance to hold several games ago to go up four love. Next thing you know, it's three all, but uh, here's some critical points for him now to get a break and maybe get the advantage later on in the set. Oh, there it is. Two breaks in a row. That's big. Yeah, and that's the that's the that's the Satoli weapon right there. And he gives it to him. Gives him the opportunity to hit that back in, which he loves so much, and he didn't miss that one. Took it down the line for the clean winner. As he goes to the ice chest for a cold drink of water on a on a warm sunny day here in Central Florida, here at the national campus. Home of American tennis. What do they? What do they use? They use a they use a acronym uh, for that, don't they? USDA. No, no. Well, no. We know oh, USDA. The Hote. Hote, the Hote. Hote. The Hote. Home of American yep. tennis. Everybody, you know, you might hear that term that once in a while. That's new too. What's that? It's new. Yeah, it Only is. Only last few years, I think. Well, that's it. We yeah. started using that. Well, yeah. yeah, as everything has been consolidated here. It's true. So if you want to sound cool when you're on campus, you know, you just kind of walk around just saying, oh, yeah, it's good to be here at the Hoat. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever said that. Feel free to take it. Run with it. <laughs> I'm going to take it. <laughs> so now it's up to Lucas Satoli to hold serve, uh, maybe again extend his lead in this critical second set, having won the first. So it's, it's certainly more critical for, for Andy Lapthorne than it is for Lucas Atoli. But uh, I, again, I think it would, be, it would be in Lucas's benefit to maybe close this thing out as best he can here in the second set. Not give Andy a lifeline in the third. So important to try and close matches out in two if you can, I think, especially as the tournament goes on. Play more matches, the body definitely gets more worn down. I think this is going to be really important for him, the service game. Yeah, well, that's Andy trying to be kind of aggressive and, and set the tone there in that first point of this game, but uh, driving that forehand into the bottom of the net. Yeah, I think it's a, this, this format for these guys, with it being a three-person round robin, is a little bit more forgiving mm -hmm. because uh, all of them had uh, at least one day off in the round robin format uh, out of the first three days of competition here. It's a nice format. Yeah, for them that works out pretty well for the the ones that are playing in the in the pools of four in the men's and women's division, it's a grind. It's uh, it's pretty much uh, full full three matches on the on the first three days of round robin to complete their pool play, and then right into the semifinals. So no let up. They're going to be playing five straight days of highly competitive tennis. And, and back to the talk we had earlier about uh, about um, fitness, and so how much those athletes have put into their training is going to really show here down the stretch. So on a typical week, uh, when you're healthy and, and not recovering from injury, uh, in training, uh, how many days a week are you on court? How many days in the gym? You know, what kind of is a typical schedule for you uh, across a week? Every day on the court and in the gym except Sunday. Except Sunday. So, yeah, and That's I get a half day on Saturday. So right. Half day on Saturday. Yep. Oh, look at the depth on that shot right there. So Andy Lapthorne now with a chance for two break points and uh, it seems like every time I talk about the number of break points that these guys have uh, they, they throw one away and so from two break points to one uh, but Andy will still gladly have the one at his disposal here great serve by Lucas just Andy with a little bit of the wind today throws that one up and it looks like based on what I'm seeing with the flags over there uh, just that one was pushed by the wind just a little bit wide we can kind of feel a little bit of a breeze in our face here and that's definitely the way the, the ball drifted it's tough playing when uh, sometimes there's a breeze sometimes there's not I feel like in Florida you can never really tell when it's coming yeah and it's always different in a court like what they're playing on where they're sunken in down below right. you can look up and see we've talked about that where you can look up and see some flags moving in a certain direction but it doesn't necessarily translate onto the court Things tend to swirl down there a little bit, and it might be a little bit of a false breed on the wind. And the 
this point setting up a little bit in Andy's favor here. But wow. just like that, it's another backhand winner by Satoli. To give himself an advantage here. It looked like that point was kind of setting up into one of those back and forth rallies that I think favors Andy in the long run, but it was Lucas that had other plans here. It's a great get, good defensive positioning by Lucas, then pushes in aggressively. Look at the depth and location of that shot as Andy tries to get on the offensive. Perfectly placed there. Yeah. Big opportunity for Satoli right here. Stays patient. out of position and fortunately for him Lucas sails it a little bit long and he gives a little breath of relief there knowing that he might have been a little bit out of position had Lucas gotten that lob back might have been in trouble it's back to deuce shaking his head like whoo dodged a bullet there it's always tough to you know kind of figure out where you want to go when your opponents on the run you don't know if they're gonna stay in one corner or run to the other side especially if you have a short ball and you don't have much time to decide Lucas late on that forehand, driving it wide. And now another break opportunity for Lapthorne to even this set up at four all with a one set to love advantage for Lucas Satoli. This is one of those ones that's setting up to be pretty critical. I think the, the winner of this one, even if it's just getting back to even by, by Andy, the winner of this one's going to have the momentum. That's my sense of it. 5-3, uh, Andy's going to really be up against it. But for all, if, if Lucas lets this game slide away, I think, I think we could see a momentum shift back to Andy and, and him bolstered with confidence. Yeah, it's tough mentally getting broken at 4-3 in the second for mm -hmm. sure. Here and behind me, it's a really tight third set over there on court number two between Koji Sagino and Heath Davidson. And if I heard correctly, it's Sagino with a 4-3 lead in the third. And right now here on center court, it's Lucas Satoli with a 5-3 lead in the second set, having already won the first set. So really some great action going on here between these four quad players at the Uniqlo Wheelchair Tennis, or NSC Wheelchair Tennis Masters on the Uniqlo Wheelchair Tennis Tour. End of year event, last day of round robin play. Nice shot by Andy there in the opening point of this ninth game of the second set. Which uh, is pretty much all or nothing for him, CC. Definitely. I think this game is, is so important. I think for, you know, Andy to hold is just, I mean, obviously critical for the match, but I think, you know, he needs to get a lot of first serves in, just play very solid, make Lucas go for shots that he doesn't want to. Well, there's an early, early service lead for Andy. So uh, he's going to certainly at a minimum try to get this game and, and force Lucas to have to try to serve it out, which we've talked a lot about how how tough that can be. It's just it's mentally uh, very, very intense when you're trying to serve that match out when you think like it should be yours, but hey, still got work to do. Right. I think Andy definitely wants to put the pressure back on Lucas to try and serve this out. That's uh, an inopportune time for Andy to throw in a double fault to allow this, well, <laughs> really critical game to get to 30 all. It's definitely not what he wanted there. No, not at all.
Oh, really probably the best point of the match with both players swinging out. Most critical point, too. Yeah, critical point. And, and boy, I'll tell you what, that was really some high level from both players right there. High intensity. See some great racket speed by Andy right there. Great volley to stay alive in the middle of the point. Good recovery. Defends. Gets the chair around. Gets into position. Goes offensive right there. Big swing to a great target. Really phenomenal point by Andy right there. Both players playing at a high level. But it's uh, but it's Andy Lapthorne that ends up taking that point there in that game now. And it's 5-4. Andy Lapthorne on the changeover with still a deficit that's going to allow Lucas Satoli to serve this match out. But uh, a lot of pressure possibly uh, placed on the shoulders of Lucas now to hold serve for the match. Andy did what he needed to do there, CC. He held his... Uh, held his serve and so now it's shifted over to the shoulders of Lucas Satoli to do the same yeah definitely kind of the same position he was in in the last set in the first set where um, he was trying to serve it out I think it's definitely a little bit more nerve-wracking when you're trying to serve out the match rather than just a set so we'll see how he handles it here yeah well as I as I continue to feel a little breeze blow uh, into our face uh, you know wonder how much he'll utilize uh, his serve his left-handed serve on the ad side uh, that will be kind of working with the wind. It's kind of a side wind, at least is what we're feeling. Like I said, don't know if that's the same down on the court, but that could be a nice advantage for him in this service game if he's able to pull Andy off off the court on the on the ad side to open up some opportunities for him to finish. We'll see how he employs his left-handed magic. I think Lucas really uses his, um, you know, being a lefty to his advantage. I think, you know, obviously they have a bit of a different spin than being a righty, and I think he really uses that well. Mm -hmm. of deep return by Andy. Yeah, I think for me, uh, watching right now, it's it's critical that Lucas gets some first serves in because I think Andy's going to gonna look to be aggressive on the second serves because I think when, when Lucas just kind of rolls a serve like he did in there, that second serve was was really something pretty easy for Andy to handle. So uh, we'll see how the first serve percentage plays out in this game. That's what he wanted there for sure. Yep, big difference. in the pattern of the point, such a huge difference when the first serve is made, I think, for sure. Mm -hmm. Fifteen all. Another good first serve. Great push by Andy, but not enough. And again, set up by the first serve where Andy doesn't get the good look. Lucas gets the first great strike to put Andy on the run. Takes advantage of it for the 30-15 lead. Early control to Satoli. It's awesome that he's sticking with his aggression here mm -hmm. and not backing off from, you know, the heat of the moment, being at this close in the second set. Yeah. Chooses not to clear that ball off the court. We'll see if Andy can take advantage of that little minor distraction, but no. It's double match point for Lucas Satoli now serving at 40-15 to take this match and force this round robin into tiebreaker scenario. There it is. It's game set match for Lucas Satoli which throws this pool play into a tizzy and puts every one of the members of that pool, David Wagner, Andy Lapthorne and Lucas Satoli at an even one win and one loss in their round robin matches. And so it will be up to the tournament referee and his staff to determine the tiebreakers. As we mentioned, it's percentage of sets won and percentage of games won. So somebody's going to have to get the calculator out, start adding those things up, and come up with the formula that's going to determine who's going forward and who's going home. Are you going to get your calculator out, Paul? And that's not my job. <laughs> <laughs> as, uh, as some of my friends would grew up with me would know, math has never been my strong point. <laughs> And so uh, I'll let the, those with the better math minds take care of that business. 
the guys seem to have some good sportsmanship at the net there too. Yeah, I think again we've talked about that where where these guys uh, are not strangers to one another. No, um, they are they are intense competitors, but uh, oftentimes they end up as doubles partners uh, in, at very give us, given tournaments around the around the world when they're traveling and don't maybe have their regular doubles partner with them. So it's not uncommon for them to be playing in the same tournament against each other in the singles and then having to team up and play doubles with each other. I think that's the best type of a doubles team, having two you know, different styles of player. I think that um, kind of gives the best balance to the team, having one more aggressive and one a little bit more consistent. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So again, as I've mentioned, uh, as we continue our coverage here, and we might be shifting quickly over to the third set on court two, but it's CeCe Bellis joining us here uh, on the broadcast, and we're, we're lucky to have her here. And so we're going to just spin our chairs around, and take a quick look at court number two, where Koji Sugino of Japan is fighting it out with Heath, Heath Davidson in the third and deciding set. We'll quickly as possible try to get an update on the scoreboard. As this has been a really intense match with Koji roaring out to a really decisive and easy 6-1 win in the first set, but it's it's Heath Davidson from Australia who fought back, kind of got himself under control. Well, there's the there's a look at the scoreboard, a really there's a close tight point in the match. Yeah, right. And we're at Deuce in the third set with Koji up 5-3, serving 5-3. So we'll pick it up from there. Oh, you can see that uh, there's a bunch of kids gathering around on the outskirts of the of the court, getting ready to fill in, probably at least on the changeover when this match finishes. To go through a part of their experience here on the national campus today. There's Seguino with the forehand winner for the game set and match, a worthy match point as he drives home the forehand winner down the line, uh, something we've seen him do over the course of the last couple of days, really a massive weapon for him. And there it is, just like that. We've got our first two matches in the books here on day number three, which will pretty much lock up. Again, we've got some calculations to do in the pool play between David Wagner, Andy Lapthorne. And just to let you know, we've got uh, some coverage coming up at 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And we're going to take a quick little break, but coming up, we've got a great women's match between Julia Capocci of Italy and Lucy Schuker of Great Britain. So we hope that you'll continue to join us throughout the day as we bring you this third day, final day of round robin play here at the NEC Wheelchair Tennis Masters. Uh, so we're going to just going to take a quick little break, but we will be back for coverage. So join us uh, for coverage later on today. One o'clock Eastern, six o'clock Greenwich Mean Time will be our two times today that will kick off our additional coverage going forward. Thank you, everybody.
We're back live here at the USTA National Campus, the site of this year's NEC Wheelchair Tennis Masters. I'm Paul Walker here on the broadcast, and I'm joined with, uh, in the booth, Mackenzie Solden, U.S. Paralympian and tennis player training here now full-time at the National Campus as we are about to see a final round-robin match in the women's division between Julia Capocci of Italy and Lucy Schuker of Great Britain, uh, two players that you're probably pretty familiar with, certainly more Lucy Schuker than Julia, as Julia is a first-time participant in this event, Mackenzie, but, uh, and also kind of a new player to the tour. But uh, welcome to the broadcast and uh, share some thoughts on what you know about these two ladies. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me back today. Um, so as we look at these two players, they've only played two matches against each other. Um, so they're tied head, uh, one to one, and that was both this year. Um, the first matchup was a, a two set win by Julia. The second matchup, three sets by Lucy. So I'll be interested to see the result today. Um, the conditions are pretty good. Yesterday was a bit chilly. Today it's a little bit windy, but um, pretty perfect temperature out here. So, yeah, notice you're in the tank top. I you am. know, uh, it's like you're you're certainly a Florida girl now, right? Exactly. Yeah, no holding you back. <laughs> and it's Lucy Schuker right there. It, it, now we switch to Julia Capocci, uh, who's uh, had a really great uh, opening tournament here for the first time ever at the NEC Wheelchair Tennis Masters. She's off to a one and one start in her pool play, and so her hopes to advance into the crossover and semifinals is still in play. Uh, it's Lucy Schuker on the bottom of your screen. That's probably uh, in a little bit of a tougher position, having opened up with her first two round matches uh, with losses. So I think that's probably going to all, all but eliminate one. And if you did, probably didn't hear that at home, but uh, I just took one off the dome as the girls warming up. It's Julia giving the wave as she just drilled one off my head. Uh, I'll try to scramble and recover. Julia thinks it's funny. <laughs> Lucy thinks it's really funny. Mackenzie, everybody pretty much thinks it's funny because they're not the one that took one on the dome. You gotta but, be alert uh, up here. It's okay. Uh, that's a first in my career as a, as a broadcaster and of course uh, when I say that uh, I've not been uh, doing much of this in my lifetime so <laughs> I'll tell you that was fun. I'm Thanks for blocking lie. that one for me Paul. I'm going to have Julia sign this ball yeah. uh, after. Keep that as a souvenir. Uh, keep it as a souvenir. That's a Wilson U.S. Open number two. Uh, I just took off the left oh, wow. side of my head. That was a special moment. God, was a, I was, wish the folks at home I'm probably had got, seen that. It's possible that I could blame that blame that uh, traumatic brain injury, possibly. <laughs> yes. Uh, right right there. <laughs> Boom! It was, a, it was a devastating blow. And uh, you got to get a look at me here taking that shot off the head. Bam! But you know what? I'm still up. I'm still talking. And uh, we're going to continue anyway. Who had, who is a tennis player or coach or whatever hasn't been been hit by a tennis ball? It ain't the worst thing in life. It does hurt. It does hurt. <laughs> but anyway, we're going to put that one back in play. Uh, almost feel like I should have chucked that at Julia just to get <laughs> even with her. So, I don't know what I did to her. Uh, you know what? We've had a good relationship. Uh, yeah. Met her in a couple of times. Uh, she gives me uh, she gives me a little wave there. Starting off a little rough today. That's all right. I think it was the wind. I think the wind's blowing in this mm -hmm. direction. It was just a slight miss hit, but uh, only only missed by about 50 feet. <laughs> Pretty close. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, back to this. Uh, back to the talking about more uh, specific things. Get a good shot of Lucy Schuker right there, uh, who's been a long time great competitor on tour. Uh, has had a tough tournament here so far, opening up with two losses in the pool play. But, uh, you know, as I mentioned probably in the opening broadcast uh, about uh, Lucy is one thing that, that I've come to admire about her is that she is a, an intense competitor. And despite the fact uh, that she's lost a couple of her opening round matches, it's likely that she's going to be playing for, for a little bit of pride here. And I know she's got a lot, so she will push uh, Julia as hard as she can to kind of force, uh, yeah, maybe be the disruptor, maybe be the... Uh, Maybe be the underdog that kind of kind of maybe disrupts Julia's plans about moving forward in this draw. So we'll see how it plays out today, Mackenzie. Yeah, Lucy's definitely one of those players. She's been around for a long time, so I've gotten to see her play quite a bit. She's one of those players that even if she looks like she's down, she never gives up. And she fights through it and usually ends up <laughs> pulling out those matches that are close. Yeah, yeah, she does. Uh, when she gets into those tight scenarios, uh, you don't see Lucy back down. That's really one of the, the great traits that she possesses as a player. But I'll tell you what, it's Julie Capocci, who's really been a, kind of made a bit of a splash here, having to see, uh, defeated the higher seed, Sabine Ellerbrock, in her opening match, which was a really uh, great dynamic match uh, over on court two on the opening day, as she defeated Sabine in a third set tiebreak uh, to kind of get her NEC Masters 
career off to a really great start. It was her yesterday against Dita de Groot, the top seed and number one player in the world. That gave her her first loss in the pool play, but nothing to be uh, ashamed of there, losing to, losing to Dita, because uh, these days it's, it's most everybody loses to Dita. Yep. She's pretty good, I hear. You hear? I think I, you know more that. than you, you know more than you hear that. You've <laughs> yeah. probably experienced it being on the other end of some <laughs> some uh, possible lashings by Dita, who's uh, currently the number one player in the world and certainly uh, defending champion here at this event. Uh, at this event, and uh, really good chances that she's uh, going to have a chance to repeat here. She's currently undefeated in a match behind us on court two with Sabine Ellerbrock, who again. Uh, you know, if she could get a win against Dita, would almost certainly secure her place in the crossover. But we'll see how that, that match plays out. We'll probably get some updates on that a little later as well. But it's Capocci uh, that's uh, got the big weapons in this match. Uh, certainly the forehand is, is one of them. She swings it. She swings it aggressively. And so she is a, she is a relentless attacker. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be Sugar that's going to be forced to be the counterpuncher today, I think who will be uh, on the defensive, but then also looking for her opportunities to be offensive uh, when Julia lets her off the hook. Yeah, it's definitely going to be a matchup between Power and Lucy having to come up with some sort of uh, strategy to neutralize Julia's power. Um, and as a player myself, uh, Lucy and I share similar injury level. So um, for Lucy, her recovery time is a little bit slower because um, she has a little bit less core than Julia might. Right. So um, utilizing maybe the higher, deeper ball and things like that may work to Lucy's advantage to kind of um, counteract that pure power that's going to be coming from Julia. Yeah, I mean, I don't think Lucy at all can afford to get into a slugfest um, with, with Julia. I mean, that, that would certainly come out uh, in the favor for Julia. So it's going to be some tactical... Uh, plays that uh, Lucy's going to have to make, and, and I think off-pace balls, deep off-pace, but uh, I've watched Julia play a couple of matches now throughout this year as she's kind of continued to ascend up the rankings, and she's kind of figured out how to handle that a little bit, uh, to her credit, and so she's she's got better chair skills than she used to have. She's continuing to evolve as a really uh, serious competitor here in the women's division. She's got up to a career best number six in the world, which is something to be... Uh, proud of and uh, so she's really a threat I think now and one of the new guns on the tour definitely yes so the girls are done with their uh, the ladies are done with their warm-up and so they've just gone to the benches to kind of collect themselves as we get ready to kick off this last round robin match here in the women's division so it's Julia Capocci of Italy and Lucy Schuker of Great Britain. We've already had some intense action here today in the men in the quad division, as that uh, round robin portion of the competition has concluded. And we talked a little bit earlier on the broadcast about the one pool with uh, David Wagner, Andy Lapthorne, and Lucas Atoli all being nodded at one win apiece. And I've been given some information by the tournament officials that it is going to be Andy Lapthorne and Lucas Atoli advancing out of that pool to go into the crossover with the other quads, which will be um, Koji Sugino and Dylan Alcott in its world number one and six-time defending champion David Wagner uh, knocked out of this tournament. Uh, first time in a long time that David hasn't been a part of uh, the final, uh, having won six straight. So a uh, tough tournament for David, but uh, all credit to Andy and Lucas to come out of that pool and all credit to Dylan Alcott, uh, current world number two and likely a chance to go to world number one if he wins this tournament. First point of the match goes to Lucy Schuker as uh, each of these girls tries to get a feel for the conditions down there on center court. Well, as you look out onto the campus there, you see the kids who have been joining us for some of the Sabine Ellerbrock and Dita de Group match on court number two are now departing for some continued activities throughout the day as we've had the second of two kids days here at the NEC Singles Masters. I think uh, it's a great day for the kids. It's a great day for, for us uh, people that are putting on this event and certainly for the players to have the excitement and the passion in the crowds. Uh, I will give all credit to the kids for being really wonderful. 
uh, on courtside. They must have been threatened with bodily harm uh, to be good kids <laughs> to and be so to, to be quiet. They really were, weren't they? They were like they little were angels quiet. over there. There was a couple hundred of them, and so you know, fifth grade kids, uh, they can get a little bit, they can get a little bit crazy. I'm mm -hmm. sure they're pent up and now going a little bit crazy that, since they've been released from the court. But uh, they were really wonderful while they were courtside and great fans, and it brought some good energy to the to the matches that they were watching. Yeah, we were able to speak to them this morning a little bit about wheelchair tennis and kind of the differences um, and then do a little demonstration for them and they they were really into it they asked a lot of good questions they, and they it was a good ask, time they asked some funny questions one of them they? was why tennis <laughs> i'd be like why that's, not kid yeah, that's the question <laughs> so it's 30 15 here on the opening service game of julia capocci uh, it's shuker with a one-point advantage potentially an early break but we'll see how it plays out currently at 30 all Double fault by Julia. There's the quick advantage to Shuker in this first game. It is great to have kids out on the campus uh, participating uh, alongside uh, all the other activities that are going on here. Um, and so I'm glad you had a chance to spend some time with them. Mackenzie, I know that's just, an, I think it's an important part of, of educating our youth and getting them to know that uh, when they see somebody, say, with a physical disability or something like that, that it's nothing that they need to shy away from or it's nothing that they need to, need to wonder what's going on. Uh, they can be free to inquire and, and be honest about what they're, they're interested in. Uh, but you give them a good example of what a person with a physical disability can do. Uh, so I'm thankful that people like you, Chris Herman, one of our top U.S. men, came uh, up from the University of Florida to spend the day here mm -hmm. as well with the, with the youth. And uh, that's the way I think you conducted the... Uh, exhibition with so thank you to Chris as well first game here goes to Lucy Shuker good start for Lucy she's uh, gotten off to a couple of tough starts in her matches so certainly just to get that first game is probably going to be a confidence builder for her as she goes into her first service game served by Lucy there. A little bit of a frame by Julia. Still probably getting used to the wind out there. There's a little bit of a crosswind um, coming across the court right now. There's the high ball you talked about. Lucy's mm -hmm. likely to hit a lot of. And there's the big forehand that uh, she's going to need to avoid for mm -hmm. the most of the, most of this match if she's wanting to stay alive here. I hope she can't let that ball get too short in the court. That just allows Julia so much um, room to dictate the point. And she's looking for that. I mean, that's her style of play. She does not back down. She's generally on the attack as often as she, she can be. She's got that kind of wiring mm -hmm. as far as her mentality and her approach to the game. She is looking to be aggressive all the time. Pretty nice return there by Julia. Yeah, right clean, down the line. Clean backhand down the line is right. And so uh, she's off to an early lead in this service game by Shuker. Uh, chance to earn herself a couple of possible break points and, and get that break back. Another good return there. Serving it right into that backhand. Yeah, I think uh, I think Lucy was probably trying to get into the body, but it mm -hmm. was uh, good skills there by Capocci that uh, allowed her to drive that backhand cross court for the clean return of serve winner and earn herself a chance at two break points. Good job by Lucy getting on the attack and said, you know, she's going to probably play. Uh, the defender a lot today, but she's certainly going to have to look for opportunities to get on the offense and earn herself some some points through being aggressive, and that was a good opportunity there. Uh, she put a nice deep second serve in, got a fairly central but weak reply, and, and got hard on the attack, driving that forehand deep into Capoche for the, for the forced air.
Is served by Lucy there. So you mentioned that you and Lucy kind of share a, a similar uh, physical setup. Uh, is your chair uh, that mm-hmm. you play in set up similar to Lucy? So in other words, if people were wondering what, it, what it's like that you look like when you play, is, is that similar to what you look like there, Mackenzie? Yeah, um, both Lucy and I, we have... Um, there's a nice inside-out backhand by Capocci for the winner, and, and uh, we, we come to know over the course of the three days of competition when she hits a winner, you, you're typically going to see that fist pump from her. It's just something that's kind of trademark for her to keep herself positive, keep herself on the up and up. So chair set up. Yeah, so as you can see with uh, Lucy's chair there, she has kind of a strap going around her waist, and that's that helps her um, kind of counteract that uh, lack of core strength because of her injury level and that's us that's a nice back yeah that's a great back end by lucy from the center of the court kind of slicing it with a little mixture of underspin and side spin and it hits that outside line and then just continues to kick off the court uh, lucy kind of known to have some great hands in the sport of wheelchair tennis really a, an accomplished doubles player and there's that strap that you were referring to, Mackenzie, that kind of helps belt her into the chair mm-hmm. and give her some abdominal support uh, because of the lack of abdominal muscles that she has access to. Yeah, that just keeps her kind of one with the chair, um, whereas players like Julia and some of the other girls on tour can just use their core um, to really get into the shots. Yeah, a lot, lot of use the chair. Right. A lot of them you'll see um, will be kind of belted in at the hips, uh, you know, a lot lower, mm-hmm. and they're able to access, like I said, the, the function that they have in their abdominal muscles and then use those abdominal muscles to rotate and turn to execute their shots, whereas players like you and Lucy uh, don't have as much access to those muscles. And so you kind of got to utilize the rotation of the chair to maximize that as much as you can. Mm-hmm. Add in Lucy. Yep, good good first service game by her. Chance to go up to love. Just missed Close that. Serve. Yeah. Lucy's one of those players, too, that she has um, multiple different kinds of serves that she can pull out, um, which is, is a pretty good thing to have. You don't know what's coming at you a lot of times. But that was a, another great backhand return by Julia there. So uh, a couple of different serves at your disposal as you continue to train here and, and continue to get yourself back into the to the mix in the women's game. Uh, what kind of serve are you specializing in these days, Mackenzie? I'm uh, going for the the kick slice. The kick slice. A little bit. The clice. The clice. <laughs> it's a new thing. The slick. They're not ready for it. It's it's coming though in 2019. <laughs> <laughs> you getting ready to unleash that on the yeah. tour? Wow. Mm-hmm. You've been warned. You've been warned, <laughs> it's ladies. Coming. Mac is coming and she's bringing the slick, <laughs> the, the slice and the kick yeah. combo or the. The clice. The clice. Yeah. Clice, sir. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Have you patented either one of those yet? You I might haven't. want a copywriter patent. I should do that now. Yeah. I might have to step away right. for a few minutes. Hashtag click. <laughs> Let's get that trending. <laughs> so it's Ad Capoche here in the second game of the first set. Um, Shuka with the first game, having broken Julia on her first service game. Now Julia looking to reverse roles. Nice shot by Lucy. Yeah, wide open court. Really didn't even need to be anywhere close to the line. Kind of a conservative response. Uh, pulled her that far out. Julia not able to get back in time and and really just a ball down the middle of the court was good enough uh, to win that. I think a lot of players will make this mistake by seeing that massive open court and trying to get too close to that line and then possibly just having an easy unforced error by hitting something wide or everything like that when all you really need to do is hit it to a pretty conservative target there for the winner. There's an example of one of those uh, balls up high to Lucy uh, that Julie was able to get up on the backhand side, and that's a, that's a problem area for players like uh, Lucy and players like you, isn't it, mm-hmm. Mac? It is, definitely. When, when the ball gets a little bit above the shoulder is when the balance starts to go a little bit. So those are definitely tough shots. That's yeah, a smart uh, shot. Yep, and another thing that you would point out is that um, with, with paralysis uh, in the lower extremities, well, you know, a lot of these players have the ability to... to 
press off with their legs if they don't have some paralysis and have function down there. Um, and so just that alone kind of helps stabilize them as they're reaching up. But if you're paralyzed below the waist, then there's nothing to kind of press off of. It's not like you're coming out of your chair because that's against the rules, mm -hmm. but you really do at least have the ability to extend and press off and, and stabilize yourself up yeah. there. And that's just something that you and players like Lucy don't have the ability to do. Mm -hmm. again. backhand a whole lot on these serves. Um, I'm not sure if she's trying to go for the body or she thinks that uh, the backhand will be a good strategy here for the long haul. Based on what I've seen over the course of a couple of days here, I, I think it's wise to avoid the Capochi forehand. <laughs> um, and so I think that's that's definitely probably a tactic that uh, Lucy is looking to employ. Uh, not that Julia's backhand is bad, but I don't think it's the weapon as she, as she hits an easy backhand winner. I just don't think it's the weapon that the forehand is. So you might as well start things off on, on your terms, mm -hmm. getting to the lesser strength. One of, the, one of the tactics that players often miss is that when they're trying to get to one of those lesser strengths, they overplay it. Um, and that's that forehand. Yeah, and that's frustrating when you go to the lesser strength, she hits a winner. Mm -hmm. So you say, all right, well, let me throw one to her strength just to see if she's a little off balance. And then she, she <laughs> whacks another that. winner, a better winner. Yeah. And then you're like, good Lord, where am I going to go, right? But uh, mm -hmm. I, think, I think maybe we're going to see one into the body here. She's gone wide to the back end. She's gone wide to the forehand. Why not get one into the body now? We'll see how it plays out to go wide again but yeah you know you, you just try to minimize the amount of looks that your opponent gets on their on their best weapon mm -hmm. that's, that's a, a great tactic you, the fault there. you know and that's i think that's produced because of the two winners mm -hmm. i mean it's like a lot of pressure to say all right i put one over there on the backhand i put one on the forehand she crushed both of them um and then you try to do too much maybe you try to go for a little more depth and placement and then you know you kind of get distracted for a second next thing you know double fault and mm -hmm. one all. Mm -hmm. oh, great depth by Julia there, huh? Mm -hmm. Right on the line. It's as good as you can do it. Right up and over the top of Lucy's head. Yeah, even if that ball was in Lucy's uh, range, that would have been a, a tough return for her. Probably would have landed short. attack by Lucy to kind of force the action there and get the unforced error by Capocci. And so we're at 15 all. Lucy looking like a Florida girl there in her tank top and sunglasses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think she, she knows she's going back home to Great Britain where she might not see the sun for the next <laughs> four months, right? She's enjoying it while it lasts. Yeah. Might <laughs> Gotta have, get that tan. Might have booked a couple extra days here in, in Orlando, and after the tournament's over, we're like, yeah, we know what we're going back to, so <laughs> why why rush? Nice angle backhand by Lucy there. There you go. Out wide to the backhand. I'll That's look a at tough that. One. Yep. Julia kind of has to clap her hands a little bit. Give her the tap and acknowledge that great shot. Dead even, one game apiece, 30 all.
Yeah, I think there's an example of, of Capocci hitting one out wide and, and getting Shuker off balance, right? Mm -hmm. As uh, uh, Lucy was forced to kind of get extended. And again, that's where the balance comes into play. And you could you could kind of tell on that one, you could see the unbalance yeah. uh, in Lucy there on that shot as she mm -hmm. kind of tried to get that one out. And she had built that point up beautifully. Mm -hmm. It's just that last shot put her a little off balance. Wide on that serve, double fault. So it's deuce. A lot of deuces in this match so far. Yeah, right. It's been pretty even. I mean, it's been mm -hmm. it's been dead even. Neither one of the players kind of able to establish. Been a few more winners by Capocci, uh, but also a few more unforced errors. So Lucy's looking to kind of keep the ship steady, uh, knowing that the explosive player on the other side is the one that might be dictating play and hoping to keep her off rhythm. Just wide. She knows she has to go big on the serve returns there. That's, that's where she can really take advantage and start dictating the point early. Yeah, I think that is absolutely one of her best opportunities there. Um, you've got a fixed area in which you know the ball's coming, so there's not too much requirement on the mobility, but uh, there's the unforced error and the hold by Capocci for a 2-1 lead on our first break. Possibly we'll look to get an updated score over on court two as Sabine Ellerbrock and Dita de Groot of the Netherlands are competing. Uh, I'm sure our crew will do their best to get us updated over there. And per usual, right on cue, there it is. Dita with a 6-2-3-1 lead, up 40 love. Kind of uh, doing what Dita does there is pretty mm -hmm. much dominate in the competition. Um, she is she is the class of the field right now until somebody takes that title away from her. I think she kind of feels like it's hers, and somebody's going to have to step up and play some big-time tennis as she extends that lead to 4-1 in the second set. Uh, and she's clearly going to advance out of that pool, having won three. Look at that. Gold Julia all the way from Italy, and uh, it's good to see that. Gold Julia got some support in the stands. Always happy to see that. Give them the big thumbs up for their girl, Julia Capocci, competing here at the NEC Tennis Masters. You know, it's, it seems uh, silly or simple, but it's, it's little things like that that a player could look over to at a, at a tough part of the match and, and maybe gain some confidence from or gain some, some good, you know, just kind of po positive energy from just something as silly as that. So uh, little things that make all the difference sometimes. And we'll see if mm -hmm. Julie's going to need something like that today. We don't know yet. Yeah, those kinds of things are definitely good to look over and kind of take your mind off things sometimes. Get a little burst of positive energy from the fans. So. Lucy steps to the side there, shifts her chair to the side, lets that one fly long for the first point of her second service game here in this opening set of the last day of round robin play here at the NEC Singles Masters. Lucy Schuker at the bottom of your scene from Great Britain. Julia Capocci on the top from Italy. Both looking to finish up their round robin play on a positive note. Julia a little aggressive there, had the opening, came forward, made the right play. Just a little bit too uh, aggressive with the volley. Taps it wide. Schuker with a chance to hold and get it back to two all.
A nice rally by two girls there. Lucy did a good job of getting that serve into Julie's body, um, which gave her kind of a neutral ball to start off the point. Look at that, 40 love on her service game here. Good position for Lucy to be in to hold. Just misses the Just serve out that, wide. That wide serve. Yep, yep, and uh, not missing it by much. So certainly it's something that she's practiced and feels comfortable with. Good return there by Julia. Yeah, you could see much. the power coming off that one. Yeah, too much pace, too much depth, mm -hmm. right? Yep, just tough for Lucy to come out of that recovery move off the serve. Uh, ball get on her quick. Fifteen, Lucy. Yeah, it's a great point, and that's something that uh, Julia, with the strength of her forehand, can hit a shot like that from deep, deep in the court and still be very effective. Had an open court to go to, chose to go behind Lucy for the easy winner, and erase the first two hold points that Lucy had. Here's hold chance number three, but up and over the top. Shot. And so it's back to Deuce after the early 40 love lead by Lucy Schuker in her second service game. Yeah, that shot um, that's hit behind the player is one of the hardest to get in the game of wheelchair tennis because of the recovery time. It just takes a couple extra seconds to get the chair around and by that time the ball's past you. So that's a smart play there. Yeah, and, and again, uh, players like you and Lucy who again struggle with a little bit of some balance issues mm -hmm. that have to, that hard uh, outside turn that you're forced to do when the ball comes behind you uh, really kind of can throw you for a loop balance wise. And so it's a, yep. it's a good play against you. Great depth there on that return to serve. Oh, just long, advantage Lucy. So she just lets that one skate by her. It's looking pretty close there. Yeah, it is advantage Capochi. Yep. Lucy with the nice hands Love that. Love and that. game. So it was indeed advantage Shuker. And with that drop shot winner right there, great sign by Lucy to hold serve there. Sees Julia going on the defensive push. Drops that one softly into the box for the easy winner. And two games all. Really good start for Lucy. Uh, kind of regaining her confidence. Can't be even here early in this first set. Yeah, Lucy is so good at those drop shots. I don't think that's utilized enough in wheelchair tennis when you get your opponent back at that back fence. And just drop shot doesn't even have to be that good, really. Um, but if you do a good job pushing them back, that's, that's a great way to control the point there. And Lucy did a good job of that. Has Coach Harnett got you working on some of those specialty oh, yeah. shots, Mac? Oh, yes. <laughs> Always. Always. All right. Yeah. Yeah, you got to access all that. You know, we've seen great examples of that in the men's game, uh, women's squad. I mean, across the board, it is a, a really well-employed strategy uh, when you're kind of driving balls back and forth across the baseline and, and players are looking to push and defend really hard back there. Uh, there's only one way to keep them honest, and, and that's to drop some balls short once in a while and then force them to have to come and get it. Even if you don't win the point, it kind of sets things up for the future. 
Nice return by Lisa down the line. Well, we're on the verge of a win here by Dita Groot on court number two as she's in a position at 6-2-5-2. We'll come back to that probably for something that looks a lot like a match point here in the very near future potentially. But that's a great update by our crew. It's been outstanding all week. Uh, pretty much on top of everything we asked for and we're, we're appreciative to give you guys the best uh, experience possible with uh, going back and forth between two courts and updates and really, really great stuff. Fifteen forty, Julia. Lu Lucy's looking pretty good out there right now. Yeah, I'll tell you what. You know, she kind of has uh, got the match at a pace that I think is good for her. Not letting things get out of control. And there's another. Serve missed by Julia. Well, uh, and a bad forehand miss. She just seems a little bit uh, out of sorts, not really in much rhythm, and that's, uh, I think, a testament to what uh, Lucy's doing on the court, that she's not allowing Julia to get a good rhythm, you know, as we mentioned earlier uh, in the pregame. It was going to be important for Lucy to kind of loop a few balls, drive some balls, kind of change the pace, change the rhythm. And so I think that she's uh, she's been the one that kind of has controlled the pace of play so far today. Yeah, she's done a great job of mixing it up, making sure Julie doesn't seem see the same kind of ball twice in a row, which is a really hard thing to deal with as a player. Yeah, Julia certainly uh, likes the pace, and I think she's kind of fed off that in a couple of the matches that she's had so far where players have been willing to provide it for. But Lucy, being the smart and experienced player that she is, is saying, all right, no, I know that's exactly what you want, so uh, you'll get it when I decide. Looks like we're having another umbrella change out here on center court. Yeah. Not sure um, what's up with the umbrellas with today. The umbrellas today. <laughs> well, it's just it's, uh, that sun is hot, and so they're going it with is. a. Oh. It's like a hard top. It's like a. It's interesting. Some sort of. Maybe it maybe it's better for viewing for the official, so she's going to get oh, some yeah. blockage of the sun because it's mostly at her at her back, and then uh, but probably better for her to be able to see some lines. Uh, that umbrella sometimes can come out. And, Looks like that's going to fit. Put the at a disadvantage with their view. The sun is pretty hot right now. She just not needs to get a, get a bonnet. <laughs> One of those large sun hats. Yes. They sell them in the pro shop. <laughs> Here's a quick update on court number two. So we track over there, right behind our center court action, is... Uh, Dita DeGroot and Sabine Ellerbrock as Dita is serving. Might not be something that you're seeing on the screen for a second, but trust me, it's happening. And so she's on the verge of closing out this match, but not yet. She hits a forehand into the bottom of the net. Right now we're still waiting to get back to action here on center court. Lucy Schuker serving at three games to two. What's been a pretty unexplosive but uh, kind of steady back and forth match between the two players. I think they're still kind of trying to feel each other out a little bit. And it's Lucy that's kind of made the best adjustment so far today. And, and Julia, who's failed to get on one of those really streaky hot streaks that she's capable of doing. Second volley that she's missed. First one being wide to the sideline. That one she kind of punches into the net. Not a not a place that she's uh, unfamiliar with over the course of the last couple days. I've seen Julia on the attack a good many times. Not afraid to come in the net, try to take balls out of the air. But today, a little bit off might be the wind. Lucy's still going to that backhand. Another and, nice return there. Yep, by and Julia, Julia having the response, didn't she? Mm-hmm. Wow, nice back. <laughs> Lucy, Lucy looks across the net kind of like, really? <laughs> Are you? 
And just when it looked like that match was going to wrap up on court two, it's uh, Sabine Ellerbrock fighting back to get the second set to five games to four, still at a disadvantage. Uh, but uh, really good fight by Sabine to keep that match alive and keep her hopes of crossing over into the semifinals alive as well. well Lucy Great. got jammed by there, mm -hmm. right there by that return. It's a tough one. Yeah, certainly a, a loss there for Sabine and a win by Julia would uh, put Dita and Julia into the crossovers. So we'll see how that plays out throughout the day for both of these players. There's that forehand. It's not bad. Yeah, you know what? You're getting a good chance here, Mac, to scout out some players while you're you're working on uh, on the commentary here. So mm -hmm. uh, make some notes, kid. You know, I mean, you're gonna have yes. to play uh, these girls in 2019 as you get back out on the Uniqlo wheelchair tennis tour, and uh, I'm sure your paths are gonna cross with one or both of them at some point throughout mm -hmm. the season. And be advised, that's a lethal weapon right there. <laughs> taking notes right now <laughs> <laughs> i don't see you writing anything down mental notes. mental notes mental notes okay all right all right well what do we always tell you write it down helps you remember it does it's a proven philosophy on how to do it okay i'll, I'll go grab my notebook all right start start jotting those. down notes all right multitasking Real here, uh, love fifteen. Great point there, great. All right, we're looking at a possible situation over here on court two with Sabine Ellerbrock, top of your screen, serving to Dita de Groot, world number one, looking to lock up a victory that'll send her at three and zero oh into the crossover as the top seed on Saturday, but. We're not quite there yet as Dita makes that unforced error into the net and leaves the possibility still an advantage for De Groot and a match point. Big forehand for the win and it's Dita De Groot, world number one, cleanly and clearly heading on into the semifinals as the top seed in her pool and overall top seed here on the women's side and it's Sabine Ellerbrock will have to wait to see the outcome of this match between Julia Capocci and Lucy Schuker to determine whether or not she's gonna have a chance to advance. If it's the upset victory by Schuker, it'll possibly be Ellerbrock. And if it's a win by Capocci, it will certainly be her advancing along with Dita de Groot out of that pool play. So congratulations to Dita as she books her ticket into the semifinals. And now we're back live on court one. Julia Capocci serving at three games all. One. Yeah, Lucy. Had, Lucy kind of was in a guest mode right there, yeah. wasn't she? <laughs> yep. She had her literally against the back wall there. You heard, yeah, you might have heard the bank. That, uh, yeah, literally against the back wall and then had a guess kind of on that short ball, which way Julie was going with the forehand. And you're 50 50 there, and sometimes it works when mm -hmm. you do that, but not on that one. So, Capoche still 
uh, looking down the barrel of a break point by Shuker. He need to put a good serve in. And uh, it's going to be a second serve that Lucy gets a look at for a potential break here. No need to even take a swing as Capocci offers up the double fault and the game loss to put her at a disadvantage with Shuker up four games to three on the changeover. And that would, uh, again, this is early on in this match, but a win by Shuker here would probably throw that pool into the tiebreaker scenarios that we had to talk about a little bit with the uh, with the quads. And so it would be uh, Capocci and Sabine Ellerbrock probably looking to see how the, the numbers fell in, in each of their favor or not to determine who's going on. Uh, Shuker would be one win and two losses. It would be Capocci with one win and two losses, and it would be Ellerbrock with one win and two losses. I guess all three of them would be in the mix, wouldn't they? That would make things interesting. For that sure. surely would. That surely would. So uh, there's a lot at stake here. So it's uh, just when you thought you were out, you're possibly back in. Again, in the round robin play, it's um, you know a little bit of everybody beating everybody possibly there. That's how it came out in the in the quad division with uh, American David Wagner and. Andy Lapthorne and Lucas Satoli all uh, kind of trading wins and losses throughout their round robin portion. And it was ultimately Wa uh, Wagner on the on the outs as he will not defend his title here. And um, it's Andy Lapthorne and Lucas Satoli moving on to play against Dylan Alcott and newcomer Koji Sugino of Japan. That's why you gotta love tennis. You never know what's gonna happen. It is uh, kind of one of those mystery things, right? Yeah, you know that's I think one of the beauties of the sport is is playing the competition that's uh, intense at all times. And uh, you know, it's uh, any given day, uh, the person that comes to play and just embraces the conditions has the chance to win. It's the mentality you gotta go into with every match. Mm -hmm. oh. oh, misjudged that one a little bit, I think. Yeah, slight apology by. Uh, Capocci there. I don't know if there was a mishit uh, situation there that she uh, was not proud of, but will certainly take. But nonetheless, it's a, an early point advantage for her. Another nice backhand down the line for Julia. Lucy's still going to that backhand on the serve. Well, I think it's a it's a good play for her. I think it's a it's a game plan thing, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of times players come in with game plans and then maybe abandon them at, at, at various points. Of course, uh, with a four three lead, there's no reason to abandon a game plan that seems to have been working for you. Mm -hmm. But uh, as much as it may say, oh, you know, that's all I'm ever doing is hitting balls over there. Well, no, just stick to it until it's, mm -hmm. there's a reason to not stick to it. But that's certainly the game plan uh, seven games into this match. That shows a lot of discipline on Lucy's part because you can get really discouraged as a player when you see someone, you know, hitting winner after winner on something that you know is the best game plan, but you might get frustrated in that moment and start to go away from it. And that's, that's when you can really start um, going downhill fast, so it's really good to see Lucy sticking to that game plan, even though it might be a little frustrating. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, Julia caught fire there, and we talked about that she can be a little streaky. Uh, she's certainly explosive, and so she's getting some good looks at those backhands now, and she might be kind of fine in the range, and so it might be time for Lucy not to abandon the game plan, but make a few little adjustments and, and maybe feed a couple of those forehands just to keep her off balance again, let her maybe disrupt that rhythm that she certainly seems to have a uh, found on the backhand side. We're at four all, really starting to get into the critical part of this set now, Mac. Great return by Lucy. Absolutely. Right in the strike zone. Yeah, jumped on that forehand, right? Mm -hmm. you know, we, we can't see her eyes behind the sunglasses, but I'm sure they lit up right when she <laughs> saw that one. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Tennis players all know that feeling when you get the get the ball you want right in your mm -hmm. spot. It's like go time. It's the best feeling. It is it's a good feeling.
great point there. Another really good return by Lucy, keeping her deep and kind of catching her off balance a little bit too, then going in for the attack. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna comment uh, here in the in the ninth game of this first set that I, I just don't really see the energy uh, from Capocci mm -hmm. that I've seen on the first two days of competition, and you know I don't know if if uh, playing for a third straight day that's something that she's just a little bit tired, or maybe uh, she was taking this match a little bit for granted, thinking that you know she'd, she'd probably be able to roll through it with, without having to put forth 100. percent But as we mentioned. Lucy is a, is a phenomenal competitor, and so she's going to bring it. And uh, if Julia does not start to match that uh, energy-wise, uh, she could find herself on the, on the short end of this situation here. Yeah, you definitely have to bring your A game against Lucy because she's, like you said, such a good competitor and, and a, also a veteran player. Mm -hmm. um, she knows exactly what she needs to do out there. So. Oh, there's Capocci finding the range right there. Serve into the body, didn't create any huge opening, but with a shot like that, the way she hits the forehand, um, you don't have to have a big opening if you're gonna put it in that location. Yeah, that's about as good as you can get right there. I would say so. It's like a triple word score in Scrabble, right? All the yes. letters just lined up, <laughs> massive point value. You a Scrabble player, Mac? Um, I can't anymore. say that I am. <laughs> I can't say that I am. <laughs> I have uh, played Scrabble. Okay, all right, thank I'm not, you. I'm not avid. Okay, not avid. It, yes. Not an avid. Oh, that'd be a good Scrabble word, though, avid. Because you'd get some good point v. value off the V and the D. That's true. Yeah, yeah. I'll remember that. Okay, yeah. But somewhere in the world, AVID is uh, some sort of a an acrostic for something. It probably is. Yeah, that yeah. sounds like it would be. Yeah, I think it's in it. And if it isn't, it should be. It, right. I'm sure that somebody out there somewhere is using AVID for their for their company or probably. slogan or saying mm -hmm. or to represent a series of words. But it's Capocci now at five four. As we come out of the changeover here uh, with Capocci leading 5-4, I'm joined for a moment or two, at least we're lucky to have in the booth with us right now, Lucas Satoli, uh, quad uh, participant in this competition. We're going to back up a little bit here and give you a look at our guy, Lucas Satoli, who just advanced, got word that he's advancing out of the quad round robin into the crossover. And so we want to congratulate, uh, congratulate Lucas on his uh, accomplishments so far in the round robin portion of the tournament. And so uh, great job, Lucas. We're going to be over there talking a little bit about uh, what it's like to be crossing over and going into the semifinals. Uh, it's, uh, it's a good feeling. Uh, I, I didn't think I would make it uh, when I first lost my first match. Uh, but I was positive the way I was playing, it's just that I had a bad day on the first day. But then I'm glad that I did uh, put it through. Uh, there's a great shot of Lucas, uh, and so we're congratulating him on his acknowledgement of going through into the semifinals today. Uh, not today, but tomorrow, as advancement out of the pool play. And that's, the, that's one of the unique 
things about pool play, isn't it? You've you've participated in this tournament before to know that you know just despite the fact that you're you get one loss doesn't mean that you're necessarily out of it. Ah oh, yes, uh, you can uh, still make it up uh, after your one loss. Uh, uh, because it all goes to the games uh, that you play. Yeah, you must make sure that you compete for each and every point because it counts at the end, uh, which I think uh, I did uh, good today. By winning uh, today's match was tough, uh, was challenging, but I'm glad that I did uh, overcome those uh, obstacles and I'm happy to be in the semifinals. So we, uh, I think we're aware of the crossover, so you'll be playing Dylan Alcott in the, cro in the crossover, if I'm not mistaken, is that correct? Ah, yes, it's correct. Yep, so Dylan comes out as the number one seed in the, in the other pool, and uh, Andy Lapthorne, who ended up uh, losing to you today, but ended up winning the pool, will be the number one seed, and he'll cross over to play Koji Sagino. Um, certainly, you're, you're pretty familiar with Dylan, right? And uh, having played him on a number of occasions already, so uh, what's, your, what's your thoughts going into that? What's your thoughts on going into that um, matchup? Oh, I think it's going to be one of the uh, good match. Uh, I'm going to give it all I have. I'm going to try to to keep calm and keep him moving all over the court and try to to create some short balls and make sure that I finish those points and I think I uh, should be good. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you what, we've we've admired some of the great shot making that you've put on over the course of the last couple of days, in particular that match against Danny Lapthorne today. Um, your backhand was, was really the difference maker in some areas where the, the court wasn't even that opened up and you were able to hit some, some pretty incredible targets with that backhand today. Uh, yes, I've been working uh, so hard uh, in my uh, strokes, uh, forehand and backhand, uh, but it comes out that it uh, looks like my backhand is more powerful than my uh, forehand. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I just uh, just from having watched a number of matches over the course of several days, um, it's 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 certainly your forehand is, is nothing to, to to you know say is not good or anything like that. But but it's, it seems yeah. to me that the backhand is is what you feel most comfortable hitting, and it looks like that's the one that's the most lethal for you. That's your, that's your biggest uh, weapon. Uh, yes, it is my mm -hmm. one of my biggest weapon, uh, including the serve. And yep. I just set up a lot of balls with my forehand because it's so much easier to set it up. Right. And then when it comes, I just move around and then I just kill it with my backhand yep. because I think it's the strongest weapon I have. I like to hear you talk about <laughs> killing it. Yep. And it's uh, as we as we finish up this uh, interview. We got Julia Capocci having just taken the first set from Lucy Schuker here in a really highly competitive match uh, that if Capocci wins, uh, she'll be moving on to the semifinals to join you in the, on the women's side, uh, at least anyway, in the semifinals. And if Schuker can get the win, uh, that would send that into a situation much like you guys had in the quad division where it'll come down to uh, the percentages. So, uh, you know, there's a lot at stake here in this match. Uh, yes, I think uh, we will. Uh we all know that each and every point counts at the end. Uh, we need to put up, uh, you need to fight. Ah, we're going to take a quick look at <laughs> Lucas's match point as he serves for the match there. Talk us through this one, Lucas. Well, it didn't take long, did it? <laughs> Not a lot of talking to do there. <laughs> Got a ball you can handle? Uh, yes, that was my uh, setup forehand, actually. Mm -hmm. But then I set it up in a way that was a, a good shot. Then I got there the last point of the match, which was a win, and I was happy after that because I was a bit struggling to get it when I was leading three love up on a second set, but then I'm happy that I did put it through, but then Andy came up with some good uh, shots, and he pushed me to the corner, and then, you know, when you once pushed in a corner, that's where you have to come up strong and go back. All right, so pushed into the corner, come out fighting, right? Yeah. That's that's the motto. Yes. Yeah, you don't have to win all the points in the match, Lucas. You yes. just have to win the last one, right? <laughs> yes, that's a very important point to me. <laughs> I'd say it is, too. I agree with you there. Uh, well, we're going to rejoin our coverage here on Center Court, but I, I'm really thankful that you took some time to, to talk to us. Overall impression of the tournament here, first time here uh, in, in Orlando. What, what's your sense of the tournament? Oh, this is a good uh, center, the good weather, uh, good food, mm -hmm. uh, mostly, and good people. Uh, I think this is one of my best uh, tournament ever this year. All right, glad to hear yes. that, and it's a good way to finish up the year, isn't it, as you head yes. off into 2019? Oh, yes, it is, it is. Glad that I've made it to the semis. Come on, let's make it tomorrow. All right. Take it to the finals. Good luck to you tomorrow, Lucas, and congratulations on moving forward in this really uh, prestigious tournament. All right? Thank you. All right. Well, we've got a quick break on court, uh, center court there uh, at the completion of set number one. It's Julia Capocci uh, taking the first and opening set here on center court, 6-4 over Lucy Schuker in the women's competition. 
And behind us on court number two is uh, the initial warm-up in a men's match between Joachim Girard and Takashi Sanada from Japan. And it's Joe with one win and one loss in his pool play, and uh, Takashi uh, currently at 0-2. So again, there's there's stuff on the final day at play. If it's Joe with the win, uh, he'll certainly advance. If it's Takashi coming up with probably what would be considered the upset win, not that uh, this match is, is a given at all with him being as fine a play as possible, uh, it's going to be uh, another possible tiebreaker scenario. But there's, uh, there's the scoreboard on center court with, uh, as we've talked about, Capocci having won the first set in a really close and hard-fought battle. We're continuing to be joined in the booth by Mackenzie Solden, having just had a nice little interview with Lucas Satoli of South Africa, uh, talking about his pool play victory uh, today over Andy Lapthorne and his advancement into the semifinals tomorrow. Uh, Lucas was pretty, pretty excited about that. Played some great tennis, uh, you know, and that's a great example of the round robin format, Mackenzie, where you know he lost his first and opening match, but uh, kind of stayed the course and, and continued to fight the fight, uh, knowing that uh, if down the road he could get a get a win, uh, put himself in a position to, to possibly advance, and that's exactly how it played out. Yeah, that's the nice thing about these round robin tournaments is, even if you lose your first round, there's always another chance stay in it so and certainly having traveled uh, from south africa i had that uh, you know you've made that trip before i think and that's a that's a that's a long journey uh, from the united states <laughs> yeah you know but you know but you make that trip uh, it's a long 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 trip so there there's some certain some recovery so in your first round maybe you're not feeling up to par and of course we talked about day number one here at the tournament was uh, some unique conditions uh, and there's certainly some conditions that I'm sure most of the players haven't played at, uh, played in in a long time. I'm mm -hmm. guessing that a lot of the players have transitioned into training indoors uh, as they've come into the latter part of this year. And so to be training indoors in those pristine conditions and then, uh, and then coming in, uh, as mentioned, we're still covering live here on center court. There's just a, a quick restroom break in between sets here, so play will resume. We'll continue our coverage. So for those of you at home watching and listening, uh, if you need to take a break, go get something to eat, use the restroom yourself, uh, feel free. Now's the time because you don't want to miss one minute of this coverage. You don't. You don't. It's going to be a thriller second set. It's going to be a thriller second set. And so, well, we expect a, we expect a really good second set. And uh, But to continue on, it's, um, you know, um, so many factors that go into to performing at this high level. And again, you come into a tournament like this where you don't have a chance. Uh, Lucas would typically be a guy that is seated in a tournament. And so he might get a, a fairly easy first or second round match that he can kind of, even if he doesn't play his top game, probably come through all right. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't be that he'd be matching up against a David Wagner or an Andy Lapthorne uh, until it was the semifinals or finals typically. Uh, but here it is on day number one for them that those guys are competing. And so... Uh, yeah, if you're if you're a little tired from your travel, it's not like they got in the day before. But again, that that type of trip from South Africa um, will will tax you physically, and then the conditions and everything that they had to play on day one. But so again, credit to Lucas for uh, moving through the draw. Yeah, that's definitely another advantage too is getting to play tough matches um, right away, whereas some of these seeds might not see that until semifinals or the finals, and and when you get to that point you kind of have to be on your a game instead of getting to kind of build up to it see see how you're playing that tournament kind of work through some of the stuff and maybe like the travel um fatigue and things like that you can work through with with some tougher matches and that builds your confidence as well at the beginning so uh as, as you talked about that it, it reminds me of an experience that i think i know uh, you've had in your career um having won the pair of pan am games uh what year was that 2011. 2011. And so uh, talk us through that journey there in 2011 when uh, you came into that tournament. And uh, as, as I recall, uh, a little bit uh, out of sorts rusty. And, and, and not rusty <laughs> and, and not exactly in, in top form after yeah. having traveled and, and playing there. But but how did that unfold ultimately? That was a that was a crazy tournament for me. Um, I, I had been at the time um, playing basketball a lot um, because I was on a scholarship at the University of Alabama. Roll Tide. Um, roll Tide. Any Bama fans out there, leave a comment below. <laughs> um. All right, well, we're getting ready to get play kicked off there. There's a great shot by Julia Capocci. Uh, this is just a little highlight action there with her taking that backhand volley as she closed out this first set big forehand in the corner we're just going to get a sequence of shots that uh, 
uh, ended up producing the victory in this first set by Julia. So we saw three different looks there. One a volley, one a backhand, one a forehand uh, to show you that she's got some weaponry. And we're, we're back live here on center court. Uh, not quite ready to go yet, but um, I know Julia's ready to go. She's eager to get this second set going. She doesn't want to cool off. She, she kind of had the hot streak at the end of that, that set. Uh, it was from four all. She kind of took charge there and, and closed that thing out with a roar. And so she's kind of looking to get back in the back in the action here as quick as possible. But continue your story, Mackenzie, about your 2011 Paralympic experience, having coming off the, the basketball circuit, playing there at the University of Alabama, mm -hmm. and then getting a chance to go compete at the Para Pan Ams down in Guadalajara, Mexico, correct? Yes, correct. Uh, yeah, so I was an alternate, actually, um, for that event, and I was able to to go and represent and then you know I had to work through a lot of um, rust with my shots and had some some long three set matches at the beginning of the tournament had to work through um, some some of my um, lack of practice I guess you could say um, leading up to that um, but I was able to work through it and as as the tournament went on it got better and it got better and I got and it got better and so I think that's going back to what we talked about before, mm -hmm. getting to fight through some tough matches at the beginning that can really help you. Um, and I was able to eventually go to the final and, and, and win the gold medal in another three set match, which wow. I, was, I was ready for at that point mm -hmm. um, because I had had a couple already in that tournament. So it was a, re it was a really good experience um, to kind of to see how strong you can be mentally too. Um, it's not just about having the best shots or being, you know, the strongest player out there. Um, it's about, uh, you know, the whole package, the mental game, the physical game, everything like that. And you can forged see. by forged by fire, forged by fire, huh, Mac? Oh yes. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, under under Hardcore. duress sometimes, but looks like Lucy <laughs> Shukur has uh, rejoined the the match here after a quick restroom break, and she's. Uh, strapped herself into her chair and pushing out onto the center court there uh, prepared to take on Kapochi and Kapochi serve here to kick off the second set uh, down one set to love um, but as we've mentioned a couple of times it's uh, Lucy's tendency to be a fighter so we'll see how much she uh, brings to the to the table here in the second set or if Julie is really kind of settled into a groove we'll, we'll find out here pretty quick I suspect Thank you for sharing that story about your uh, your Para Pan Am experience there, uh, Mackenzie. Um, I know you're you're really proud to have uh, made that achievement that uh, punched your ticket into the 2012 uh, Paralympics in London, where you competed in tennis, uh, and then of course you you did what you never should have done, and you and you ditched us. You ditched the sport of tennis for I the did. sport of basketball. I did. And uh, then joined the U.S. Uh, women's basketball team. But I, mm -hmm. I got to give you credit there because you didn't mess around. You I went to I Rio uh, as a member of the U.S. women's basketball team. And uh, and how did it go there, Mac? We did okay. You did okay? Um, we did win the gold medal. Oh, okay. We so did that's, win it. Yes. You did win it. So you are a Paralympic gold medalist. Yes. Yeah. So there's not many people that can say that. You're a para Pan Am gold medalist in tennis and a Paralympic gold medalist in basketball, a two-sport athlete and superstar. And so, uh, yeah, there's, there's just not a lot of folks that can say uh, such things in their lifetimes. You really have accomplished a lot in your, in your young career. So congratulations to you. Thank you, Paul. I think that was like a compliment. That was number two. Was that number two, yeah, if we're counting? It was. Yeah, I gave you one the other <laughs> day, right? Second compliment of my life from Paul Walker. I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm getting more and more comfortable with giving you these compliments. And it might be. I, I'm going to have to check myself. <laughs> there's a little tear forming in my eye right now. <laughs> Nice shot by Lucy. Yeah, three points Perfect. in, and it's already Shuker up 40 love on the first service game. Uh, so good start for her. Maybe maybe cooled Kapochi off a little bit there on the break. And that's uh, Lucy looking forward to getting off to a good start in the second set. But it's uh, Julia Kapochi with the ace up the tee right there. There it is. It's as good as it looks right there. There's the fist pump. And... Uh, not uncommon uh, for players to get down 40 love. Oh, there's a quick look at Capochi serving here now at 1540. As 
that a habit of yours to clear any any ball on the court if it's left there after a serve? Yeah, for me, I, I don't like to have any uh, ball in the net while I'm serving. Oof. Big, and that's, and I, I mean, I got the headsets on, I could still hear that. Yeah. I mean, you know, that was like a, a big solid. pop. Yeah. <laughs> and so as she pushed forward, took that ball off uh, almost like the half volley and just, mm-hmm. just crushed that thing into the open court. She might uh, check those strings after that shot. Yeah, right. Yeah. Realign them. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, that's that's not uncommon for her, though. That's that's not something that uh, I think she's uh, she's uncomfortable doing. That's that's a play that she'll, she'll gladly execute repeatedly if given the opportunity. wide so it is deuce here in the first game of the second set yeah I don't know what it is about that 40 love lead that seems like it should be in a lock and yet how I mean percentage of times that it goes back to deuce at a mm-hmm. minimum now whether or not you know the person who is down that many wins the game but uh i'm always shocked at how many times uh 40 love leads just just disappear i don't know what the psychology is on that but it's it's odd to yeah. me it's just one of those things i think if you're if you're like too complacent with that it can easily slip away yeah i think i think the way it works is that um you know, the first point, you almost be like, okay, it's just one point. You know, then maybe the second point, either they hit a great shot, you make an unfortunate, and then all of a sudden it's like a uh oh moment, right? Yep. Where Pressure's you're like, oh my on. God, I was, I was just up three points. Now it's, you know, 40 30, and oh, what happens if I miss this and it goes to deuce? And so, uh, however that system works, it just seems to happen a lot. But here it is with Shuker with an add point. Oh, that's what you call feeding the beast yep. right there, Mac. It was right in the strike zone. Yeah, it was. And I don't Julian, think that's where Lucy wanted it. <laughs> no, oh, no. Yeah, 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 you can see that. She's not happy with that. Had a good look at that return. And at least needed to get Julia stretched out a little bit. Back to Deuce. advantage Julia Capocci. Uh, she reaches into the stands to get that errant shot by Lucy Shuker. Collects it up. Get, looks to get back to work here to try to get that one game to love lead here in the second set. Get herself back to where she feels like she should be in the lead. And there's that forehand again. Great shot by Lucy, and I heard Julia kind of shout out to herself a little bit of disappointment and probably not doing enough with a couple of those forehands that she had a chance to hit right there, went center, good depth. And so this is the one here that she has something to do with, and she just doesn't maneuver that ball out of the middle of the court and gives Lucy a chance to hit her backhand winner. We're back to deuce and just a kind of loose swing at the serve there. Another double fault. And so again, advantage Lucy Schuker. But that is something we have seen in a couple of the matches with Julia. There are occasions when she can get a little bit sideways on her serve. Um, just kind of doesn't trust, doesn't seem to trust it enough. And it seems like on day one that was the case and then on day uh, three here. And I think uh, a lot of it's got to do with the wind. So it's pretty breezy here. It seems like as we've even just come onto the broadcast for this match that the wind has picked up a little bit. Oof. 
couple of fault there. That and the last two, uh, the, that is what that you would hurts. call just deceleration. <laughs> Say it with me, Mac. Deceleration. <laughs> there it is. I mean, that, that's a, that, you know, and for, for you kids listening at home, <laughs> deceleration on the second serve is a bad option. So uh, just continue to swing that thing. Trust your swing. If you put the time in and practice, uh, you got you got to know on the second serves, you got to generate the racket head speed. And, and on those last two second serves, Julia did anything but. And so with those double faults, she gives Lucy the quick break of serve and uh, in, the, in the love one deficit second set. That was a nice quick tip, Paul. Thanks for that. Oh, Lucy oh. desperately trying to catch up to that one, but not quite. The ball up and over her head. I can't track it down, but uh, no lack of effort from Lucy. As we mentioned, that's what you're always going to get mm -hmm. from her. Uh, something that I think as a as a spectator I admire and certainly as a as a fellow competitor you know I you gotta you gotta have a healthy amount of respect for somebody like that yeah and definitely as an opponent that that can be discouraging when when you see your opponent never giving up on any shot yeah that's um, kind of no your plan I'm, I'm, I'm gonna give you your third compliment Mac. Yes. you ready for this yeah. you're sitting down I'm sitting down. Okay, I have uh, been for a while. That's uh, that's that's a that's a trademark that you have as well. I know I know that wow. you don't ever give up, and that I think that's the basketball mentality that you have. It's just that gritty blue collar approach that uh, doesn't matter what's happening. You're gonna you're gonna dig for everything you can. But after the backhand winner, uh, it's Capocci with a couple of early points here in this second game of the second set. Just long. Lucy looks up to the chair umpire, somewhat questioning that shot. I don't think she's somewhat questioning it. I think she's completely questioning it. <laughs> she doesn't look happy with that one. Umpire gives her a quick nod, saying, uh, nothing I can do to change that call. Sorry, Lucy. Uh, sorry that you think it's out or <laughs> in, but uh, I saw it out. Just laughing it off, laughing it off. That's, that's what you got to do sometimes. Yeah, I agree. Here it is, Love 40, though, three. Oh, well, we'll see if the Love 40 game plays out like we've seen it play out here a few times before. This is our this is our experiment right mm -hmm. here. Just missed that backhand in the net there. So looks like it's on track. Yeah, there's the loose point, mm -hmm. right? So okay, I'm 40 love up. Uh, take a loose swing. Don't really care a whole lot if I lose this point. Maybe that's the mentality. Uh, but now this, to me, this is the critical one. This is the one where you got to kind of get it back on track that. because again, if it goes to the 40 30, now all of a sudden you start to think a little bit. So we'll see. the loopy balls uh, that you talked about that mm -hmm. Lucy I think is happy to employ and force Julia to hit no pace looped balls definitely trying to keep her back yep Oof. you could hear the frame on that one mm -hmm. as Julie looks at her racket and now on schedule here it is from 40 love to 40-30, at least 30-40. Lucy having gotten rid of a couple of those break points that Julia had at her disposal. Yeah, you know, Lucy's doing a great job of keeping that ball deep, and even on some of those that bounced a little shorter, I'm surprised Julia hasn't come in and tried to take some time away, uh, take it on one. There's the freebie by Lucy, who she smacks the ball across the court, knowing that 
She just needed to get one in there to give herself a little bit of a chance to get back in that game, but it's the double fault that gives Capocci the game and 1-1. One, one. Yeah, I think on, on those Luby balls, I think why Julia's struggling to, to get uh, the groove on those is, again, we talked about it's getting breezier out here, so, you know, you might, with the pace balls, they're going to come through, cut through the wind a little bit, you're going to kind of maintain your normal swing path, but, you know, now you got a ball that's floating up there in the air, uh, the wind's moving it around, it's tough to kind of really get it lined up, and it, it does definitely seem to be something that gives her a little bit of a problem. Great hands by Lucy Schuker. Classic Shuker. Lucy right there. Yeah, that is, right? Kind of come out of that turn there. Just kind of stab, slice that ball. Drives the back end there. Just reaches, touch, angle, everything you want. Well done. It's a nice high ball by Lucy. That's a tough one. You gotta kind of choose go in or yeah. Get back you don't you that. don't have much time on that one, right? right? You, it's it's make a commitment and go with it mm -hmm. quick. And typically, I think it's it's go forward. On a day like today, if you decide to go backwards on that, I think uh, there's only bad things in your future. There's a certain lack of confidence in this, uh, this second serve of Julia's right now. We'll see how she attacks this one. Yeah, even there. Just really like kind of just trying to get that just in. Just really looking to roll it in, and, mm -hmm. and that's dangerous if she gets into a serve funk. Yeah, that's one of the hardest things to kind of get out of as a player. If your serve starts to go, you kind of lose confidence, and the other shots start to get a little shaky and. It's hard to work your way out of that one. At least for me. I hear No, no, I don't think it's uncommon for, for a lot of players. Uh, there's Luki, uh, Lucy making an attempt to kind of play a more aggressive point. And again, I give her credit for that. I think that's the balance. I mean, you just can't go to all the, the loopy lob game. you got to continue to maintain some level of, of aggression. So on that point, she was looking to be a little bit more aggressive and, and just made the unforced error there. And so we're at... 30 all here in this third game of the second set. Yeah, I didn't hear the I didn't hear the out call, but uh, it is indeed out. And it's Capocci. It's uh, capable of playing the lob game a little bit as well, mm -hmm. successfully. And earned yourself a chance to hold serve here. Yeah, Lucy got caught a little bit on the in-between bounce there, fought it off, did a nice job of fighting it off, but was then stuck and kind of out of position. And so Julia sensed that and, and went aggressive with an easy forehand winner to, to get that game and go up 2-1 here on the changeover.
Lucy's getting ready to serve this fourth game of the second set. You can see Julia coming out of the changeover pretty quickly there, trying to keep her momentum going, I think. another one of those serves right into Julia's strike zone and that forehand's just too good. You know, that's one of the terms uh, I've used for years when coaching. Uh, I just like it. You know, again, that's kind of from a back baseball background. You know, when you hit more balls in your strike zone, you are a Hall of Fame hitter. You know, if you want to hit 300 in baseball, it needs to be that you've been swinging at pitches in your strike zone. And so for players uh, that are learning to play the game, you know, if you sometimes just concentrate, do whatever you've got to do to move your chair to get a ball in your strike zone. And when you're doing that, you're going to find how amazingly successful you are compared to, you know, kind of lackadaisically maybe just moving your chair around and, oh, well, if I get it up here at my shoulders, that's fine. Or if I take it off my, my shoe tops, that's fine. But somewhere between knees and uh, and, and chest height and, and a little bit at your shoulders, uh, that's where you want to be. And if you want to be a little bit more consistent, a little bit more lethal, um, get in the strike zone. Yes, agreed. And as you saw there, another nice drop shot by Lucy. Yeah. 15 all. And, ooh. Just wide. Aggressive forehand swing by Capoche there. She likes that one. She'll even feel pretty good about that, knowing that she just missed it by a little. But uh, And that's a good job by Lucy. Again, not necessarily going every time to the backhand, but giving Julia a chance to unleash on that forehand, knowing that she'll be aggressive with it and maybe produce the air. Another backhand return, cross court. Yeah, she's she's had a number of those today. I mean, she's been uh, pretty steady on that, despite the fact that that's the, the game plan that Lucy mm -hmm. clearly is looking to stick to. It's tough to ride that out when, again, when your opponent is having some, some success in the area in which you've kind of determined you're going to go to to hopefully prevent the success. But uh, she, she is uh, steadfast and... and determined to stick with the plan. I think that's kept her pretty close in this match. I agree. I agree. As it's Capochi who goes inside out off the deuce side. Cross court for the backhand winner. And once again, a chance now to uh, extend the second set lead possibly to three games to one. Pretty sure you're going to see an aggressive Julia here on this second serve return, knowing that she's got a chance to take this game from Shuker. That's Lucy who executes with a great wide second serve, really pulling Julia off the court. And uh, Julia going for a little too much. and Going for that down the line winner. Dumping that ball in the net, so... Nice job by Lucy Shuker to get it back to Deuce. Lucy jammed up, fights it off. Great combination, Great ground point. stroking, right, Mac? Right. Lucy's so good at those volleys, too. Little That's half volleys, just delicate, softening up on the hands, you know, pushed Capochi back and off the court, sensed she was in a great position, recognized it, pushed forward, got the soft response. Little half volley, dumped it over the net. No Beautiful. response in that, yeah. That's, that's also something that makes Lucy uh, one of the better doubles players on the tour as well. She has such great hands, and she's so good at the net. 
yeah, she's got a lu- she's got the luxury if she's with an op- uh, with a partner who can track down and put a lot of balls in play off the ground. There is a great job by Lucy. Hold serve. Get this thing knotted at two all here in the second set. There's that wide serve. Julie just doesn't get the good look at it. Not enough depth. Easy forehand winner for Lucy. And that's uh, another great example of Lucy sticking with the game plan. out of the turn quick enough to get around and get some strings on that one. Bounces it off the frame. The first point of this fifth game of the second set goes to Capocci. On the line, fist pump. Second serve set up nicely. Yeah, right they, for Lucy to be able to strike that one. Good breathing techniques there by Lucy. See so her kind of exhale on the on the shot. Want to hold that breath in and tighten yourself up. So good job. She's trained in that regard. Here's another example of what was it? What do we call that, Mac? Deceleration. Yeah. Right. Exactly right. <laughs> Deceleration. D, not X. Yes. <laughs> Don't get it confused. No, not to be confused. <laughs> you know, if you think about it, if you're uh, on the grading system, acceleration starts with an A. a. That's good. A is D, good. Deceleration is a D. When's that's the last time bad. you got a D in any of your courses? Never. Never. Yeah. Straight A's. Straight A's. <laughs> Straight. Since the beginning. Acceleration. <laughs> Julia playing the lob game equally or a little better in that point than Lucy. Putting her on the back wall up against the NEC Wheelchair Tennis Masters banner, which is uh, so beautifully adorning the center court here at the USTA National Campus in Lake Nona, where we are into day three of the coverage of the NEC Singles Masters with Lucy Shuker driving a forehand return a serve winner down the line to take a 40-30 lead in this fifth and critical game of the second set. Great forehand by Julia pushing into the court and cutting off the time on Lucy on that one. Yeah, there's the, there's the answer to get it back to Deuce. This is turning out to be a thriller of a second set, like I had predicted. Oh, look at you. I'm just saying. Uh, no, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to make any <laughs> counter argument to that. It's a battle. It is. It's a, you know what? And, and I will tell you, it's it's uh, it's just where Lucy wants it. Uh, now, we were kind of in a similar situation in the first set, and it was Capocci uh, after four all, uh, deep in that first set that she kind of turned it up a little bit and, and closed it out but uh, I think it's it's Shuker that kind of seems to be in that just hanging out mode mm-hmm. like as if you know I'm just going to steal a set here and, and take this thing to three and uh, again that's exactly what uh, Lucy would want right now I would, I would not bet against her in the third set you know, I'm not saying who I think would win it but uh, it, it's always tough to bet against Lucy a competitor and experienced player that she is Nice get. And, and easy finish. Shot, yeah. That's a nice job. Really nice job. 
by Lucy as she goes to the changeover up 3-2 now in the second set. It's a good get by Julia, but just pulled way too far out of position. Lucy with her own fist pump on her way to the changeover bench. Well, wow, you can see the, the full campus in uh, full sunlight here as we're into day three of our competition, wrapping up the round robin portion of this tournament. And over behind us on court number two is Joachim Gerard of Belgium versus Takashi Sonata of Japan in a pretty critical head-to-head -head match, finishing up the round robin portion of the men's pool. And uh, looking at Derek's head-to-head, -head, it's Gerard who leads 10 to two overall in that matchup, uh, with these two not having played any time recently, but. Joe certainly with the advantage, and certainly the advantage there in that uh, first set. But not by much, as he's only up 4-3 in a really competitive first set so far. So good job with still a lot at stake for both of those gentlemen as they attempt to get into a position to advance to tomorrow's semifinal. And right now we're back to center court in our coverage here of this women's round-robin match between... Lucy Schuker from Great Britain and Julia Capocci from Italy. Capocci haven't gotten the first set, but it's Schuker with a 3-2 lead here in the second. an unfortunate part of tennis there. It bounces right off the net, rolls right over. It's nothing you can do about that. Did we get the obligatory apology? I didn't see one. You didn't see one? Uh-oh. Could have been there. Could have uh, missed it. It probably was. I think both of these girls have played enough to... Going soft. Right. Mm -hmm. Not going to get there. So good. So yep, good. yep. I think that that is going to be as we continue down the stretch here in this second set and possibly into the third. I think you're going to see Lucy try to employ that as often as possible. It seems to be something that's worked almost every time. I mean, I think she's probably about four for four on that mm -hmm. on that shot so far today. That's a that's a really good percentage. Yeah, that's just a matter of seeing the court really well. Oh. Just out of reach there. Yeah, there's that backhand return by Capoche. You know, it seems it's funny. It seems like she has more success. Uh, on that shot off the first serve than she does off the second serve for whatever reasons. I'm not sure, but uh, when she's got some good looks on the first serve, she's really dealt with it. But second serve is when she's kind of missed it a little bit. We'll see here. Chance to break and get it to three all. Just a tough one right there. She got Lucy pushing back to the back wall again, and Lucy had to be defensive there. No, she kind of got on the got on the on the offensive, stayed on the offensive. Mm -hmm. You know, hitting some aggressive. You know, swinging the the bracket a little bit more aggressively on both sides there. Patient, patient. Lines it up. Andiamo. Is that what she said? I believe it is. <laughs> okay. Something like that. I mean, maybe somebody out there could check my Italian, but I think that's something kind of like let's go. I love to hear the different phrases that the players use in their in their native languages. You know, the vamos and, uh, and what Come else? In. Come in. Yes, exactly right. Stefan Olsen, we've heard a number of those from him. <laughs> he's just playing some just really spectacular tennis. Uh, the number six seed here, but uh, currently 2-0 and oh in pool play, having defeated... 
world number one Shingo Kaneda yesterday for only the second time in his career. And so really a phenomenal win yesterday. Uh, just an outstanding uh, level of play from Stefan in his opening matches so far. Playing loose and playing easy. Three all in the second set. One set to love Capocci. Talk to me, Mackenzie. Looks like that serve was just wide. Yeah, but why? But why? Why? Decelerates <laughs> it. I'm going to keep banging that drum. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a problem that she, uh, I, I'll tell you, I mean, you know, we don't know the outcome of this second set yet. She may yet fight through that and, and win this match, but you go to the third set with uh, with that that in mind, you know, like, my gosh, I don't know what's going on with my serve today. That's not a good place to be at. But anyway, that's Shuker with a 30-15 advantage here. Uh, looking to take a lead in this set as it gets a little bit later. Yeah, that's something I've had to learn as a player because it almost seems counterintuitive sometimes to when you're having trouble with the serve to swing faster. You kind of want to slow it down but that's not the way to go. No, it's not. And it's uh, Capocci who lets that one sail, thinking it's going to sail long, but sails well within the line, now giving Shuker a chance at uh, two break points to take that 4-3 lead here a little bit deeper as we go a little bit deeper into the second set. Oh, yeah. Nice. She knew that was good right away. <laughs> Boom. And where did she hit that ball from? Strike zone. There it is. See, you look at you. You pay attention in class. I'm learning I, yep, so yep. much. Oh, so much, right? <laughs> but yeah, that's a that's a great job by Lucy there. She seems to have Julia kind of out of sorts. We talked about how important it was going to be for her to keep uh, things out of rhythm for Capocci, and she's done that. You know, it was a really competitive first set that just kind of slid away at the end. Capucci kind of stepped up and hit some big shots, but right now it's Shuker in control of the second set and uh, really doing everything she can to keep her opponent off balance. Uh, certainly the player with some of the big and bigger weaponry uh, has not been able to kind of really find the rhythm. So uh, we're going to see where this one ends up. And there's your score update on core two. It's 6-3 uh, for Joe Ger Gerard as he kind of continues his way towards moving on to the semifinals. He's been playing some outstanding tennis. It's been Takashi Sonata, who's uh, struggled a little bit in this tournament so far. I mean, a, a really wonderful player, strong and powerful, but uh, has come up against some of the some of the big boys in this game. And as uh, he's advancing into his third round robin match, it's him up looking at an uphill battle against Joe Girard, a, a two-time champion in this event. So Joe knows what it takes to win here in this in this tournament. Lucy Schuker to serve at four games to three. just off the tape. I think at this point, Julia will take anything. You know, she seems to be a little bit out of sorts. And uh, maybe it's something like a net cord winner to get her back on track here. But yeah, I think at this point, she will take anything she can get. It's a nice return. Yeah, kind of a different approach yeah. there with a little bit of a slice forehand return. It kind of, I think, surprised Lucy. Uh, ball kind of hit and took off a little bit. And it's quickly love 30. Just long on the backhand. 
can tell she's still swinging big, trying to get into a rhythm there. Yeah, it's the rhythm that she really hasn't been able to find, I'll tell you. That's, that's uh, reading her body language a little bit, and um, I'm not seeing like she's feeling it right now. So it's a good job by Lucy to have taken her out of this rhythm. Just missed it. Yeah, kind of Ball timing. Got a little high on her. Yeah, there. timing was off on that. Needed to stay behind that one a little bit longer. Uh, got out ahead of it and then ended up reaching up and not being able to control it. And you can see her kind of wondering what's going on as we're 30 all. From love 30 to 30 all, this would be a, um, it really would be a huge hold for Lucy Shuker to get up 5-3 in the second set. Oh, that's just a good shot. Yeah, it is. Yeah, pretty comfortable. Um, Lucy kind of not knowing which way Julia was going to go with that one. Kind of had 50-50 there. Ball mm -hmm. in the middle. She was pushing into it. Had a couple things at her disposal. So it's Capocci now with the break opportunity to get to four all, which is where we were exactly where we were in the first set before she went on a little run to close it out. So maybe she's looking for a little deja vu. <laughs> That's a double fault. Oh, yeah, that is that. at a most inopportune time. Yeah. And uh, as stated, we're now locked up at four games apiece in the second set with uh, Julia Capocci having won the first set six to four. Uh, but it, uh, it got some good news and I've got some bad news for Julia. You know, I mean, it's, she got the break there, but now she's got to serve. And this has certainly been the side that she struggled on. And we'll see. Uh, She'll see how she handles this critical service game because if he doesn't hold here, she's going to have to break to stay alive in this second set. So she would desperately, I think, like to, to get this service game and be in the lead going into the changeover at 5 4. Nice return by Lucy, but a little, a little too short, I think. Yeah, you know, Julia and I just took advantage. I, I think that Lucy, uh, you know, should sense that that Julia is not going to go aggressive on her serves. That she's going to just look to put some serves in, based mm -hmm. on the fact that she's struggling a little bit with it, and she should look to get after some of these serves because she's going to get some some eat. Look at that! I mean, that's not an aggressive serve, mm. and that's on her first serve, which she typically uh, is aggressive with. Well, we're gonna we're gonna look for a certain something on this second serve to see if we get any indicators or how she's feeling. Oh. Yep. And there it is, and that's what I'm talking about. Um, I think I think Lucy's smart enough and experienced enough to know that Julia's struggling on her serve, and that uh, she's going to need to take advantage of it on this service game here. Because I just don't see Julia being aggressive and going for much that that should put Lucy at a disadvantage. Another double fault? Yep, just not enough spin on that ball um, and just floats it long because she just doesn't have uh, enough spin to pull it down. And again, that continues to be the, the pattern here with her service games. Lucy takes advantage again. Yep, there Beautiful it is. Backhand. And now two break points for a chance to serve the second set out. So Capochi kind of went a little bit aggressive on that first serve there, but I think uh, if I was in an opportunity, had an opportunity to coach her up on the sidelines, if it was allowable, uh, I'd be telling her to hit aggressive second serves every time she swings. Aggressive second mm -hmm. serves, even on her first, uh, just to eventually try to get her into a rhythm where she could trust that second serve again and to have the mentality of, of uh, kind of rebuilding the confidence in that shot, which she clearly doesn't have right here. There it is. That's game. There's an example, and Lucy knows it. She can smell it. 
you know, she knows that, uh, hey, I got a chance to go into a third set with a girl that has absolutely no control over her serve right now. Mm -hmm. And that would be a great position for Lucy to be in going into that third set. So we'll see how Julia responds uh, with the returns here. My sense is that she's going to be aggressive because she knows uh, she desperately needs to get the game off her return of serves because of the struggles she's having on her own serves. And as the referee calls time, as the chair umpire calls time, it's Lucy Schuker coming out onto the court with a chance to serve for the second set. And even this match at one set apiece, Julia Capocci over there needing a return to serve game of a lifetime here to get back and get this thing back to even. But uh, I think it's Lucy with a lot more confidence going into this game than Julia does. Great shot. There's another Italian exclamation from Capocci. Just trying to get herself pumped up. Yeah, I mean, it's the right thing to do, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You got you to gotta feed your own animal sometimes. There's the give and the take of the net cord mm -hmm. gods, right? She got right. the last one. Uh, and it's this one that falls in favor of Lucy Schuker to put this possible last game of the second set at 15 all. The net giveth and the net taketh away. It sure McKenzie. does. It's good when it balances itself out. Yeah, it does tend to do that. She's on that one. Ah, uh, yep, yeah, yep, yep. She yep. anticipated that one pretty well. Yeah, I think that Start one, she got a good read on that one uh, a whole lot earlier than, than most of the other drop shots that Lucy mm -hmm. was able to execute. So she was anticipating that one, as you mentioned. So. Yeah, I think she could see that Lucy was kind of stretched out up high, and there's really not much you can do up there. Yeah, exactly right. So it's Capoche 3015. It's not quite good enough. Yeah, there's the play that's worked well for Lucy. You know, when she's yep. gotten that serve out wide, which has been her play all day, when Capocci's uh, been able to go cross court on that return, she's had a lot of success. Mm -hmm. When she's failed to go cross and left that ball hanging out middle or forehand side to Lucy, Lucy has punished her almost every time with a really easy and aggressive, you know, cross court forehand for the easy win. And now 30 all, just two points away from taking this thing to a third set. And it's a ball that uh, floats just long. Uh, it was a tough call there with the ball hitting right at the baseline underneath Lucy's chair. Mm -hmm. It was tough to tell what the outcome was, but ultimately it looks like it went in Capocci's favor. Well, that's a fine line there between 
in and out. Yeah, and Lucy did a great job of kind of placing that serve into the body a bit on Julia, and she just had a pretty good deep return there that yeah. put Lucy off balance. Mm. See some frustration there, uh, Lucy, knowing that inches away from probably being a 40-30 position versus 30-40. A second serve here for Capocci to get it back to five all. Stretches Lucy out. Can't finish down the line. Takes the backhand into the net, and we're locked a deuce. I think that's a little bit of nerves right there. Because I think that's right where she wanted it. Just didn't stand enough on that shot. Yeah, I agree. And uh, it, it's just, you know, kind of plays off of what, what she's struggling with right now, which is confidence. You know, when you're playing well and confident, you hit that shot and you make it way more than you miss it. But when you're kind of questioning everything that's going on in your game, which she seems to be doing right now, that's when you tend to make that error. Solid return. Yep, yep. Made Lucy kind of serve Lucy and not, recover yep. real quick there. Yeah, not happy, but you know what? I see her I see her get right back on the wheels there. Kind of create some, some positive energy for herself, knowing that, hey, you know, she's one good serve away here from getting it back to deuce. Mm -hmm. So doing the right thing there. And like we said before, she's one of those players that just never goes away. She keeps fighting. <laughs> and there it is. Clutch performance. There is. There's the fist pump. And uh, it's back to deuce just like that. And that was a, that was a good look that Capoche had on the serve. She hit the good return, but Lucy was anticipating that one and was sitting there on the backhand. Really, really well done. I think that's an ace. I think that is. That is, you know, I, in a quick instant there, I saw a low toss. And I thought, uh oh, mm -hmm. you know, that's a low one. But that was, uh, I think, by design. And so uh, Lucy, knowing, knowing her game, knowing it well, is able to execute that for a free point and nice advantage to serve out this set. Take notes on that one, Paul. Okay, there it is. See the low toss, start digging for the for the sideline. Oof. Just like that, she gives it back to Capoche, and now we're getting into one of those games where it's uh, you know the back and forth do sad, do sad, and then the tension builds and the pressure builds, and, and typically when somebody comes uh, away from this game, it's it's all their momentum. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just you kind of breathe a sigh, a sigh of relief after you win a game like this, so we'll see who it's going to be. <laughs> nice shot. <laughs> Got Julie a little off guard there. Didn't quite know what to do with that. I'm hearing a lot of Italian <laughs> from over in that corner. Can and you translate uh, it for us? I can't. I don't know if I should. <laughs> Vantage Lucy trying to serve it out again. It should be Julia sitting on a backhand return here. Interesting choice by Lucy there uh, to try to kind of change the direction on that ball uh, and, and take it from such a low position. Mm -hmm. You know, she let that ball get down so low and then tried to lift it up, drop it back down, and that, that's tough. That's tough. They're real tough. It looks like she might have changed her mind on that one. Maybe it was going to go cross court. Yep. She should have stuck with it. Yep. She knows. 
an opportunity lost right there. Back to work. You know, when it's that error, uh, I just got a thought that it's that error that Lucy just made on the forehand there. That to me looks like a critical uh, one that, that is kind of uh, really momentum changing. Mm -hmm. You know, I think she had a, an incredible opportunity there. And I think she had some, some remnants of that in her head there when she went into that, that point over there on the deuce side. And that's maybe what's produced the, the double fault. Just a little lack of focus knowing that she missed that opportunity and that's kind of lingering effect of that. And so now here she is looking at a break point uh, when she was just about in a position to lock down that second set. And I think she knows she missed that opportunity. That's one of the hardest things to deal with mentally as a player when you you know you, you had the game or the set and then missed it for whatever reason. You got to let go and, and try to get right back at it. And there's an aggressive exchange by the two girls and uh, it's Shuker coming out ahead. Pochi got a good look at that first one, put a good swing on it, but it was Lucy who responded. And here we go again, continuing to build the, the pressure and the magnitude of this game. Lucy's found the range there, and uh, Lucy's found the range with those lobs and that, uh, that high looping ball. Seems to be what she's comfortable with right now, and it's, it's Julia that's not really playing aggressive and, and looking to hit her spots, just kind of timid about going in and playing the aggressive style that she's used to and, and is typically successful for her. I don't think this is... This is the strategy that favors Capocci, but we'll see. And there, there it is. And there it is, and a big smile by Lucy Schuker as she forces a third and final set. It's just smart play right there. Yep, you know, has sensed exactly what was the best opportunity for her, what the best approach was tactically, executed it beautifully, has totally taken Capocci out of her game as she looks to chuck a racket on her bench. Uh, she better get herself realigned here going into this third set because, uh, you know, as she hasn't fixed her serve. That's mm -hmm. one we know about. She's out of rhythm on the ground strokes. And so, you know, it's going to take a lot of a lot of deep thought to, to get her mind right as she goes forward in this third set. Looks like we're going to have a quick restroom break um, by Lucy Shuker, so we'll be back with our coverage here. We might be able to give you a quick update from court two before we go to this quick break, uh, as it's Joe Kim Gerard with a set up and 3-1, uh, with a chance to go to 4-1 and possibly uh, put himself into a position to advance into the semifinals with a straight set victory over Takashi Sonata. But right now, uh, we're going to go back to center court in the break there as we anticipate an outstanding and competitive third set between Lucy Shuker and Julia Capocci. We'll be back momentarily.
they're still sitting there eating. But they're eating.
Here we go as we're about to embark on this third and deciding set. We're going to take a quick look at match point, uh, correction, set point by Lucy Shuker here in the second set. Uh, kind of got into a lob war with Capocci, which favors Shuker. And there it was, throwing one up over her head. Big smile by Lucy Shuker. And now it's Julia Capocci serving in the first game of the third set to see who's going to be uh, possibly moving on into the semifinals. Capocci win all but secures it. A Shuker win likely sends that to some tiebreaker scenarios. And so a lot at stake here in this third and uh, deciding set. Welcome back to our coverage of the NEC Wheelchair Tennis Masters. We just took a quick break there as uh, players prepared themselves for this third set. And it's Capocci that comes out there with that forehand winner. Uh, Paul Walker continuing to be joined by Mackenzie Solden on the broadcast. And it's 15 all in the first game of the third set. Do you got a call on, on, on your sense of things here, Mackenzie? Who do you, you know, I mean, not to, not to sway the audience or anything like that, but uh, you got a feel for what, what's going on here in this third set? You know, that's a tough one because I've seen, I've seen Lucy play a lot of times and she's able to dig out these kinds of matches a lot. But then also on the flip side, Julia, if she can kind of get going and start getting more offensive, which is much to Lucy's credit. Her, her strategy has been really good in throwing Julia off her game. Um, I think if Julia can kind of get back to what she does best, um, then Julia might take this. But I really don't have a good answer for you. <laughs> Playing it close to the vest, sitting on the <laughs> fence, uh, you know, non-committal, right? Switzerland. Kind of, kind of play with these girls, Paul. I get it. Yeah, yeah. You don't want word getting back that you picked one over the <laughs> other. Yeah. I know they're gonna watch this after. Well, they might. Hear my comments. They might. Well, you were you were pretty you were pretty neutral there, so I give you credit. It was a smart response. Uh, but it's thirty all, and so here we are. And the key, I think, uh, obviously, is right what we just saw right there. It's it's the Capocci serve. Uh, if she figures a way to get that thing under control and, and possibly stay a little bit aggressive with it. She just rolls that in. Shoot, gives her a fairly easy return. She steps in, takes that early for the backhand winner and a chance to hold her first service game of the third set. It's a nice little slice shot. Yeah, I like that. That's the first time we've seen that from Lucy, but uh, it's a nice, nice utilization of her skills um, using, using the win, which is kind of a side win today, and just kind of slicing that thing into the open court, running away from Capucci, get it back to Deuce. Julia stretched out there a little bit off balance, kind of not getting on the wheels for that extra push that it took to get to that ball. And just like that, it's an advantage to Shuker. I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb here. I'm gonna make a call, and uh, okay. before this game is over, I'm gonna go with Lucy Shuker. Okay. I'm we'll just wait and see. Yeah, I'm not playing favorites or anything mm -hmm. like that. I just think the, that her experience and her ability to kind of make adjustments is probably what was what will give her the advantage here in the third. But uh, as my wife likes to tell me, I've been wrong a time or two. I believe that. Only twice over 23 years, Mackenzie. Only twice. Are you sure? Are you sure? <laughs> By my count. Should I ask her? <laughs> <laughs> so it is uh, indeed the break of serve by Lucy Shuker to get off to the one love start here in the third set. And it's Capocci going around, still kind of probably wondering what's going on here. Yeah, yeah, still struggling with that serve yeah. coming out in the third set. Just got to try something different here, I think. Looks like a cotton field up there in the sky. <laughs> Great shot of our current weather conditions here at the National Campus in Lake Nona, Florida. It's been a really pleasant day here on campus. A lot of activity earlier in the day. We had 200-plus uh, kids out for the second of two kids' days here on campus as they went through a series of stations introducing them to the sport of tennis and in disability sports, so it's a it's a great educational day for the kids, despite the fact that they're out of the classroom. Come 
Yeah, that just wasn't wasn't the right moment, I don't think, to go short. Julia was all over that one. Yeah, I'm not sure what options uh, Lucy had there, you know, but... Uh, Got kind of stuck. Yeah, a little bit. So... Shuker sternly uh, staying steadfast mm -hmm. on the game plan, right? I don't Sticking think she's going to. Yeah, I don't think she's going to avoid it no. uh, here. I think she's going to leave or die by that down the stretch here. That's one she got an ace on late in the second set there she's trying to go back that early here early here in the first or in the first game of the service game of the third set but it's a double fault instead overall i think uh, lucy's serve has been pretty solid today um she's been pretty much hitting her targets looks like just a few double faults here and there and a couple on some crucial points earlier in the match uh, but overall Seems like she's getting it where she wants it. Yeah, I agree. She, I mean, she's certainly more confident despite the fact that she's throwing in a couple double faults. She certainly just looks more confident, and that's the, I think that's the key uh, above all things. Well, uh, just about the time we think we got it all figured out. It's uh, a double-double. Yep. And uh, four straight miss serves by Lucy Shuker to give Julie Capocci two break points and a chance to get this this set tied at one all. And that's pretty much been the pattern in both of the sets, uh, back and forth, back and forth. We got to four all in both of the sets, and it was Capocci in the first and Shuker in the second that closed it out. And there it mm. is. There's the break. A little frustration in that yeah. shot, I think. Well, you know what? I might even say a lot of frustration. Yeah, two. Yeah, Lucy knows two double faults. Mm -hmm. Is a, is a huge gift to Julia. All right. Well, it's me here in the booth, Paul Walker, with Mackenzie Solden. Hello. Hey. Hello. Yeah, say something, Mac. Let them know Hello. you're alive and you're there, <laughs> right? Yeah, we're really enjoying the coverage here in this women's round robin match between Julia Capocci and. Lucy Shuker, and so we're into the third set at one all, and uh, we expect a real, uh, I, don't know, I don't know, tense third set. Mm -hmm. Quite frankly, I think there's going to be a lot of tension and a lot of, a lot of pressure. It's the service games of both the players that are are in question right now, with uh, both having been broken early here in the third set, both struggling with their own serves. She did go big on that serve there. I think she's yeah, she trying, went, she still went, trying to work it out. Yeah, you know what? And I'd, I'd give her credit for trying to stay aggressive and fight through that instead of just continuing to try to passively loop some of those serves in. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if she's going to get herself on track, it's going to be through a through a attempt at aggression. Yeah, up and That's over. That's a nice shot. Yeah, it was. Yeah, that's that's got to be what she falls back on. I mean, and her playing style has got to have her uh, with an aggressive posture, aggressive nature, an mm -hmm. aggressive approach to the game. Because when she goes passive, uh, bad things tend to happen to her. So, much better swings there. Kind of a hard shot to come in on. Yep. I mean, you, again, that's that's. Uh, I give her credit for attempting again to press the action here a little bit. I mean, I think it's the right thing to do. She's just got to recognize the opportunities that present themselves versus just forcing it. You know, that mm -hmm. one was was forced a little bit versus opportunities. I think will come more naturally. Uh, but here we are again in a situation where she's looking at a second serve at 15:30, and and I don't think she's got a lot of confidence yet in that.
it's kind of like a hot potato right now, Mac. It's like you serve, no you serve, <laughs> you no you serve. <laughs> neither, neither one of them want any part of the serve. You know, it's gonna be it's gonna be one of them who's courageous and mm -hmm. and bold and, and daring that gets themselves out of the funk. Nice pickup. Yeah, that was got a little yeah. low on her. Yeah, it did. Still did something with it there. Yeah, I think it was tough for, for Lucy to read where she was going with that mm -hmm. shot. Uh, but here we are. It's like, okay, I did something good, but now I got to serve. Yeah. <clears throat> There's the shot of that cottony sky. Backhand again by Julia. Back to Deuce. Yeah, as she fights it off. To her credit, she was able to get that second serve in there mm -hmm. and give herself an opportunity to produce that backhand winner. second serve she got in yeah it's uh you know <laughs> yeah we're making comments about how amazing it is for these players to get a second serve in as if that's like that's the <laughs> biggest challenge they should ever uh you know have in the sport of tennis but uh it should be something that is well here here it is here's the cliche you're only mm -hmm. as good as your second serve have you heard that one before i have heard yeah, that yeah yeah that's a timeless that's a timeless tennis cliche and uh these girls right now are, are kind it's of true. feeling that yeah because uh, as their as their serves go uh their games are going Looks to the Empire. Yep, looks like it's Deuce now. Didn't get the answer she wanted, right? You could see her hit that one and just kind of try to wish it in, mm -hmm. but uh, no luck. And so it's back to Deuce. Uh, both of these girls just really, you know, kind of showing some nerves, They're trying to fight through it. It's a good aggressive Pretty swing certain. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what she wants. And, that, and that's going to be the difference. It's going to be whoever gets their kind of nerves under control in these pressure situations and, and allows themselves to relax a little enough to actually play their, their best games. That's about the third yeah. or fourth time we've seen that, mm -hmm. that happen to Julia where she's kind of just gotten stuck. You know, and again, um, lack of confidence leads to lack of energy. Mm -hmm. which means lack of pushing, which leads to errors like that, where you're just kind of sitting on the wheels, you're not engaged, and so you get what you get. And, the, and then the pattern just kind of tends to repeat itself. Mm -hmm. So here she is again looking at a second serve that she's not confident in hitting. But gets it in. Great return by Lucy. And yeah, I think that's one of the, the things that when you start to get a little nervous, and yeah, there's just that Just on the line again. there, yep. You start to get a little nervous. You gotta, you gotta start moving your chair more. Kind of pump yourself up. Get your body language more positive, even if you're not feeling it. You gotta find one way or another to to get yourself moving. And and a lot of times that's the problem is when you start to get down. You don't move. You you're less prepared for the shots. You start to miss. That's a nice shot by Lucy. There. Yeah, great finish. She sensed she was in a great position of superiority on the court the net that's Lucy likes the net yep she certainly is pretty comfortable up there and now with a 2-1 lead 
Um, if I, I, you know, I think you know it's been back and forth, back and forth. But I'll tell you, if either one of these players could get some separation, I think that it could really um, we could see some games peeled off quickly. You know, mm -hmm. and before you know it, we could see somebody up four one or or five two or something like that. But uh, in the early going right here, it's Shuker with a slight advantage in the third set. I think if she could possibly muster up a hold here and get to three one, it would put just a tremendous amount of tr pressure on. Capocci going into her service game, uh, knowing that if she doesn't hold, now uh, she's in that big 4-1 hold, 4-1 uh, hole possibly. So a lot at stake here. And we talked uh, a couple weeks ago, we had uh, sports performance expert Alistair McCaw in to speak with some of our athletes. And uh, he talked about uh, the percentages that studies have shown about players and, and when they're playing their A game, their B game, or you know their C game, just to put it into three different categories. And basically... Uh, through some studies, it's it's most players feel like they they have their A game about 10% of the time. That's all that they feel like they have mm -hmm. their A game, and then, and that 70% of the time, B game, and 20% of the time. And there we are on court two. A quick update: It's Joe Girard 6-3 in the first and 5-4 up, but uh, really hotly contested second set by Takashi Sonata. And so we'll continue to give you updates there as that score inches closer to a potential outcome. And it's uh, so back to that that uh, three stages of, of where you're playing in, in your game, A, B, or C game. And I would put both of these players probably in the C category. Mm -hmm. Not not that they're bad players, but I think they would they themselves would say, you know, I'm playing about my C game right mm -hmm. now. But you have to learn to win in all those categories. That's the pro you know, that's what the best of the best do, is they figure out when they don't have their A game, how do I still come through and win? Yeah, and, and I think both of these players too. It shows kind of the grit and mental strength that they've been so close through this match and n not one of them has dropped off even though they may both be having not their best day on the court um, but they're still fighting through through it fighting through each point and trying to work themselves back into it yeah you know we saw a good example yesterday i think in the shingo Guneda and, and stefan olsen uh, match about two guys that were probably performing at, at, at both of them in their A games and, and it was just really a phenomenal match uh, at just an incredibly high level and it was an even match both of them playing in the A category and here it's an even match with both of the girls kind of occupying a little bit more of that C, C game category and uh, nonetheless uh, you put two people in the same category you're probably going to get a, you know, a, a close outcome and that's what we're seeing here but it's Lucy Schuker up 2-1 and serving at 30-15, and again, uh, if she can get this two-game separation, which we haven't seen in, in any portion of the match so far from either player, that would be the first time, and so that would be really, really huge. high topspin serve there yep and it's uh, again it's a it's a forehand essentially through the middle third of the court that's still uh effective for shuker because Kapochi is so far out of position mm -hmm. she just hasn't made any real adjustment over there on the on the ad side uh to be out wider and take that ball a little maybe a little deeper or not get stretched out so much and until lucy would start beating her up the middle uh, i'd want to see her make that adjustment and say all right i'm going to give you that t uh, I guess I haven't seen you hit it yet. You've been you've been burning me out wide, uh, and so until you can prove otherwise, I'm gonna maybe take that away from you. But that's that's an adjustment Capocci has not yet made. Lucy looking to serve this game out here. Second serve. And it's the curse of the serve that continues. It's it like a it's like a bad uh, thriller or like a bad bad movie. The curse of the serve. <laughs> I could see that being a thing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's a 
horror movie is what it is. <laughs> it's a horror for both of these players right now. But Sugar with another opportunity, still at 40-30 to somehow hold serve. I think that's another another missed opportunity there. That's that's a tough one. Nightmare tough on one. Serve Street. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Okay. Shoot. Freddy Krueger. <laughs> I feel like I've experienced that a time or two myself. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody who's played the sport of tennis has experienced that. Yeah, it's just one of those things. And mm -hmm. It just doesn't feel good when it when it comes. And it's both of these ladies that are struggling with it right now. It's like an infectious disease. It, it's kind of just like a, it's a, it's like a tension in this match where it's just neither one of them. Is, is really confident mm -hmm. um, and it's just it's going to take something for maybe one of them to break through and bust open and just allow themselves to play some decent tennis but right now it's a struggle for both of them a nice return yeah and Going again look at look at, look at both of them now that that's a that's a return a serve winner mm -hmm. and yet look at the body language um, yeah. you just, you even you know because it's been such a fight that even one good shot there and that's where you've got to be able to mm -hmm. take every little bit that you can either one of them's I mean it's been it's been such a fight such an uphill battle for both of them yeah you can just tell they're neither of them are really feeling it right now it goes from return to serve winner to return to serve on forced error to double fault to missed opportunities and uh you know, I'm, I'm wishing good on both of these players because I know how good they can be when they're on their games, mm -hmm. and uh, both of them are just struggling right now. Uh, Lucy going to the loop. It's worked well for her. Typically, advantage Shuker in this kind of rally. Uh, you're right. And once again, yep. And in that exchange that we've seen a number of so far today, it's it's come up Shuker almost every time. And uh, with that, it's the 3-1 lead in the third, the first time we've had any separation, really, between these two players in three sets. And so with new balls coming into play, maybe that'll put some life into Julia Capocci's game, give her a little bit uh, of energy to feed off of what I don't know. Uh, she's it's not looking too confident. She's got to get through this, this service game if she's going to have a chance to, to stay in this, in this set. I think we're in a tie break set. Speaking of staying in sets, I think we're in a tie break scenario over in the second set on court two between Joe Girard and Takashi Sonata. So that, that continues to be an intense match over there. And you are going to see some frustration from Julia Capocci here eventually because she's been trying to keep it in all day here as she's struggled with her game. But eventually that's going to have to come out. And there it is. There's your second set tiebreaker situation between Joachim Girard and Takashi Sonata. Girard having won the first set. So we'll keep you updated on that score over there on court two as we continue to watch this match on center court. Julia Capocci serving. See, what would we normally see from Julia after a shot like that, Mac? Usually a fist pump. Usually a fist pump, but now we're not seeing that. So mm -hmm. she's she's kind of gotten herself out of that rhythm, out of that habit, out of that positive reinforcement. And that's the exact thing that she needs right now. You mm -hmm. know, and uh, we had Cece Bellis uh, here on the on the broadcast a couple times here recently, and she used the term fake it till you make it, right? Yep. Which, is a, which is a common term. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's just the process you've got to go through when you're struggling. And, um, yeah. And she is struggling right now. She is. She's really showing some emotion. Yep. And some you, negative emotion. You have to. You have to desperately look for every positive and try to build off that. It's like one brick at a time, and, mm -hmm. and, and the bricks are few and far between. But that's the only thing you have to build with. 
that, so you better start laying some brick. And there's the nice. Yep, yep, yep. She kind of let the arm just relax enough on that one. Lucy wishes it was a clay court tournament so that you go circle the mark. Come up in question. Yeah, and you know, some players, that's that's kind of the turning point for them when they just get so beyond frustrated, they just start striking the ball mm -hmm. and hitting loosely, which is what they wanted to do all along, but they just were too nervous or too tight to do it. And once you feel like, well, I have nothing to lose, that's when some players can really start um, letting it rip and mm -hmm. playing their game. Yep. Oh, there's the, there's the classic exchange that continues to favor Shuker, and now it's Capocci arguing the call. She got the last one on the ace up the tee, but dissatisfied with this uh, baseline call. And sometimes when you're frustrated, you just, you just want things to go your way. Like that Lucy is taping something up here. Maybe something on her chair. You know, if I was Capoche, I'd be hitting practice serves right now. <laughs> <laughs> Take every chance you can get. My goodness, yeah. If I get yeah, if you had a chance to hit like six serves real quick, just mm -hmm. to kind of maybe find a rhythm. But uh no such luck, and it's Lucy Shuker with a break opportunity to go up 4-1. Nice. Starting to see a couple of swings. She mm -hmm. served a few balls better. She had the ace. Uh, that was a little bit better swing there. That forehand looked better. Uh, maybe she's going to be able to fight her way out of this, uh, but it's going to take a committed effort, and again, I think she's going to need some of that own internal positive reinforcement. gritting her teeth and she knows she coming real good there yeah yeah no she knows that was a good opportunity and a ball that she will handle regularly pretty well so now from a possible break to a possible hold you can tell julie's striking her serve a little bit more. she she's swinging it out to her credit she is swinging it better you know doesn't have command of it Quick shift to court two with Takashi Sonata serving to Joachim Girard in a second set tiebreaker. Uh, Sonata looking to force a third set against Girard. And it's Joe that's uh, looking to close this thing out in straights. And right now it's five all in the tiebreaker. So we're really getting down to crunch time there on court number two. Well, we go, yep, we're at five all in the tiebreaker here with Takashi Sonata serving. Great return. And it's the backhand in the net that gives Joe Girard a 6-5 tiebreaker lead and one match point. And with a serve like Joe's, it might be only one shot that he needs to close out this match in straight sets and instead of allowing Sonata to force a third. Oh, it's a overhead let cord winner for Capocci on center court. We'll watch action here on court number two. And we're tied at six all in the tiebreaker now. Between Joe Girard just crossing over the net, Takashi Sonata as they change sides with Girard having one more point to serve to stay ahead in this tiebreaker. Well, Joe 
Nashville is known for having one of the biggest serves on tour. Nope. Isn't that right? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. And it's quick update on center court. It's Capocci with a critical hold to get a second game in the set. Shuker 3-2, but right now it's 7-6. Takashi Sonata now with a match point. Uh, correction, a set point and a chance to force the third set here in this men's round robin match. So out of the number nine seed in the world or number nine ranked player in the world up against Joe Girard from Belgium. And it's gonna be a second serve that Girard gets a chance to look at here to tie things up at seven all. And with that double fault, it's seven all. And uh, an opportunity missed there by Takashi Sonata, and he knows it. exclamation from Joe Girard. He thought he had that point locked up with a big forehand in the corner, but it's Sonata's defensive skills that gets it back in play and forces the big Belgian out of position and now into a position where he's got another set point. Takashi Sonata on the far end receiving serve from Joe Girard, serving at 7-8. Gerard with the answer to force eight all in the tiebreaker. A racket was thrown there. Well, he, he, he lurched ahead to kind of try to get that ball and just everything kind of came undone mm -hmm. there as he kind of ran into the back fence. points a piece in the tiebreaker here on court number two between Joe Girard and Takashi Sonata. And it's Girard serving at eight all. That's like a replay of a two points ago. It's a that. tough, tough backhand to get when mm -hmm. you're pushing backwards. Yep, I think. And another set point for Sonata in this tiebreaker, second set tiebreaker. Nice. And there it is. And there's a frustrated Joe Girard as we go to three sets on court number two. Great battle by Takashi Sonata to get himself uh, back in this match, and force a third set. We're seeing a lot of that today. And now we're back on center court with Lucy Schuker serving to Julia Capocci. With Schuker up three games to two, but uh, Capocci having the slight edge in this game at 15-30. Uh, Another double fault. I'm, 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 this, I'm running out of uh, I'm running out serves. of horror movies to quote here, <laughs> Mackenzie. I mean, it just continues to be. It's, it's all about that serve. Yeah. 1540. Uh, yeah, I mean, just a couple minutes ago with Shuker that was maybe with a two-game lead, uh, mm -hmm. gonna inch or inch closer towards taking charge of this set, and now just like that, it's. It's Capocci that might come back to get it to three all, which is certainly someplace we've been before in this in this match. And there it is. Oh, I think it was a let. Okay. Second serve then, mm. or first? Uh, I think it looks probably a first. First serve. He 
just kind of you can just kind of feel the the anxiety uh, yeah. for but you know it's I'm, I'm anxious for both of these players just kind of watching them struggle uh, knowing how difficult it is to to claw your way out of a, mm -hmm. uh, a negative mindset when you're when you're struggling with your game but uh you know it's even footing i mean they're both they're mm -hmm. both in the same boat and they're both they paddling <laughs> like like you know what to get to shore <laughs> Somebody's going to make it. Yeah, I think Somebody. so. Well, you're right. Somebody is going to make it. It's uh, whoever gets their oars in the water quicker. <laughs> it's Capocci right now with the opportunity. It's one of the best swings we've seen from her. She's looking a little bit more confident to me just in the way that she's kind of sitting up and mm -hmm. pushing around, keeping her head up. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, and, and you know what? It's, it's only because that... Lucy's uh, struggles herself that I think that that's allowed Capoce to get to that place. If Lucy was playing even reasonably well over there, I think she could have put uh, Capoce in a massive hole, but they've kind of both let each other hang out here in this third set. Nice deep return. Had Julia backing up. Mm -hmm. That's what she wants. Oh, you can see that, that, that look on the face there again as we as we read body language typically and it's a it's a key indicator of how your opponent's going uh, it's uh, fairly negative on Capoce's part right now everything feels uncomfortable uh, the timing's off with everything mechanics start to break down a little bit you don't trust things mm -hmm. Great return. Mm -hmm. Again, that second serve. She's just trying to get that get that in, and that's dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you leave it, uh, you know, she's kind of just rolling that thing about halfway into the service box, and so by the time that hits and kicks, it, it, it's sitting right in the strike zone, mm -hmm. and so it really should make uh, for some easy opportunities for Lucy here. That's a more aggressive that's swing right serve. there. And that's see that. Serve. And that and that's the serve that I think that she should just be hitting mm -hmm. right there. That was not an overly overwhelmingly big second serve or first serve, but uh, the one that she should just be hitting repeatedly uh, in an attempt to get that to become her kind of go-to serve. Now, thirty all. Oh, out of reach by Shuker. And so it's 40-30 with a chance for Capoce now to hold serve, which has certainly been a rarity of late. And I think would be... Uh, I think it would be welcomed at this point. Oh, my goodness, wouldn't it be? <laughs> yeah. And, and just a, a tremendous, almost like a relief, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's sad to say that just holding serve is a relief. You know, not <laughs> anything that pumps you up. It's just like, oh, my gosh, I did it. Yeah. The small victories that get you through. Yeah, it is. There it is. It was a big first serve. Good response. Uh, a couple of aggressive swings there, which is what. Mm -hmm. Definitely the exchanges that Julia wants to get into. And, uh, Lucy letting out a little aggression there on the change over. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. You know what? And sometimes you do. Sometimes yeah. you gotta get it out. And if you can do that without it costing you, say, a, a point penalty or a warning or anything mm -hmm. like that, um, yeah, better to as Shrek would say, better out than in. You remember that line? Yes. You do? You yes. you gotta be a Shrek fan. I did watch it when I was younger. Well yeah. Okay. And uh nice shot of Marilyn Baus getting ready to take off and possibly prepare for for a match that she's getting ready to play. But uh, we're in a third set over on court two, just like we are here on center court. It's Joe Girard with the early one game to love lead uh, in the third set. On um, court number two, Joe versus Takashi Sonata of Japan. Sonata having pulled out the second set tiebreaker nine to seven. All right, I think it might've been 10, eight. They got to 8-all, so I think it was 10-8 in that tiebreaker. And right now, it is 4-3 Julia Capocci over Lucy Shuker in this third set, uh, which has been an incredibly 
tense match between these two players, both struggling to, to find their own games. And it's Lucy's, Lucy's chance to see if she can find a service game that suits her. Pretty, pretty good serve there, but Julie ah, just came up with the... There's the first fist pump we've seen in about a set and a half, yeah. I think. So it could be... feel the momentum shifting could be, a little bit. Could be Julia coming out of her funk, right? Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. She's had a couple of good swings on the serve last game. Big hold. Now it's up to Lucy to answer. Lucy right back on the game plan, mm -hmm. uh, having the wherewithal to stick to that, give her credit. So it's 15 all. So many Stay options enough, there, and she just went right back into that forehand of Shukers, which I think was a little bit of a gift. I uh, had command of that point and uh, lost it, and she knows it. So it's 30-15 for Shuker, and it's one all over on court number two between Gerard and Sonata. One all in the third set, but here on center court, it's four games to three. Kapochi over Shuker so far. There we go, another fist pump. Andiamo on a fist pump <laughs> from Giuliana Capocci with an overhead winner. Flattens it out, goes cross court to get it back to 30 all. First time we've seen her employ that shot so far today. It's something that maybe she'll look to, to do a little bit more down the stretch here. In this match, at least in the third set, it's felt like whenever you you think one of the players is going to start pulling away, the other one kind of works their way back in and yep. it tightens up a little bit and then they're just right back in the match. Yep, and now here it is with Capocci with an opportunity to go to a two-game lead uh, for the first time, I think, for her in this mm -hmm. match. It was Shuker with an early 3-1 lead in this set, but Capocci fighting through her demons, and getting to a 4-3 lead with a chance to go 5-3 and possibly serve it out back to the game plan. Just short. The drop shot that's been so reliable for Lucy all day today just lets her down there in that yeah. critical uh, point there. And it's Capocci 5-3. And she certainly has looked a little stronger uh, on each of her last service games. Mm -hmm. Not that it's uh, been with complete ease that she's been able to hold, but certainly the indicators are that she's had some better swings. We'll see if that continues. Yeah, definitely feels like she's going after her shots a little bit more. Yeah, kind of. Uh, the tension may have broken for her a little bit, and so we'll see here. She's kind of pushing up, as you, you as you said, her body language is better. She's sitting up a little taller, looking a little bit, projecting a little bit more confidence. That ball's out, but that's a that's a that's a good swing right there. Um, but now, just as quickly as you feel like you're onto something, she's got to hit a second serve and. If she gets off to a tough start in this one, could be a difficult service game. Just in, good depth. Yep, yep, yep. Great deep shot there. Yep, yep, she was able to get that second serve rolled in there a little mm -hmm. deeper than some of the other ones where she's left them short, and that uh, didn't allow Shukri to get on the offensive quite as much. Gave Julia a chance to tee up that forehand, which she loves to do so much. Spank that winner past Lucy. First serve there. Desperately, uh, you know, both players would be looking for easy points like that. That's a first serve in by Julia. Turk. Doing a nice job there. And uh, no response 
from Lucy, 30 love. Definitely feeling more comfortable in these last few points. Oof. It's just long. Yeah, it's something that Lucy hasn't missed all day today. She's been kind of dictating play in that in that exchange. But here we are with triple match point for Juliana. Julia Capocci against Lucy Schuker serving. Three match points. Back up against the wall, it's Lucy Schuker with a great return of serve on the second serve. Forehand winner down the line. I think Lucy's not quite convinced that she's there yet, but uh, that's a good start to it, Lucy, and so she's going to continue to to fight here. And there it is. There's, there's the, the return of serve error, it's Julia Capocci that... Uh, Indeed does punch her ticket to the semifinals in her first ever NEC Wheelchair Tennis Masters, uh, having come through two close three-set victories, one over Sabine Ellerbrock in the first round and now one over Lucy Schuker in this third round of the uh, round-robin format, having lost only to world number one Dita De Groot. And it's Lucy Schuker who uh, disappointingly goes home uh, without a win here at the NEC Masters. What a battle that was, though. It really was. You know, it was a battle of of who could get their their emotions under control, who could mm -hmm. who could possibly instill any bit of confidence in themselves. And it was that was the battle. You know, it wasn't it wasn't really tactical or anything like that. Um, it just was it was internal battles between both girls individually. Yeah. And you can see Julia oh, as she takes a drink of water there, just all still shaking, kind of from you know all the nerves and the pressure that has been building over the course of the last two hours. And certainly a look at a disappointed Lucy Schuker, who, um, as always, fought and uh, always will, as long as she's uh, competing on this Uniqlo wheelchair tour. That's what you're always going to get from Lucy. So I know she's not happy, but uh, she can always keep her head high for the efforts that she brings to the court. And so we have uh, a break, a little break in the action prior to another match coming up here on center court. I uh, anticipate uh, Gustavo Fernandez versus Stefan Hude here on center court in a, in a short while. And it's uh, Fernandez with two wins and zero losses in pool play so far, and Hude with one win and one loss. So certainly a win by Hude would be critical and uh, would probably secure a position for him. Uh, a lost by Fernandez would st still probably allow him to advance. So it's going to be a, a slugfest from the two strong men, one from Argentina in Fernandez and the other Houdé from France. Uh, although that, uh, that Gerard and uh, Sonata match still going on court two leaves things in play in this, in this B pool of the men's draw. We're going to resume coverage uh, momentarily. Uh, as we prepare for this men's match on center court and we'll get you a third set update on court number two as that match continues. Up next, Gustavo Fernandez versus Stefan Houdet.
arrested.
All right, ready for center court action again here in the men's round robin at the NEC Wheelchair Tennis Masters. It's going to be Gustavo Fernandez, the number two seed here in the tournament, number three in the world versus Stefan Houdet of France. And uh, we expect a real slugfest between the two uh, great players. Let's uh, I'll take a quick peek there at Houdet circling around the net post taking up his position on court, and it'll be Fernandez doing the same here in a moment. There's a good shot at Stefan Houdet in his one-of-a-kind, truly unique wheelchair that he's invested heavily in over the years to custom fit his style of play, which is aggressive and upright, and it's Gustavo Fernandez. Prepared to serve, first game of this men's round robin with Fernandez in control of this group and pool play with two wins to zero, and Houdet needing a win to probably advance into the semifinals on Saturday. And the first point of the opening game goes to Gustavo Fernandez. Uh, we watched him last night playing under the lights uh, in a spectacular battle that he ended up victorious in. Some real high quality tennis out of him so far in this tournament. And there's an example of the high quality I'm talking about backhand cross court which uh, was lethal last night in his exchanges with Joe Girard uh, great competitive 6-4 six, 6-4 four, six, four straight set victory by Fernandez but uh, not without a lot of quality tennis from both players Nice passing shot by Houdet there with uh, Fernandez kind of stuck in the net position, having not executed his first attempt to finish that point. It's Fernandez 30-15. Nice execution by both players there with Fernandez coming out the winner of that exchange to take a early 40-15 lead. Nice close and finish by Gustavo Fernandez at the net there to secure the opening game of this men's round robin match between Gustavo Fernandez and Stefan Houdet of France. It's Fernandez in the early one nothing lead. And Houdet soon to be throwing some serves into play. Stefan Houdet to serve. Okay. 
pretty good significant head-to-head -head matchup historically between these two players uh, as Houday leads that head-to-head -head matchup 19 to 16 so 19 wins for Houday 16 for Fernandez but uh, of late in 2018 five matchups between these two guys and it's Fernandez having the advantage in 2018 four wins to one so back and forth battles these two have had and it's been Fernandez mostly of late Boy, boy, <laughs> oh, oh, that's a clap of the hands by Gustavo Fernandez as he slices that ball uh, off the backhand down the line, but it's Houday which comes up with the miraculous forehand winner down the line. Really impressive shot there by Stefan Houday to get it to 15 all. And it's Houday, uh, correction, it's Fernandez who once again finishes at the net. Uh, pattern we're seeing a little bit early here in play so far, having done so a couple times already. Now 30-15, you can see with the short sleeve shirt on, it's the, uh, <laughs> the guns out, sun's out, guns out for Gustavo Fernandez. As he, uh, certainly an impress impressive physique. I should let everybody listening know that we are now joined in welcoming Joe Wallen to the broadcast. She's been with us a couple of nights early to call some of the matches, and we're once again excited to hear her give us some insight into the into the matches. So welcome again, Joe. Thanks. So it's with Fernandez with a couple of break opportunities now to take a two-love lead, and we'll see how he handles these opportunities as Houday gets ready to spin one in here on the deuce side. And with the double fault, it's Gustavo Fernandez taking the two love lead here in the early going of this first set of this final round robin match between these two great players. I've been looking forward to this match as well. Ah. I love, I also love the way that Houday plays and I love kind of seeing how he's so different than the other players as in the way he sits, or I shouldn't say sits, kneels maybe. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Or cycles. Yeah, so I'll see either one. There's lots of different ways, I guess. Yeah. He's sitting on a bike seat. Yeah, always calm, cool, just kind of goes about his business. As we, we talked earlier in one of the broadcasts, uh, he's, no, he's no spring chicken, and that's no knock on him. It's a real credit to how great he's kept himself physically. He's 48 years old, and so and quite an accomplished, quite an accomplished man. Two sets of twins at home and a veterinary degree. I think he brings such a great experience to the game. He's been around for a long time, he said, being a little bit older as well. Maturity when he speaks as well. So some of the stuff that we talked about the other night about him wanting you know, to bring everyone in to play and um, also having the opportunity to play with others as well, I think it's really mature on his side. So I always like talking to him just for his mature views on wheelchair tennis yeah mature unique and, and as we kind of talked out of the box so uh, yeah we need those we need those free thinkers keeps himself to himself doesn't haven't actually seen him around i know he came in late obviously from prague 
last week, uh, what was it, Tuesday night? He came in late, very, mm. very late. His flight got delayed, flew into Miami, four-hour drive. I think got in at like four in the morning on Wednesday and had to play that morning. So probably just catching up on a ton of sleep, but just been really keeping to himself. Haven't seen him around too much. Yeah, he mentioned to me he was definitely a little flat. Uh, he could he could feel it, you know, the impact of the travel and uh, the schedule that he'd been on uh, with the delays and everything like that. So that first round loss that he had, um, you know, was kind of something tough for him. But he might be getting his leg underneath him and um, <laughs> good feeling, one. Yeah, right. And uh, feeling a little bit better. He certainly has the capabilities of. Uh, of taking a game against uh, a game and set and match against Fernandez again, having the head-to-head -head matchup um, advantage over the course of their careers. I think he was the first person that I actually watched play a wheelchair tennis match live in Mission, Mission Viejo in the doubles when I, after I just started, starting July, went out in December to watch that event that our now national manager and head coach ran in Mission Viejo for many years and did a great job. Um, but I remember vividly just sitting on the side and I watched this guy walk out pushing a wheelchair <laughs> and he kind of came on the side and he stood up and I was, I thought he was a coach to start with because, you know, he got a little bit of a limp. I just didn't really know. And then all of a sudden he takes his leg off and gets in the chair and I, it was like my first like reality of wheelchair tennis. And I was like, oh, well, he's going to get in a chair and play. It was, it, he just left his leg sitting on the side. That was the other part, you know, it was just like, oh, okay, that's his leg. I mean, it's not going to run away by itself. <laughs> it certainly <laughs> won't. It certainly will not. I think I just started, I, I think I still have that picture somewhere because I was like, oh. It is a, a sight over yeah. the years. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, and it's there a great it, actually, shot. there it is. There yeah, it is. his leg is right there. <laughs> the leg. The leg. <laughs> so great shot by our camera crew. To pick as, that up. As uh, Stefan departs the bench and heads out to his second service game in the match and an attempt to even things all at two all here. That's like our Connor Strouds as well. I've got a great picture from World Team Cup of that and where he takes off his leg, like, put him on his chair. It's the best picture I think ever. Yeah, that is funny to see Connor's prosthetics sitting there. Minus the man. <laughs> Called in. I think it was in by both yeah. reactions there. I didn't hear an out call, so I'm going to assume so. And it is indeed. And it's uh, Fernandez, who's continued to be on the attack a little bit, gets caught up in a uh, well-executed lob by Houday. Gets him the first point of this fourth game. the court there on that point, covering a lot of ground, Uday mostly on the move, and Fernandez mostly in charge. A little different from last night where we saw Joe Girard playing Fernandez and Joe not really wanting to get into those long rallies. I don't think Stefan really minds getting into so many long rallies. See Uday give Gustavo the thumbs up, and point well played. Continued theme we've had here is the healthy competitive nature of this tour. These guys both compete to win and uh, are intense, but um, you know I think they have a healthy amount of respect for one another. Uh, I really enjoy seeing that. Just long as the wind picks up uh, a tad here. Uh, on center court. It's been pretty consistent today, kind of been blown into the face of the broadcast booth here, so kind of a side win, at least as the flags fly in front of the headquarters of the USTA. Weather's been nice today, though. Ah, perfect day. Yeah, we talked about that this is uh, probably your prototypical late November day in Florida. I know the other night we talked about, um, and I know I'd asked Stefan too whether he 
via some messaging as we were on the commentary about, um, you know, if the Sabines and the Stefans that can actually walk, that have prosthetic, actually play tennis standing up. And I'd never seen this, but yesterday I walked by and Stefan was actually practicing his serve standing up. Um, so that was kind of interesting to see because obviously that's a different angle that he'd be hitting the ball from. Much higher trajectory over the net. Just probably working on the racket speed and the, the racket more than, obviously, more than anything else because obviously the legs are not going to happen. So, Not much traject not much trajectory on this forehand by uh, Fernandez here eventually. We'll see him get this opportunity. Works his way around it. Yeah, lines that one up and drives it home. Great shot by Gustavo, staying nice and calm there, not having to, not rushing. Yeah, I think it was Houdet uh, kind of forcing himself to hit the forehand there, really being aggressive to try to get it, but really drew himself kind of out of position. I think he played a backhand off the shot before. He might have been in a little bit better position on the court, but uh, he's going to go with his weapon, which is walking around and getting that forehand, pushing around to get that forehand as much as possible. And so it's Gustavo Fernandez off to a 3-1 lead and serving. Looking, continuing to look strong. Just when you look at the chair difference too, you know, you can really see the difference. We talked about Gustavo yesterday, last night not having a huge amount of balance and just Stefan being able to be fully functional basically. And you can obviously see that in the chair where Stefan's leaning and really is reaching for balls even when he hits his forehand his whole body kind of goes over to the left and leans um, as opposed to Gustavo having to stay very upright as well but Gustavo still has you know still very very obviously the heavy balls with the amount of spin that he puts on it and Houdet's balls he's still obviously he doesn't mind the higher loopy balls but his are you know not at the same racket speed that Gustavo's are he doesn't mind hanging in there, but it's going to be a little different trajectory and pace of ball. And it just doesn't have the raw physical strength that Gustavo has to generate that pace and racket speed. Fernandez, 30 love. We commented last night on Gustavo's focus, and uh, you know, even in the early going here, uh, no waiver in that. You know, he's got that intensity to him, and, and uh, no sign of him backing off or taking this match for granted or doing anything but looking to lock it down. And I think he's out here to kind of send a message uh, if he could come out of this pool play at 3-0, like he is going to be the guy maybe to beat. Great, he definitely looks really solid right now. Most consistent and aggressive at the same time. Yeah, you know, I happened to run into him late last night in the in the hotel after he got back, and, and just congratulated him on a on a really well played match, and um, and not in a overly cocky or overconfident manner. He said, "Yeah, you know, I'm I'm playing well. You know, I'm feeling good." So uh, you know, you like to hear that from a player that recognizes because a lot of time players are 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 quick to scoff at that and be like, "Oh, yeah, I'm not playing too well. Or, I'm playing all right or whatever." But yep. you know, he didn't hesitate. He's like, "Yeah, you know," and, and again, just comfortably acknowledged yep I'm playing well and uh, that's the way I continue to or anticipate continuing to play see on that last point we saw actually about three or four of those type of points last night right where um, Gustav actually got to that short one and hit that backhand slice short again um, where this time Stefan was really moving forwards and that's an unbelievable backhand <laughs> Yeah, you know, but last night, Joe, we didn't see him move forward too quickly, mm -hmm. and Stefan did, really did move forward quickly. Just puts a lot of pressure on the person actually hitting that. But that backhand again, yep. my gosh. Yep. Uh, and that only comes, yeah, we talked a lot, that only comes from training. I mean, that and that's a shot that in that location on the court, he is confident that he can execute, uh, and he knows that's, that's a good way to win a point by driving one off the sideline. And so uh, him and his coach have spent some some hours on the court, no doubt, maybe with drop feeds or whatever from that location, just repetitive motion, that stroke to that location. His hand seems to be okay today, obviously. Yeah. No, hasn't been, you know, maneuvering it or doing much. Whatever that was, yeah, didn't get any word on that specifically, but it was just a little bit of an irritant to him last night, but uh, today, no indications. If there's any residual, 
And at 4-1 in the first set, I would say not. Good kids day again today. About oh. 200 kids. My kids were there today, so that was that was fun. Did and they have fun? Yeah, they did. They're actually here watching today. Oh, good. They're, um, well, I don't know whether they're watching or not. They're playing in the in the grass behind. You know but what, Joe? That's what son's kids got, should be doing. Son's got a little Uniqlo hat on, and I went cool. and introduced him to everyone, and he hid behind me. And then my daughter's like, oh, hi, it's nice to meet you. And the son's hiding behind my back. I've met your daughter before, I think maybe a little bit more than your son, and, and uh, she's got her mom's personality. Oh, she's she she's out there, and, and she's, uh, she's, a po- she's a poised young lady. Yeah, she's, she's fun. I've always enjoyed encounters with her. She's um, enjoying the Uniqlo outfit because when I had to go to the Uniqlo store to meet with the sponsors, obviously they're a uh, not the main sponsor of this, but she got to do a shopping spree at Uniqlo. So cool. Uniqlo that make, sponsor. That makes her the oh, cool the, kid the, in class. Oh, she is the cool kid. Yeah. Kid. Yeah. Nice serve by Houdé there to force the return to serve error. Ever calm demeanor of Stefan Houdet, down 1 4. Yep, short ball. No hesitation, right to the target. Easy point for a quick 30 love lead. Still with that ball, gave good net clearance though. Didn't, didn't have to go for too much, but just played it really safe. Good net clearance. I like that type of ball. placed backhand topspin backhand by Stefan Hude into the corner for a really strong 40 love lead in this service game maybe a little bit of a confidence builder for him as he maybe goes on a possible run here to string a couple games together hopefully for him to get back in this set took that ball so nicely on the rise there it's a beautiful ball great serve too That's a great play. Set it up by that serve. I mean, Gustavo was hitting that backhand return above his head. Yeah, that's a game uh, at love right there. And, and every one of those points was decisive from every one of the serves to every one of the first balls afterwards. And so, oh, I'm sorry. I thought that was a game, but it's 40 love now. Still on that ball, that short ball put away too. Stefan doesn't go super flat, doesn't go for the lines, just plays it again. A good hold there by Stefan. Just plays it, you know, really, really, to what I'm looking for, a high percentage. Yeah. Doesn't go for lines, doesn't go flat. So, but really, yeah. I, yeah, but no really less still, offensive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I really, I like, I love the way that he actually plays those balls. A lot of people watching can learn a lot from that because they think it's a short ball, right? And mm-hmm. I always say, this may be a question for you, Mr. Walker. Okay. When do you hit a winner? <laughs> you know, when it's past your opponent, but not uh, not by design oftentimes, I think it's just, you know, you hit your target, and it's uh, in, usually in the preparation. That's not the answer you're looking for, Joe. <laughs> it's not the answer I'm looking for. Okay. So I, I literally, it's kind of a trick question, but it's not. A winner is, it, when do you hit a winner? It's when your opponent doesn't get to the ball. Ball bounces twice. So as you, you kind of said it at the beginning, right? You're like... Uh, a lot of times it does. You don't mean to hit it, right? And a lot of times, they people get a short ball and they think, "I got to hit a winner on this." No, you don't have to hit, hit a winner a good on shot. this. You have to just hit your regular shot, and it mm-hmm. may turn into it. You can hit a late ball, and sometimes you you talked about those backhands, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I liken that to uh, again. I'm always uh, I'm not always going to go to the baseball route, Joe. And I know you being a Brit by birth more of a cricket girl probably but I'm a baseball guy and, and they say guys that hit home runs often say that that's a mistake you know they don't go up there intending to hit a home run they go up there intending to square up the ball and hit it hard and uh, maybe sometimes it's more of a miss uh, when they hit a home run than it is what they were intending to do but they'll take it and it's a quick response by Gustavo Fernandez to that easy game by Houdé and it's now Fernandez up 30 love. Great shot. I mean, that ball just pulling Fernandez off the side of the court into the fence. 
what a difference a match makes watching these two guys serve uh, compared to the last match where the two ladies, uh, Julia Capocci and, and Lucy, who both just on this particular day struggled mightily with their serves. And, and both these guys look to have great command of their serves today. You know, I always feel that serve is one of the things that is more controllable. Obviously, it's the, actually the only shot you control in the game of the ten in, in tennis. It's the only one you can actually control. Your choice to hit that ball or not hit it, and how you hit it. So, would you say that there's no excuse to not have pretty good command of your serve? Yeah, I mean, not I, good excuse anyway. Yeah, I mean, I don't think necessarily it, it, it's harder to say that because you go through games where you, you kind of get the gyps, right? Is the oh, gyps, yeah. the yips, yeah, the yips, 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 or gyps? I could say gyps. You, well, maybe you know, again, maybe back to your British roots, but uh, we say yips. Yips, okay, yeah. yips, gyps, something like that. <laughs> um, but you can get that when you're playing, and it you definitely get it on your serve. So you can definitely, you know, have that. So. That's more that's more of the mental side as well coming in. I think the serve is so mental. If you're playing really well, you just have that confidence in your serve. If you're not confident, that's the first thing I think that goes is the serve. Is, is the serve. But yeah, if you're double faulting, you get your butt out on the practice court and start practicing the serve. <laughs> But you know we've seen uh, we've seen both men and women on the ATP and WTA tour uh, at the highest level who struggle with that stuff. So I mean it, it's it's just a uh, unique part of the game where oh. where nobody's necessarily immune to Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Amazing. Good get there, making Gustavo hit one more ball. Yep. Have you ever seen any of the wheelchair players? Let's watch this replay again mm -hmm. here. Great. This is a great get right here. Yeah, just making is. him play one more. Gustavo goes a little bit more off the line, a little lower, hit the tape, mm -hmm. went over. And then that wonderful apology that I love yeah. so much. Have you ever seen the wheel uh, wheelchair player in a match? I've never seen it, but I haven't been around laughing because in the able body, I've only seen it a couple of times where they just can't get their serve in. They're double faulting so much and they go straight under them. I have. Uh, I <laughs> was that you? No, no, no. I've I, I never done that one myself. Uh, <laughs> the serve is one of the shots that I had pretty decent command of in my playing days, um, and so uh, I had other issues to deal with. But it was uh, serve was not one of them typically. But uh, I played. I can think of a good friend of mine, Mike Haynes, who is uh, a great guy. He lives in Texas. He was a great player back in the day. Uh, we interviewed Rick Draney earlier today, and, and Mike was a player back in those early days, one of the early pioneers. We were playing in a match years ago in Baton Rouge where he just, uh, as a doubles partner, he couldn't get his serve in to save his life. And so in doubles especially, you know, you have a little bit more luxury to say, all right, I got some help here. I'll just I'll just toss this thing in. And he did. And uh, we, we were laughing while we were playing, but it, it got the job done. I was gonna say, sometimes when you throw in that underhand serve, it throws your, apart your opponent for an absolute loop. They think, I'm just going to take that fuzzy yellow ball and hit the absolute just kill it right yeah. and it goes into the bottom of the net or in the backdrop and you just kind of have to laugh almost at that. apologize and yeah it's like sorry sorry but but then you do it again yeah, yeah <laughs> you yeah. just want the point go if for it be. well it's stefan huday who's serving now at two five uh he had a great service game the last time but it might be a little too little too late as uh, Fernandez has roared out to a 5-2 lead here in the opening set. Uh, both really playing pretty well, but it's Gustavo who has continued to be just a little bit stronger. A little too much there. A uh, shot he'd like to have another crack at, but missed it. That's where Huday just getting one more ball back, that one more ball. Gustavo shaking his head, no one should be 15 all right now.
Wow. It's an unbelievable get there from Gustavo, and they pushed it a little bit deep, but really great hustle even yep. to get that. Continued uh, display of effort that is always apparent with him on every point. Uday, 40-15, to force Fernandez to serve it out. That's a good return. Oof. Flatten that one out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, but look at the angle here. Look at that ball yeah. traveling back in. Pretty high percentage, actually. He, and, uh, the other thing that it, I think I heard Jason Allen and you guys talking about it the other day is that, you know, most of the balls, if if there's an equivalent, which I'm, I'm not necessarily agreeing there is, could get finish this point. Ooh, miss uh -huh. it there. There's an equivalent of open stance, close stance mm -hmm. in wheelchair tennis. I would just say it's the the way the hips are when it hits the ball, right? When yep. you hit the ball. Um, Gustavo actually hits a lot of really closed. That last forehand winner down the line that he did on this side on this return was fully closed. And he actually does quite a few of those. He actually It's almost like he turns really closed on it. Well, you know, I mean, playing styles, again, we talked uh, a little bit about parameters and that stands for him yes. and, and would be within and so it's just his style that he's yep. adapted and uh, understands full well what works for him and so I go again with the simple phrase if it ain't broke don't fix it for Gustavo Fernandez it certainly isn't broken see the arch on the oh, yeah. back there see he took the pace off he took the pace off of that a little yeah, bit and spun it up yes yeah. cranked the spin yep. his chair didn't lift off the ground there mm-hmm yeah, wasn't going for the power, it was going yep. for the maximum spin there. So Houday does indeed hold to force Fernandez into a possible serve out opportunity here in the first set. So far it's been Fernandez who hasn't struggled on his serve. He's been pretty, pretty steady. Once again, there's a great example of the length on the stroke. We talked about that last night with Joe Girard, uh, having exhi exhibited a couple of great backhands, but it was Gustavo on that one. And here you're going to get a good look at it, Joe. There's the forehand, but now watch this extension on this backhand here. Wow. And that strength to go so far back. I felt like I had a grunt with him there. I, just, <laughs> I did. It was like a sympathetic grunt It was a right grunt. There. Yeah. I knew it was coming. That was actually a good ISO as well of his mm -hmm. um, of the close dance forehand that we're talking about a little bit. <laughs> that was fully closed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like closed door closed. Oh wow! Like, oh. oh, just misses out wide. You know, it's it's amazing how often we see points where players are off the the screen, and you think, oh, there's there's no way this must be over. Uh, you'd almost seldom see that in an able-bodied match, off the screen like that. But uh, these guys with the two bounces and, and their ability to stay on the wheels will oftentimes be out of the screen, but still in the point. And uh, Gustavo just missing a high risk shot down the line there, which would have been highlight reel. Like his backhand. Jelly Baby won last night. <laughs> yeah. You got the, the, you know, he's got to hit a better shot than that tonight. Uh, I'll tell you what, if he does, I'm not, I'm not saying he won't or can't, <laughs> but uh, it'll be tough to repeat something like that. That slice just wasn't, didn't quite have enough on it, not enough depth or angle. And it's Fernandez continuing to look confident and strong on his serve at 30-15 with a chance to hold and take the first set here. Forty fifteen, two cracks for Gustavo Fernandez to close out this opening set in this last of round robin matches in the men's draw on this side of the draw. Stefan just stays calm though. He's just going to keep at it and keep grinding and 
you know, that's fine. He's okay with that. If, you know, if Gustavo ha- comes up with better goods, he's okay with that. Yep. well-played point by Gustavo Fernandez to close out that first set. Gustavo's going to be happy with that set. Yeah, pretty clean. Again, very, very low unforced errors. And Stefan's not going to... Yeah, a few more miss hits and, and stuff, but they didn't play poorly. I mean, it was just um, it was just a higher quality and a higher level of play, kind of like what we saw last night. Good Back luck here on this serve, looking real deep there. Fernandez occupying the baseline position. Yep. Recovers a little bit there. But now looking to reestablish himself. This was an That's interesting exchange where Houdet yeah. continues to go with this yep. backhand slice. Again, that reach of Houdet is really good. I thought he had him there. Oh, that's nope. a good... Great anticipation. Again, look, just a second slower again to do yeah, it. But look how he's even ready at the end, even yeah, if, uh, just, if that one didn't work. Just watch Gustavo here. Are you going to start grunting, though? Come on. <laughs> that's really closed again, obviously, that stance there. Look at the eyes. Look at the breathing. Yeah. All the factors that go into success. Recognition. Being share control. To, yeah, being able to stop so quickly, too, right? Now on the attack. It's the overhead, lines it, adjusts, cranks it, not in good position. Oh, oh, cover there, not done yet, done. That's, Fist pump. That's great right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great work by our production crew to give us all those looks there at that closing point, which was had so many different dynamics to it. Really fun to break that down on the run there. So really it's good. one set to love for Gustavo Fernandez. Really on that ISOs too that you saw how great he was at control his recovery step right and obviously in wheelchair tennis there's no recovery step but there is with your non-dominant hand really pulling back on it being able to stop himself to be able to balance to be able to hit that ball it's just that was really really good close-ups there all right Houday with a chance to open up and maybe get a lead here see whether Houday changes his game plan in the second set That's a good shot. Good, great hands there. I mean, he got jammed there and still was able to do a great shot. Number one double player in the world, currently ranked, Stefan Hude. The other thing that Stefan's really good at doing, which I'm not seeing the as much variety from the guys as I do from Stefan, is his serve. You know, he's able, like that, on the do side there, he was able to slice it. This side, he really, he's gonna, he's kicking it right there. So, really has really good variety with his serve and his spins. He, he doesn't obviously. Um, there's that replay of that ace up the tee. Really good spin, kicking it. He doesn't really flatten it very much, but really uses his spin as well. Yep. Well, he's on. And again, there. He's on target now. Yep. With the serve. I was say, I think that if my advice would be in the second set, hey, you, you actually didn't play a bad first set, obviously, but you've just got to be a little bit more aggressive. You've got to get some free points in there. And so far in the service game, that's actually what he's done. He's looked good on his service games. It was an early, early deficit that he got into in the first set there. I think uh, he had won a little bit, uh, a little bit loose. But uh, other than that, the last couple service games, he tightened up pretty well there. He's looked pretty good on his 
kind of service. He's out to a 40 love. He'd love to open up with a one game to love lead here. A little bit more aggressive. And there it is. Yep. Hold at love. Certainly bolsters the confidence on the change here and the quick changeover. No break, but one love changeover. But it's still Gustavo Fernandez in control with a set in his pocket. Uh, and uh, no indications that he's backing off his game anytime soon. Let's see here if he can answer with a hold of his own. If I take an educated guess here, I see that say that Houday is going to be a little bit more aggressive on this return too, this return game. Move in, take the ball a little bit more on the rise, flatten, flatten out his returns just a little bit. Unbelievable point. Wow. Great gets by both guys. And it's uh, the blue collar approach by Fernandez. This one here. I mean, the, the, the next ball is let court here. Good job to get up to it. That's actually really, really good. And I thought, there's no way. Yeah, How's he going to yeah. get that? Just flicks his wrist. Unbelievable yeah. point. No apology necessary, Gustavo. That was just a working man's point right there. If I'm right, let's see how good your rules are, Mr. Walker. Oh, okay. If Houday threw his racket at that ball, mm -hmm. if that racket had hit the ball, and the ball had gone over, would it have counted? No. Not with a, not with a, uh, I think, not with a discernible throw. So I believe that the racket has to be connected to your hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, he had one overhead miss earlier in the in the first set, but uh, since then he's tightened that up and, and ever so slightly more conservative while still staying aggressive. And uh, again, we see that continued approach with him looking to press action, get into net and finish. It's been pretty common for him. He's done a great job so far. 30-15, Fernandez. Gustavo controlling the center of the court. Stefan's not going to be able to keep that up side to side to side the way that Gustavo is staying, staying so consistent and so aggressive too. Yeah, you know he's not going to ever back off. So it's not like he's going to lose confidence and start looping balls in. It's just not... Where, that's where I think Stefan needs to be. Yeah, he's going he's gonna to have to attempt to be the guy that's dictating a little bit more and force Gustavo into a little bit more of a chase mode. If Gustavo posts up and uh, gets good first strikes in and, and sets the tone in the points, he's going he's gonna to stay in charge. A tough, tough, tough job for Uday if that's the case. That's an exchange we saw Gustavo win almost every time last night when he got into those back to backhand to backhand exchanges with Joe Girard, and it's a similar situation here tonight. Again, again, just his his chair work and his body work and his balance as well, and his utter strength. Look at that. I mean, that's that one that we saw, right? The balance and that backhand. That's the one where where Houday just hit that nice angle and it, the ball's behind him. At that point, 
he's using he's not using big muscles at that point i mean he's not using the shoulders that's a that's pretty much the flick of the wrist to be able to get that ball down the line I mean, he's using the shoulders on the push, but yeah. on the shot. Yeah, exactly. Yep, he's just throwing yeah. the hand out there and yep. and letting it ride. So that was a that was a great look. How he accelerates on a on a soft drop shot. He's continuing to accelerate the chair while the ball's decelerating and losing losing pace. He's going to catch up to it. Stefan's got seven with new balls. That pickup, yeah. That pickup was really good. Pickup was really close to the chair. I'm not sure Stefan thought that was going over either. No, nope, didn't look like it on the monitor and everything. You could look like he was going to dump that one in the net. Stay alive, 15 all. And there it is, uh, two set, uh, two games to one lead for Gustavo on the changeover, one set to love, and uh, we're seeing some high quality tennis here tonight on center court in this last round robin match of the men's division. Uh, we have one more coming up here tonight. After this match, it'll be Shingo Kunita versus Gordon Reed. And that has uh, a lot of implications on it right there. Both guys are uh, settled in at one win and one loss in their round robin um, matches so far and the winner of that one will certainly be somebody who will likely be crossing over and uh, the loser will likely be heading home if they can get in an early flight out of town and so maybe they'll be booking that to get on vacation a little sooner than later huh joe yeah i think some of the players you know that didn't get through their round robin left today went a little early do you think some of them stopped maybe at disney it's possible, but if they're out of the tournament, uh, you know, it might take something like Disney or Universal or Universal. Harry Potter. Have you, have you been to Universal? I love Universal. Yeah, it's great. Harry and Potter World, Diagon Potter. Alley. That's what a do good you think? one. I love it. You know, a big. I got boys at home. They're big Harry Potter fans, and so uh, yeah. Yeah, some of them. I know Anik today was talking about um, when she actually got hurt. She was. She came out and talked to the kids. She actually had me in tears today. And um, talking to the kids, and she was talking about when she got hurt, and she was 10, and she had some issues with legs. She had surgery, and then they had to take her leg off, like cut it where it's cut. And um, she said that they would, that her parents would take her to Disney World. Well, she said 10 years later, she still hasn't been. So she was like, and I'm really close. <laughs> seems like you're in the neighborhood you know especially like I, I think I talked to uh, somebody earlier today uh, for those that are heading back to some a uh, little more inclement climates why why rush <laughs> you know book the tournament and book a few extra days and stay in town and maybe enjoy a little sunshine and a little Mickey Mouse yeah. nothing wrong with that is uh, is Snuffleupagus is he one of the characters over at, at uh, Disney or is he one of the ones at Universal he's always one of my favorite characters I don't remember. He's a Winnie the Pooh guy, isn't he? Yeah, or is he in Deadpool? No, he's not in Deadpool. <laughs> there is no Snuffleupagus in Deadpool. Okay. And it's Fernandez 30. 30 love here, serving two games to one. It's 
almost as if he just decides I'm going to build the wall, you know, and, and you're just going to have to come through me or over me or, you know, whatever it is. And, uh, and he's just, he, that's what he is. He's a wall over there. He's more like a mountain, but he builds that wall. And then, uh, he just forces players to have to go through him. And, and he's just so physically strong that it's, it's difficult to do. At least that's what we've seen so far in this tournament. Wanted that one. Still two opportunities here for Fernandez to hold serve and extend his lead. Get the first gap in the second set. And there it is. Three games to one for Gustavo Fernandez. This is definitely not the start of the second set that Huday would have liked. No. It's gonna be that's a hard one to come back from. Missile of, of that unforced error there by Gustavo. long good get though really close again fully closed on the stance it's who who continues to do pretty well in his service games he hasn't figured out the Fernandez service games yet it's been the biggest struggle so far Just too much power right there. You know, I saw Gustavo uh, earlier today uh, during lunch, and uh, I think a lot of these guys um, don't just rely on the tournament to provide their nourishment, and a guy like him needs a lot. And so I um, checked him out over at the lunch table. I'm like, hey, what you got going there, Gustavo? And he's like, there's nothing quite like Brussels sprouts. So it was, he was on the vegetables today. Oh, and root vegetables too. Yeah. So uh, Lots and lots of them all cut up. So if you can believe it, it's Brussels sprouts that... Uh, Gustavo Fernandez is using to fuel his fire, among other things, I'm sure. But it's Stefan Houdet with a 40-15 leave here on his service game as he attempts to keep this set in Close reaching order here for himself to maybe just hang around long enough to get Gustavo off track. He hasn't had much chance off of Fernandez's serves either, though. No, no, he's been rock solid on the, on the serves. Oh, that's the second time he's hit that backhand return a serve winner right there.
That's a great oh. serve. Love the way that he has great variety with his serve. And a nice hold by Stefan Houdet as we go to the break. It's 3-2. And uh, this set still in play. It's one set to love Gustavo Fernandez. That's a good picture right there with the leg. Yeah. Because his leg's behind it. Both of them. Both of his legs right there. Mm -hmm. It's just so obscure to see that leg just standing there. Just <laughs> kind of like, ah, oh, where's the person behind it? So let's go back to food for a minute, Paul, as we're you talking. A, are you a foodie, Joe? Uh, you can probably tell by the size of me I'm a foodie, yeah. No. What's your favorite chocolate uh, bar? It's sporadic. Uh, there's several mm, that's a good question. Uh, I am, um, you know, I'm a Twix guy. I like Twix. Really? Mm -hmm. You? The double? Oh, it's crunchies. And, I mean, anyone goes near my crunchies, it's hands off my crunchies. Oh, you mean Nestle Crunch? No, a crunchy bar. There is such a thing yeah. as a crunchy it's bar? An, it's an English term. Oh, see, there you go. It's an English It's an English term. I shouldn't say term. It's an English, English. chocolate. It has honeycomb in the middle. So, ah, that yeah. sounds good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If I grew up over there, that might have been my favorite. All right, we're going to take a quick peek here at Stefan Houdet's serve. Look at the arch. Look at the chair. Pulling up. That's that's just, it's so classical, like too. Carved right? that, that Yeah. So classical. And the way he's able to push, look at his body there as he mm -hmm. throws that. Yeah. So leaning forward. Leans forward, drives yeah. down on the wheels. Yeah. Good serve by Fernandez there. Hude was a good serve, but it wasn't fantastic. I think Hude wishes he'd had that one back. In the chaser be chase mode, it's Fernandez who is continuing to be the one that's chased. So as long as he can keep the steady pressure on, it's going to be up to Hude to answer and maybe take it up a notch or two. He's just got to do more with that short ball yeah, put away. Yeah, yeah he, does. he just he just did not do enough there. Yeah, not near aggressive enough. No. In a in a position where he should recognize uh, that he's got to do more with that. Especially at this score when he's a set and you know three two down and mm -hmm. Fernandez has been so solid on his serves. Yep. Any mid range balls he's got to get after a little bit more. Yeah. Just wide. I just want to, I just want to be able to see another Fernandez or Hude shot again. That, that Geronimo moment. Yeah, with with a little bit of a punctuation and yeah. a fist pump yeah, and a, a that's exclamation. A, wow, Geronimo, just a, just that's it's just got to be like that. Is that something? It's your jelly you, baby. You, is that your something jelly baby thing? That you yeah. yelled as a as a young Br British champion. Yeah, no, I didn't, but I really do like that. It's something that uh, we used to yell when we would uh, jump out of airplanes and helicopters back in the day. And now it's Hude with uh, another break chance here at 30-40. Just look at a possible chink in the Fernandez serve service game. Uday stepped up and been a little bit more aggressive. Oh, the ball drops well inside the service line. And it's three games all as Stefan Houdet takes a big breath. And guess what game it is, Mr. Walker? 
I don't have to guess, Joe. I can look at you the scoreboard and tell. Really? Yeah, okay. I can do it. It's game think, number seven. Yeah, that was a great point. Yeah, it was. Good good fight for Stefan. See, just now this is the ball there. that I thought uh, Gustavo could have done yep. a little bit more with, but Absolutely. great depth by Uday. But I mean, what, what a shot from way back there mm -hmm. to be able to get that angle. Yeah. Three all in the second set. As uh, again, we're approaching sunset here. It looks like it's pretty much down in the background. Getting a little color out of the clouds. It's been a great day here. Very comfortable. I think very, very good conditions for the players. It's supposed to be a little warmer tomorrow, but with some chance of. Don't say it. Don't okay. say okay. it. Okay, I didn't say it. You're the tournament director. You should know better. I was going to say snow. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's, I think our it's chances snow. are safe that that's not going to be the case. Uday empl employing that slice serve there, trying to get into the body of Ooh. Fernandez. That's a great Ooh. shot. I mean, that's so much From spin here. on that ball that just made it drop. It looked like it was going way it out. It did. It did. I think Fernandez kind of did think it was going that way as well. Uday kind of finding the range right now. He's really had some good service games. Seems to be kind of fine in his rhythm. Could get interesting here if Uday holds. Yeah, it would be the first time that he's kind of had a lead in a critical part of the set. There's the slice pulling Gustavo and lengthening him out. That's a mm. great angle again. And again, he takes up pos a position there and gets there so early and sets up. And uh, much like an able-bodied player, the, the quicker you can prep and get there, the more time you've got to make some decisions. And he's got options there. He sets up, and he knows if he sees Uday give up space one way or the other, he can go cross or line, and really a nice luxury to have. It's a great shot of the sky. Oh, Cotton. he knew to. Just out, Gustavo. Ooh, and mm. I think... That it, it, Steph, uh, Gustavo knew that was coming, so the positioning of Huday's serve, obviously. Zone position moved off to the right. You know who the other dark horse is on the other group? Mr. Olsen. I, you know, at this point, I'm not, I'm not even calling him a dark horse. No. I mean, I, I, I would have a hard time having watched uh, his two matches here. Um, there's nothing dark about him. He is in the light right now, and, and he's playing just really great tennis. And we talked to him in an interview yesterday, and he's just very composed. He's just very comfortable with where he's at, uh, not only in his game of tennis, but in his, in his life. So I think that's what's translating really well to him. He's up a, up a set and full one against Nico Piper. Wow. Date for court two there. And in this service game, it's Houdet with a chance to hold here. Again, as we talked, getting a little bit deeper into this set. Critical game number seven. If he holds here for a 4-3 lead. It'll be the first time that Gustavo has been really chasing uh, at a critical part of the match. Mm. There's a freebie. It's one of the first ones we've seen today. We haven't seen many blips on the radar by these two. Yeah, I've been I've been just really impressed with um, with Stefan who uh, Stefan Olson. Um, I'm impressed with Stefan Houdet, but but more so with Stefan Olson and what he's accomplished so far in this tournament in the early rounds. So we'll we'll continue to see how that plays out. It's a good return there. If you could see that in slow motion again, or another replay there, but if you if you could see it, you'd see Stefan actually come up off his chair for a second. It was almost like slow motion where he was up off his chair, so didn't quite get to recover quick enough either. Yep. Ah, just too much. Just like that, uh, Hude goes from a chance to hold. And keep uh, and get a lead. It's Fernandez that stays on the gas and changes over at four three in a setup. You know you've got a good saying. If it 
What is it? What do you say? If it ain't broken, don't fix it. Yeah, you don't want to let Jimmy fix it. You don't it. want to let Jim fix it. Yeah, you don't want to let Jim fix it. You're it's right. a great saying, right? Yeah. But no, Huday broke. really, really needs to, you know, get with this now. He really needs to be positive and really step up at this point. Yeah, we're going to see a, a pretty typical um, demeanor from him, obviously. Uh, we don't ever see much of a change one way or another. As we get a great evening shot of the tennis center, it looks like a good bit of activity here and there. Uh, and you mentioned, I think, tomorrow there's uh, 500 people coming in to participate in a tournament uh, yeah. over on the clay court yeah. side. Florida sectional, new screen you're seeing to the right, mm -hmm. where all the clay courts, the campus is divided, I say, by the middle of that tournament admin building where it said welcome players. Um, the left side of that is all the, are all the hard courts. And the family zone, the Morris family zone that you can see immediately behind this court on the left. And then to the right are 32 hard true. Mm -hmm. Well, it'll be good to have the, the 500 participants of the tournament uh, milling around the campus. I'm sure uh, maybe they know or maybe they don't that this tournament's going on. And I think that they'll be amazed to come by and, and do some spectating and watch the best players in the world compete for this end of year title. As it's Fernandez who continues to be relentless on his serve. Pours another one into the tee to take a 15-love lead here, serving at 4-3. That's where most players just come out of their chairs with that much of a commitment forward. Stefan, Stefan was calling that ball out. He yeah. self-called it out. But, uh, I don't think that's the call he's going to get. Yep. Umpire confirms. Not out. Stefan's shaking his head in disbelief. I think he hit his head there. He did. He's trying to shake it off. He's getting a little frustrated. He knows. I mean, obviously, he knows this puts him through or doesn't put him through. Mm -hmm. Had, he and I talked a little bit too, and he said, "If I can I think, if I can beat Gustavo, then I think I've, I'll be able to win on you know percentage of sets and game or games." So he knows how important this win is, and Gustavo's not letting up. No, no, it's just not. Even again. though he's through, he's not gonna. It's not how he's wired. Yeah. Yeah, I think again, I think he's wanting to place a stamp on this round robin portion and, and let people know they don't want to mess with me. And. uh at 40 love here in the service game with a chance to go up 5-3. Uh, up until now, nobody has messed with him. And there's that look that uh, we've come to recognize. Complete focus and determination. Good return by Stefan there, just keeping the pressure on because he knows. I mean, the best players in the world know it doesn't matter if you're set 4 3, 40 love down, right? If you can just keep the pressure on, you never know what just what can change. Yeah, that's I mean, that's not much of a deficit right there. I mean, at least in this set, I mean, he's down the first set, but in this one, very much alive, a couple of points away from Deuce and, and maybe having a chance to get it to four all, but uh, a lot of work to do. There's two quick points yeah. for him, and uh, just like that, the 40-love lead. You know, talked to Mackenzie Solden earlier today about how quickly the 40-love leads disappear sometimes when you think, oh, it's a lock. And uh, here we are in another example of how quickly it goes from 40-love to 40-30, and maybe the pressure shifts over to Fernandez. Linesman's going to lose that battle. 
Yeah. <laughs> he, and he tried to get out of the way, yeah, too. Yeah, I mean, he yeah. really did. I know yeah. that players appreciate when they mm-hmm. try and get out of the way there, but um, Gustavo like, wasn't going to get that anyway. I'm all right. He gives the umpire a nod. He's really, Gustavo, I love the way that he's checking on him, saying, yeah. you okay? Because he, he knows he got him there in some way. Clipped him a little bit. Yeah, somewhere. So Deuce, the 40 love lead, just like that, is gone. so hard to get it back there and just Gustavo just doesn't stop you know mm-hmm. relentless yep could have easily 40 love up there and then got back to deuce you know frustrate some players and people yep never even gave it a thought I think just back to work yeah low on the toss there left-handed forehand and, and he made in. it in that yes. was amazing that was a uh, another geronimo i mean that was just amazing that's old geronimo ah, yeah, unbelievable there. there's fernandez yep. with the fist pump just amazing and five games to three this. so life of the um commentator for the whole week 11 hours yeah right? yeah so i see you have a ton of food around right i do i'm trying to stay a little so bit so uh, are they your plums and cookies or they are yeah. uh you know what cc was uh kind enough cc bellis who has been in a couple of times with us uh baked uh, baked some cookies that i've been sharing i haven't been hoarding them uh, but the plums are mine that's for sure that's nice and, that's uh, good i know that's an you know much like the brussels sprouts that uh gustavo was eating the plums are a little bit of an oddity for an American, but I like them. And they keep me uh, keep me on task. That's great. But thanks for asking. Yeah, I just got to check on you, make sure you're okay. I am. Because I haven't been bringing you food, so I'm glad someone has. Yeah, but you know what, Joe? I got to tell you, the key on day number one, you brought me the blankets, <laughs> <laughs> which I was really happy to have. And the hand warmers. Yeah, and the hand warmers, right? But we're we're done with that. That's behind us now. Correct. And. Uh, First point of this game is behind us, and Stefan Hude serving. Serving to stay in the match. It's been uh, it's been quality tennis, but it's been just just slightly on the side of Fernandez. Nothing really decisive, but uh, really he has not stayed off the gas, and, then, and now the pressure is gonna start to really mount on this on this service game for Hude. That's a, I mean, the strength that he's got to hit a clean winner from back there. Mm-hmm. Out of sight, but not out of mind. <laughs> not out of the mind of Stefan Hude, anyway. It's Gustavo. You know, he, and I like it that he doesn't get too high, doesn't get too low on uh, the successes or the errors. I mean, he is a passionate player. He's, he plays with some emotion, but it's mostly emotion in check. And, uh, and he just kind of continues to have the the work ethic that, that, that just keeps the relentless approach to the game. Good serve by Houdet there. Gustavo kind of reminding himself how he wants to approach that one the next time he gets it. Kind of sets that plan in his head and says, all right, if I see that one again, I'll know what to do. Update from court number two. Mr. Olsen was with the win there. Mm. I don't know what the final score was, but I see him off behind the court watching. Comfortable, confident, quietly confident. Three 
0 oh, in match play here in the round robin. Very impressive performances by Stefan Olsen of Sweden. Former, former world number one and uh, two-time Wimbledon champion and a two-time NEC wheelchair tennis masters champion. So a guy that's uh, had a long career of, of big wins. Paralympic gold medalist in doubles. So really great resume. Catching Stefan a little bit jammed there. Yeah, a little rush. Yeah, a yeah, little rush. Good return, though. Yeah, You've talked of. about that. You've talked about that strategy a lot, you know, playing at your opponent. Uh, if you can get it deep enough, yeah. And these guys are capable of doing that. And with their power, when that ball gets into them, um, it's, just, it's just not enough response time. And if, even if it does get back, oftentimes it's just blocked short. And then these guys jump on it. There's the slice, just a little long. Slice into the body hard. Fernandez is going to line up an inside out backhand here. Oh. Doesn't need to. Oh, that double no, fault. No, he doesn't. And that double fault, you know. Yeah. yeah. Say it's it. Fernandez match point. Mm -hmm. First one of the night. The other thing that the 3 and 0 in round robin, obviously, it gives is just a huge amount of confidence going in. And it also gives them the one versus two, so probably a little bit of a theoretically. Uh, yeah, theoretically, but at this, but at, but at this, level, at this level, it doesn't. I know. No, the top four that are going to come out of here. It's the more uh, confidence, correct. honestly. Yep, and, and there, there it is. is. Game set and match. He'll be, he'll be singing Hakuna Matata here, as he is now the Lion King going out of this pool. It's how Stefan Olsen. How does that go, Paul? How does that go? You, you don't want me singing that. Uh, Hakuna no. Matata. Yeah, it's the best I that's got. Pretty good. I mean, it, okay, but that's but he all. Is I, like, he is like the Lion King He out is there. the Lion King, He is King, the right? Lion King, he yeah, is. absolutely. So that's Fighting the way he plays. The hear, the, hear the lion roar. Uh, we're not done with coverage here as uh, Gustavo Fernandez dispatches of Stefan Hude, 6-3, 6-3, and what was really a, a good level match, but uh, just too much Gustavo uh, in his relentless attack. So uh, we're going to be coming up with some more match play on center court here. I believe we have what is going to be an incredible match between Shingo Cuneta and Gordon Reed. And that will be our last match of the night. So maybe we'll get out of here before, before 9 or 10 tonight. What do you think, Joe? Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. I'm looking forward to this match again. And as we mentioned, there's Shingo Kunita, number one player in the world, versus former number one and reigning Paralympic champion Gordon Reed as they set to do battle, both having won one match in their round robin format and lost one. So this is uh, pretty much winner goes forward, loser goes home. And so we'll be coming up with that match here shortly on center court. So stay with us for coverage.
Welcome back to our coverage of the NEC Wheelchair Tennis Masters. We're live at center court here. In what is certainly going to be another exciting men's round robin match. Uh, the last match here on center court tonight. As coverage continues, we have a match getting ready to start on court two. Uh, another match going on on a further court off, but uh, this is the one we're focused on right now. It's Gordon Reed on the bottom of your screen from Great Britain against right there Shingo Kunida from Japan, the number one player in the world. Um, but, you know, both of these guys have suffered a loss here in the round robin format, and so they're both coming into this match one win and one loss, and it's pretty much the one that comes out will advance, and the one that doesn't is going home. Uh, so a lot on the line as Shingo's the number one in the world and Gordon's a former number one and defending Paralympic gold medalist. So both of these guys, uh, and it's, it's Shingo who's won two Paralympic gold medals in his career. Uh, Gordon, the most recent at the 2016 Rio Olympics. It's Shingo in 2012 in London and 2008 in Beijing. As we continue to watch these two players warm up, we can give you a little preview of some of the action that we know is going to take place tomorrow uh, on semifinal Saturday. Uh, the early matches, uh, just a quick heads up for everybody. And of course, this information will be available on the ITF website, uh, probably on the USTA wheelchair tennis page uh, and all the NEC wheelchair tennis masters pages that you've been following up until now. But in the quad division, it's going to be Dylan Alcott versus Lucas Satoli in our 11 o'clock match, and uh, it's going to be Andy Lapthorne and Koji Sugino of Japan in the 10 o'clock match. So the first match kicking off tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern time on court two will be Lapthorne versus Sugino with a quick follow-on there on center court at 11 a.m. Eastern time, Dylan Alcott and Lucas Satoli. We do know that not before 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time tomorrow. It's going to be Stefan Olsen versus Joachim Gerard of Belgium in what will certainly be an outstanding men's semifinal. And then Gustavo Fernandez at 1 p.m. on center court will be taking on the winner of this match between Shingo Kunita and Gordon Reed. Likely winner of this match to face Gustavo Fernandez in that semifinal match. Uh, two women that have booked their places into the semifinal are Dita de Groot of the Netherlands, the number one seed and the number one player in the world, and Julia Capocci, who's making her first and uh, debut performance here at the NEC Wheelchair Tennis Masters. And she is in as the number two seed in the other group. And so we are waiting to find out some results of some matches that are ongoing right now to see who their opponents will be. So there's still a lot at stake here tonight as matches are being played on the grounds of the national campus here in Lake Nona. It's exciting when you, um, you know, you get down to Friday night and, you know, this, the time is obviously 6.05 and we're still down to matches, right, that still count, that are still live. And I like that. That's exciting. It, it is. makes everything stay really exciting. Yep. High intensity. Uh, both of these guys, of course, look cool. Uh, as they say, cool is the other side of the pillow, and uh, or cool as a cucumber. But um, you know they're they're high intensity players, but uh, cool on the outside and cool on the exterior. Good look at Shingo Kunita, who had a just really outstanding match yesterday against Stefan Olsen, only to come up short in uh, what was really one of the great performances of the tournament so far, and Stefan taking out the number one player in the world. Shingo, a little bit of um, a brace, right? Um, brace on his elbow. Yeah, he plays with that oftentimes. Yeah, he's got the the big one on the on the right elbow, uh, 
uh, around the left, and then he's got a little bit of what we would normally kind of call a tennis elbow, mm -hmm. just to kind of give him a little support probably. He had a little back issue in his match uh, the other night, so I don't know if that's anything that's giving him can continue problems, but he looks comfortable right now in the warm-up phase. Gordon looks strong and confident. And these guys have certainly had their fair share of head-to-head -head matchups in their career, uh, but it's Shingo Kunita who leads that head-to-head -head matchup, uh, 19 wins to seven. But uh, of late, these guys have met four times in this year alone, Australian Open, Cajun Classic, Japan Open, and Roland Garros. And it's Kunita with three of those wins out of the four this year. But it was Reed in the Japan Open taking the number one player down in his home soil in three sets uh, earlier in the year. So the one win this year to Gordon Reed in Japan on the home soil. Uh, last year at this event, it was Reed in straight sets over Kunita. And again, long and uh, great history between these two great players. Their competition dates back to 2012, so it's been a good six years on the tour for both of them that they've been competing against one another. So long-time professional rivals. As you take a look at Kanita there, taking on some nutrition in uh, an attempt to stay ahead of the game and knowing that he's going to need a lot of energy tonight to defend against the attacks of Gordon Reed. You can see as well that the, um, well, actually, I don't know whether the camera can pick this up, but um, Shingo's pretty good taped on the back, on his neck, on the left side of his neck. Yeah, um, he had that the other night yeah, as well. Yeah, he had it the other yep. night. I know that he's been um, nursing that neck a little bit on the left side. I was wondering yesterday when I heard the trainer be cold whether it was anything to do with that, but obviously not. It appears that it's Gordon Reed to start things off here in our last match on center court tonight. The left-hander from Scotland. I'll do my best Sean Connery accent here. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. Not going to do that. Can you do a good Scottish accent? You being a Brit? No, no? I can't even do a good British accent anymore. Oh no, that's that's embarrassing. I think. I know. Is it in a little bit? I, it, I need, if I need to turn it on, I can. You can. I know you can. I'll just start pronouncing every letter. Letter. We were going down the list of words the other night in the office with some of the ITF folks. You know, making sure that their schedules were right. That, that's more of a South African thing, too, though. Oh, yeah. Schedule. Schedule. But then he took a lot for that, so he just started saying order play. There you can see the tape really well from Chinga on the back of the neck. Early good start to read on the service game. really flatten that ball out. Yeah, and uh, it was that forehand error that reminds me of the struggles that Gordon had in his opening round match. Uh, it was the forehand that was mostly letting him down, but we'll see if he's worked through some issues on that during some of his training sessions. While well, he's been here, going through the competition, and these players at this level oftentimes can just kind of get one good training session in in the midst of a competition like this and, and get themselves fixed, as it were. He's put a lot of time in, too. I've gone past his practice sessions quite a few times where when I came back, I thought he'd be done, and he wasn't. He was still in, then came out again and thought, oh, he's going to be done again, and wasn't. So he's definitely been putting in some good time while he's been here. Hmm. Forehand error by Cuneta right there. Both players looking pretty comfortable. Gordy just kind of slices that ball back to himself there. Preparation for this 
serve and hopefully hold early on. Reached a little bit for that. Needed one more push to get a little bit closer to that ball. You know, that's one of the downsides of these guys that play with the with the offhand off the wheels uh, on their forehand. Sometimes it comes off just a little bit too early as they attempt to get that extra rotation in on their forehands, and you'll see that a lot from the Brit. And, um, you know, sometimes if it comes off just a little too early, now you're forced into that, that exact situation where you're reaching. See where Shingo's setting up his starting position. It's really towards the middle. He's really egging... Gordon to hit that serve out wide, slice out wide, and I'm, I'm surprised with him, you know, with Gordon obviously being the lefty and being able to slice just that ball so heavy to start that far over, but... Well, it's where he starts, but he knows he's, he's got to get some, some speed up, so he has to start that far over in order to allow himself to push aggressively and not be pushed out of the court too early. If he starts off uh, a little bit more central, by the time he gets the speed up, he's going to be too far out. So it's, it's a calculation. Again, having played this guy so many times, he's, he's got that pretty well dialed in, I think. See both with players in their Uniqlo gear. What do we call that? A kit? A gear? What do we call that? Kit, gear, kit. Something like that. Yeah. Shirt, what language. jersey, kit, gear. Not jersey. That's Not jersey. An Amer- that's an American football thing. It is, but some plays call it, still call it a jersey. Yeah, you're right. It's mostly mostly American football and basketball. But uh, you're right. Both Uniqlo sponsored athletes. Along with Mr. Roger Federer, the greatest of all time. Goat. One of the better forehands by Reed right there. Oh, it's a wicked slice too. Great slice there, really just slicing and dicing. So I think I have a. Ch- uh, did I say challenger? We've already said we've already talked about this, but the slice here. See this point where Gordon just he starts off the slices right here. Yep. Cuts. Big cut there, and Shingo just didn't quite get underneath No, nope, didn't get a good read on that one, and it checked up pretty tight. I challenged myself to Federer, Shingo, and Reed already, right? Did I f- challenge myself to get that done? No? Am I dreaming it? Uh, by the look on your face, I'm dreaming it. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> I don't Losing know what my you're mind. That's, that's about, okay. Yeah, I, I normally do. I mean, you're normally I you very said, articulate. I thought you said that you. I thought I remember saying, okay, I'm gonna. You, the challenge is on. So. My vision for 2019 oh, to get those U.S. Open, guys, right? To get those yeah, guys to get together. those guys. See, okay. I'm not losing my mind. You no, are. no, 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 no. You're right. Now I'm losing my memory. Apparently, yeah. You know, and then when you get to this age, you know that that's the first signs, right? Yeah. yeah. So I might need some help with that, okay. but you're looking at me for. No, I'm not looking I'm at you. Dying. I'm actually thinking more of Brian, but you know, okay. with his with his list. But okay. yeah, Shingo, Gordon, and Roger mm. playing tennis. It's a pretty nice thought. Throw. Uh, Throw Kay and Ishikori in there. Yep. Maybe uh, maybe Shingo and Kay link up as countrymen, and it's Gordon and... It's the uh, Asia and, uh, versus... Asia's versus Europe. Yeah. Oh, that's a nice one. Maybe there that's a way to, way, to, maybe way to sell okay. that. Game on. There it is. That's a good serve. Boom. Yeah, it is. Great serve out wide both times, pulling Gordon out wide. You know, you, we, we've seen... Uh, Shingo typically just really cranking the spin, but that one pretty flat. Yeah. You know, he merely kind of uh, took a little bit of the kick out of that one and laid it out there pretty good. Which I've I've always been a thought, uh, always thought of him as great as he is. That's a that's a part of his game he could add because uh, he tends to just really go heavy on the spin. And I think players eventually get dialed into that, just like everything else. I think if he'd mix in a few more serves like that, I think that could only help him in continuing to be as great as he is. Cunita with a quick 40 love lead on his service game, opening service game, Reed having already held. Just 
taking a peek at Shingo's ball bag on the back of his chair there. Honda, the power of dreams. As he has also got a sponsorship through that great company. Obviously the sponsor for this tournament, NEC. I, I like the guy. I like the fact that the guys have at least worn different colors, right? Yeah. I don't know, how would we have told them apart? Yeah, I don't know. That yeah. would have been hard. Here's a great shot of the NEC banner. Long yeah. time supporter of the, yeah, of the 20, wheelchair tennis. 25 years. Crazy, right? That's but, a great. And, and what a wonderful partnership. So yeah. thank you very much to NEC for all that they've done to support this sport over the years. Got some, any, well, we'll have some NEC execs here this weekend. Um, I believe they were flying in today, so they'll be here this weekend, be able to show them you know, our campus here. and My ball's well out. Show them the campus, see you know how they like it here and how they like the site. And then obviously all the other sponsors as well with Uniqlo, as we see on their clothing, and then the ITF and obviously USDA. So... Had Bringing some, all the big dogs together. <laughs> yeah. Had some local sponsors as well. Really, um, you know, just trying to give the players a different experience where our hotel is. There's a couple of really nice restaurants, and some of the restaurants um, put in some money towards dinners for the players at night so they didn't have to eat here on campus all the time. So that was super nice. And the Uniqlo sign at the back um, and the blue around the side of the courts, done by a local company as well, 407 Wraps and Signs. So... We're appreciative of them and their thought process and help as well. Awesome. What's the chances of a guy like me getting a hold of one of those uh, deals for a restaurant? Uh, not very good. Not very good. Okay. No. Well, I appreciate your honesty and candor. <laughs> not good at all. All right. Back to coverage. <laughs> Shut that one down quick. <laughs> We're talking about sponsored by IBMS to um, ABC Medical too. They have been, I mean, they have been a super amazing sponsor of wheelchair. Sorry, let's hear what's going on here. We're getting on. a little question nope. on that last call. And by my calculations, that uh, that ball looked cleanly in, but uh, I don't have the best vantage point. But on the screen there, I don't know if we can get a replay of that last point, um, just to see how close that ball was. That was the questioning more the score. Mm -hmm. 15 all. Here's a replay of this big forehand by Shingo. Oh, and good. the back of the line. They called it out, but then I think that the question actually wasn't the line call. I think it was the score. Right. So that was what was Gordon was saying. No, I lost the first one. Gordy's got some uh, some good uh, body language early tonight. You know, I mean, he was a little flat on the first night of play here. And again, you know, maybe it's the travel, maybe it's the conditions or whatever. But uh, tonight, he's got some good energy. Uh, heard a heard a good exclamation from him after his first opening round or opening service game. You know, and just the first game of the match, he's already like, come on. And so uh, good to see him with some, some spirit and some energy tonight because uh, he knows what's at stake here in this match. So he's got that, and Shingo's got it. We're in for a good one. Beautiful volley. Yeah. Yeah. Solid. I was just thinking throughout the entirety of that point, just how much these guys uh, crank spin. I mean, just just amazing amount of spin on the balls. They they don't flatten too many out. I just control the shots with the spin and the locations. And then, of course, with their great mastery on the wheels. And you can see right there, finished by Shingo. Cracking the tape with a little extra. Sauce. Gordon looked like he's very determined to keep that serve to the Shingo backhand on the on the deuce side there, even to the extent of missing that one pretty wide up the middle there, but 
looks like that's a pattern that he's going to want to try to establish early on here, but now down a break opportunity. He guessed the right way <laughs> he there, did. too. Yeah, he did. Just couldn't quite get there. But it's the, it's the break of serve by Shingo Kunida. And as they go around for the first time to an official break, it's him leading two games to one. Yeah, ABC Medical, sorry, I'll go back to that just because I think they're an important part of the sport, not only tennis, but any adaptive This point here is just so good, the way that, you know, Shingo looks to turn really quickly, and he did not want to let that bounce twice and no way. just missed it, right? There yep, but side. did watch here. He just gets enough added depth yep. to be able to push forward aggressively. Now circles, cycles, sees Back. what he gets. And then comes forward yep, again. Yep, on the wheels. And he was not, he did not want that to double bounce there, no. to bounce. Away. Yep. So you were saying about ABC Medical. I know you want to finish that story, and and you should because they've been a great, uh, great agency and a great uh, company it's not, to yeah, work with. Not not only just for wheelchair tennis, but they're a big supporter of wheelchair sports in general, and they've um, supported University of Alabama big time with all their adaptive programming. And you know, University of Alabama has the largest adaptive sports program in the country, and they've got their own buildings and. It's just a pretty amazing. Mackenzie's from there. We've got a great tennis team there it's where most of our young players go to play tennis. Stays, yep. Yeah. yeah, I've been to that facility uh, just this past year, and it is remarkable. Their adaptive sports facility there housed on the campus of uh, University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and it is it is a remarkable facility. Do they like to be involved? It helped us this year. They actually helped a couple of players come out for the um, wheelchair Collegiate national championships. I had to think about that for a second. Um, they actually helped a couple players that couldn't afford to come out, pay for them, and then sponsored some of the event too. So right. I love that they're here. Um, they came out to the U.S. Open, supported us there, watched, brought people out for the day. So very, very exciting. We were both, you know, we both did a bad thing there, Joe. We talked about the University of Alabama and what did we not do? Say roll tide. There it is. Yeah, you can't bring that up and not say roll tide when really? you talk about it. Yeah, you can't, you can't do it. I wouldn't know. You wouldn't know about that. I'm just letting you know. That's the rules. Kentucky. Oh. Go Cats. Go Cats. All right. Well, then if you're going to talk about the Cats, <laughs> no. then talk about it. But when you talk about Alabama, you got to say roll tide. Went to one of their football games for the first time this year. It is an amazing experience there in Tuscaloosa. Their they're rabid fan base. Uh, of course, one of the, without question, maybe one of the best American football programs Ooh. and uh, 100,000 screaming screaming Alabamans in that uh, in that stadium Gordon missing big there yeah yeah it's uh yeah both players coming out with really good energy early wanting to establish themselves so far it's Canada with the slight edge Now Shingo just being a little bit more aggressive and consistent at the same time. Going a few too many unforced errors just here and there. And a chance to have a potentially easy service game here. great return yeah it is and uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the read forehand but there was nothing wrong with that one I'll tell you what that's uh, as good a swing as we've seen him put on the ball uh, any of his matches real smooth
still another chance here to for Kanyeda to hold and go up 3-1 in this first set. Yep, fairly uncharacteristic double fault there. It'll go to the towel, reset. Very routine based player, Shingo Kanyeda. See him having a little mini conversation with himself. Almost guarantee this one's in. That's outstanding. That is a nice slice from Reed, but an equally or actually better response from Kaneda. Kaneda looks a little fresher today, a little bit more... Um, Pep in his step? I was going to say that. You were? That's what I was going to say, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Watch this exchange here. Yeah. Slice, pulls him out. Watch that. Look at that slice. slice and then man. here you go. Mm. Yeah. Just carves Just that thing it. over there. Yeah, sees the opening, but then really knows that he's got to keep it super low to, to make sure that Gordon doesn't get a chance to get it. Yeah, I think a lot of players in that position make the mistake of going for that far line in an attempt. It's just getting it on that path with the with the with the excessive spin, and it'll continue to travel off the court for you. But it, the key is getting it over, down, and then let the action on the on the ball work for you a little bit. As it continues to travel. A lot of players will sail that one through the through the sideline. Oh, they'll try and go too deep too. He wants that back. Yeah, he jammed himself a little bit. Almost just pushed himself right into that one. Get didn't give himself a chance for any extension at all. Interesting behind us here. A little bit of an insight. Got um, Shingo's hitting partner, physio, train. I'm not sure which it is, but got two bags of ice ready to take down on the court behind us here. And it's not hot out. So that's it's interesting. I don't think they're hot water bottles. No, I don't think so either. Right? No, not likely. Reed with an early start to getting a hold here and keeping things close. Oof. That's a good shot. Yeah, both players swinging out pretty aggressively on that point. Right from the get-go with the serve from Reed to the response from Kineda. And uh, kind of a slugfest back and forth until it's Shingo painting a line. Gordon's staying aggressive, though. I like that. Yep, agreed. Two chances here to hold serve. He's not liking that toss on that side. A couple of those go already. Again, he probably should have caught that one. That was not a good toss. Probably knows it. See if he makes that adjustment. that continued aggressive approach by Reed. You know, one thing I noticed with Shingo is um, his speed in turning the chair. 
I mean, I, I don't know whether it's just I can hear his chair more than what I hear. But yeah, you can hear the, the kind of the cutting sound yeah. of the wheels that make it, it makes sound? it sharp, yeah. but it's not it's not inefficient. No, it's just really no. hard and smooth. Yep. And it really, it's just like sneakers on a, on a gym floor. Yep. Uh, when basketball players are on there, you hear the squeaks mm-hmm. around the tennis court. Oftentimes you hear uh, the tennis players with the squeaky feet. And then for him, it's, it's the wheels, right? Yeah, but he's so quick when he turns. Mm-hmm. And he seems like one of the fastest movers with that of turning. I remember seeing a couple of YouTube videos of him training. And it was all about that turn. It was just like turns, turns, turns. And obviously everyone trains like that. But it's th- that was pretty amazing. Yeah, he was fairly revolutionary in uh, some of his approaches to, to training, which is kind of what vaulted him up to the top of the top of the rankings for so many years and is what kind of established him as really one of the greats to play the game of all time. Uh, but it was uh, they've chronicled some of the things that he's done, unique training styles, dedication to repetition. He's been getting a good look at some of the folks in the stands supporting both of the players. The, the guy in the orange is uh, Gordon's coach. Guys standing up are from the British Tennis Foundation um, that do the sports performance for um, the wheel, wheelchair players. Um, I just noticed as well that Shingo, when he comes down to his uh, bench, has some notes written down. Always paper. has, yep. Yeah. Always, always see that with him on the changeovers. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big fan of that approach. Uh, help to keep the focus. I wonder whether he does something new for every match or is it a get? Oh, cat and mouse. What's going to be? Oh, mm. there's that, that was that quick turn there yeah, again. He was, he was so there. quick to turn. So I wonder whether that's new. There's a new notes based on his opponent or whether that's more mental toughness stuff where he just is the same thing over and over. Yeah, I think it could be uh, maybe a combination of both. I mean, it's likely that it's what are some keys to success against Gordon? What are some, you know, key indicators of how he's playing himself, things to keep him on track, uh, just mindset stuff that he wants to have to rely on reminding himself of. But uh, it would be a, it would be a good uh, tool for a lot of young players to start implementing in their games is to have those notes on the, on the changeover because uh, a lot of times you can just drift off and, and really have no great thoughts in your head at all. And uh, when you don't want game plans to stay in place, it's important to remind yourself of what they were in the first place. Any good, um, I, I'll say this first, and then I'll ask you your opinion of it or your thoughts behind it. I know that this was many, many years ago, so it was before I met some very um, detrimental people that probably now I would say that I'd have different books with me. That's a great return. Yep. But um, when I was playing, I actually had something that I called my tennis Bible. Just this return there, just taking it on the rise, getting it straight through the singles line, great shot. Um, I called it my tennis Bible, and it wasn't actually a Bible but it was by Anthony Robbins and it was called Awaken the Giant Within. And there were just so many good points in there that were consistently highlighted more about, you know, how you can change your thought process and and in an instant, it's your choice to change it. And, you know, making yourself feel better instead of speaking with this certain word, use this word, you know, how, how are you today, Paul? I'm fine. I'm fantastic. You know, it's just very different. I'm fine to fantastic. Same, same kind of meaning, a little bit stronger. Um, any books out there that you are just a huge fan of that you know you think that players read or could read? You know we've uh, we here at our program, and you're certainly very aware of this, of course, um, having been instrumental in bringing in a sports performance expert in uh, Alistair McCaw. But one of the one of the books that he's written and we've used here with our athletes is uh, champion minded right yeah and so um that's the it's kind of trying to help us build our culture here in the u.s with our wheelchair tennis program and so we've exposed uh, most of our young players to that book and that program and uh listening to alistair's presentations uh, and i'm a big fan of alistair by the way uh, believe in his product and all that he has uh invested in in being a great um sports uh, performance expert but so that's one. Um, I know the Energy Bus is one that I've worked with um, with the Florida Southern team that I help coach uh, over in Lakeland, Florida. is a, is a great, uh, great easy read. 
and it's just got some again kind of to your point some easy things that you can reference from the book it's it's not anything overly deep or or too i don't know too overly educated it's a simple read and it's a and it's a quick easy read too by the way so i would I'm would encourage folks to go out and maybe invest a little bit in those yeah, Alice has been, I mean, obviously, he's, he's been instrumental for us, and that's where I was kind of going when I said that wish I'd had, that's a good return. Uh, gives uh, Gordon a breakpoint opportunity here to tie it at three all. It, beautiful down the line. Wow. And that will, if he gets that, will take us into our favorite game of the uh, <laughs> Don't. Uh, set. Not again. You know, I go every, amazingly, every set has two of those. We have, yep. I mean, every time, every match will have at least two, if not three. What right? are the chances? <laughs> Pretty good, 100%, actually. 100%, <laughs> right? Yeah. But, yeah, he's been, Alistair, just listening to him and working with our athletes has been huge for that stuff. And that's where I kind of said, you know, I didn't have those people around. I had the gym layers. That's a great shot. Oh. That's unbelievable yeah, touch yeah. from that. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, but, yeah, Alistair's book, again, here, look at his push there. I love the, that backhand as well, just being able to take his left hand off the wheel. And he's just, it's so classic. It's a classic. It, it looks like if you just cut the bottom half of him off on the video and look mm -hmm. you go okay that's like a beautiful classic backhand it's stunning Here. Yeah, but, uh, Almost kind of like a surprise attack. I think he yep. caught Gordon off, off guard there. And uh, wow. I'm, I'm, su I'm surprised a lot more people don't do this. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, he got lucky there with the net cord, I think, because otherwise he'd been in trouble there. But yeah, he, I'm not sure he realized that. Probably a little oh. late coming in. Yeah, no, I mean, maybe he not. I mean, put that on Gordon's Gordon, forehand. Yep. I'm surprised I don't see more people kind of doing that, kind of sneaking in. Um, to take the volleys, you know, off, especially off a high one. I mean, and I know that's obviously really hard, the swing volleys, but we've seen players do it. And from a potential a, break yeah. to a great hold by Shingo Kuneda yep. as he extends his first set lead to four games to two. Uh, and I'll go back to the books and the reads uh, as it pops into my head. Uh, certainly I'm a little more old school, um, but, you know, oldie but goody. Brad Gilbert winning ugly. Oh my you know, God! Never, uh, never, never gets old, right? Never I gets mean, old. If you can get a copy of that one, I, I would encourage it. Uh, any young tennis players wanting to get some pointers on how to uh, attack the game and just put some simple game plans into your into your weaponry. Uh, big fan of that one. Winning Ugly was the book, actually, when we talked about, um, you know, Andre Agassi, too. That's where that constrictor mentality came right, in. Right. And he that's actually what Brad Gilbert talked about in that book. You know, he actually said, like, you know, that's where that's where I got it from, was he just, he tried in that first set. He didn't care whether he won or lost that first set. He was just going to work his opponent side to side to side to side. So by when it came to the second set, you know, it was... Um, person was just couldn't handle it yep just taking wearing your opponent down until they just either physically or mentally break and it's Kunita looking for the break here to go up 5-2 and it's Reed looking to hold on this thing from getting out of control Yep, yep, it's a nice point right there. Shingo looking confident again. We're getting a good look at the... the actually, the, the ice stuff. bag right there that mm -hmm. he got given and the notebook right there yep. as well. It looks like it's a little worn. <laughs> That's a good sign. Yeah, right, yeah. Well, if you're putting it into practice on a regular basis, it should not should look that way.
Aw, oh, beautiful. And the fist pump. And now a chance for Canada to extend that lead to five games to two, which would really be a nice position for him to be in and certainly something Gordon would like to avoid. Yeah, that's just a couple of tacticians on the court right there, and ultimately it's Cuneta that comes up as the superior one. That little rascal sitting there, enjoying a little tennis on a Friday night. Nice, some of the programming coming off the courts now and stopping by to take a peek. Said tomorrow will be a very different, I think he realizes on camera you think maybe. So? I don't know, we could you get him to try guy. and talk. Not talk. Hey, he has a Star Wars jacket on. Look at that. No way. Yeah, he had a Star Wars jacket on. We need to I'll go bet back you, to I'll that bet shot. You I'll bet you can't even name five Star Wars characters. <laughs> oh, maybe Luke Skywalker. Walker. What about that? Obi okay. Kenobi. Oh, you're oh, two Han lucky Solo, ones. Oh. Chewbacca. Oh, like, where are you I, going? I guess I picked the wrong category there. The, I guess you're the lady well with that The lady with that USTA wheelchair tennis hat on is our ABC Medical sponsor. She's director of mar uh, marketing for ABC Medical. Um, I believe that is one of our NEC um, yeah, executives right there, too. And I hate to say this, I, I know those two, but which is the the little guy that he had the jacket on? What was his name? The, the kid that had the jacket. I don't know who the kid is. No, but the, <laughs> the character of the Star Wars. Oh, is that R2-D2? R2-D2, that's exactly what I was meaning to. Okay. That's a great shot right there, even for just a moment to watch from far away. But uh, in close, it's Shingo Kunita, 5-2 serving in the first set with a chance to take a one set to love lead over Gordon Reed. How you like that? That rhymed. It did. That's oh. a good shot. Yeah, good it shot. is. Yeah, it is. He holds his shots for a long time. When when he does, very effective, you know. And I well, think sometimes it's it he gets off him real quick and real in an attempt to generate all yeah. that spin. If you but, see this here, he just it he just, when he gets pulled out wide, especially the wide ones there, he just holds it for that one second. And as you said, I'm taking words out of your mouth here, but yep. when it works, it works. I know it sounds silly, right? But it, it's a it's a chance you take. That's a great shot. It is. Here we go. He's gonna roll that, and this is going down line. Oh, he, just, he needed to be a little bit more aggressive with that. Yep, he yep. just thought he had it. He thought he could. Yep. He? he did. Yeah, look how beautifully that chair rolls. Nice job by Gordon there to get to the 30 all. Look at this work right here. Again, changing that grip a little bit too, just a tad, mm -hmm. right? Push and then just turned it a little bit. He goes pretty semi-Western with that grip. He's actually pretty extreme for that grip. 30 all.
You, know, you see both of these guys landing balls in the service box, which would typically be, uh, you know, kind of a problem. But with the amount of spin that they have, mm -hmm. the ball just continues to extend deep into the court and through the baseline. So yep. uh, they can be high percentage by ripping that spin. But because it explodes off the off the court, it still kind of keeps them in a reasonably safe position. Those half volleys too. We're seeing a lot of half volleys off the baseline, and you know, half volleys. I, sh I shouldn't. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's a half volley, mm -hmm. but when they play that half volley, they've got to. You know, everyone has to make sure they're really extending through the ball forwards. There's obviously no backswing. It's really short, but when you hit it, you can't just stop it. He kind of stopped that last one there. There was no extension after he hit, hit the ball to push through. It's now Gordon Reed with a break chance. First break chance there in that game, gone. He has some hard work by Shingu, and you see him kind of a sigh of relief there. As he fights that one off, kind of goes through his routine again. Takes his time, no rush. And it's something I see a lot of players that they rush, rush to get into that next point. And here he is getting some clear thoughts in his head, clear game plan, and then goes to work. from court behind us, Baus, Baus, I'm getting better at that, right? And Van Coot, three games off. And another break point opportunity for Gordon Reed. To stay alive in this first set, down 5-2 to Shingo Kuneda. Slaps that forehand winner down the line to get the break. Beautiful right there. Moved in, took it so early though. Gordon really didn't have a chance. I mean, Shingo didn't have a chance there to even recover after the serve. Yeah, just lifted straight up, didn't go across and over to his other shoulder on that swing. Just stayed on it, up and through. But still in a hole here, two games down, serving big crane flying through the campus right there. If you're not familiar, that's one of the native birds here in Florida. Just got a sighting of that. It's kind of like having a squirrel moment right there, Joe, I'm not gonna lie. It's like, what is that? <laughs> what is that, a pterodactyl flying through the campus? But they're big, majestic birds. This could get interesting here if uh, Gordon can hold. Absolutely. Yeah, when they take off, you know, on the on the monitor, when those some of those shots take off, you think, oh, no way, and uh, you just really can't get a sense. I mean, the ball's rotating so quickly yeah. that you can't get a sense of of how much spin uh, is on it that will pull that ball down and really well inside the line. And if you think about it, tennis is really just a pure game of geometry. I mean, that that was Shingo knew the ball was below the height of the net, right? That he could, he had to swing fast at it, but he knew he needed to take a little bit off because otherwise it wasn't going to drop. If he'd driven that too much, it would have pulled it deep. I hated geometry in school. <laughs> I've already commented on the on the broadcast uh, how inept I am at math, but it is. It's a game of math. It's a game of percentages. A uh, game that uh, can be statistically based and analyzed. Certainly analytics is something that's uh, become very mainstream in the high levels of tennis these days on the Pro Tour, WTA, ATP, and certainly on the Uniqlo Wheelchair Tennis Tour. Um, a lot of time 
uh, is spent in the analytics of the game, analyzing players' tendencies, uh, looking at statistical analysis to determine patterns and strengths and weaknesses. Really needs to be an integral part of every player's approach. hold that. That was nope. pretty obvious where he was going. And Shingo knew he was in trouble. Yep. Yeah. Gordon read that one perfectly early. He was uh, literally sitting on that one. Thirty all. Reed serving to keep this set still in play for him. A chance to make a nice comeback here. That's a bad time for that. That's tough. You've just fought really hard to get yourself into a, posi a good position and then just that double fault. Mm -hmm. See if you can get right back to work with a nice first serve here. Get the confidence back up. Set point and a second serve look for Shingo Kunita right here. Wow. Oh, too much wow. angle by Reed. The height of that drop shot was pretty amazing. And it was what ultimately gave Reed enough time yeah. to get to it. That's great, though. Turns around there. there. Watch him get on his wheels eventually here. Yeah. Reed's the drop shot. Go. There Go time. Goes. There he goes. Just his hands right there are mm, amazing. Real He's soft, still turning around, too. Real quiet. Yeah. Harder you push, softer you need to be, the quieter you need to be with the racket. You know, you could so translate that to the able body. Because a lot of people, when they're coming in and they're playing, you know, Runs that short ball. Oh, that's a good return. Oh, yeah. Gives Kaneda another set point. A lot of people come into a short ball running really, really hard and then try and do too much with it. And just launch. Yeah, oftentimes. and launch. Yeah. And they try and swing at it. You mm -hmm. don't need to because you've got your whole force of your body running at the ball. That's not geometry. That's physics. I was going to say. I was going to say a minute ago. It's geometry and physics. Okay. Tell that's you. Ah, time. there it is. There's the... Fist pump for the first set by Shingo Kunida. Good quality again, first, first set from both players. Yeah, no, he's just telling the umpire that the ball went behind the scoreboards. So just uh, the scoreboards back there are getting remounted here in the next couple of weeks. Got new sto scoreboards going up. Just weren't quite done in time, but. And there's a big, uh, hey, there's yes, a great look Mr. at the man himself, Stefan Olsen, uh, half man, half Viking. And so uh, we congratulate Stefan as he's advancing into the semifinals with his three wins in pool play. He's looking very comfortable here on a cool Florida night, but for a man from Sweden, <laughs> ain't nothing. He actually, he, he actually said that everyone said it was, um, he, go, he's actually can wave now at us as well. I don't somebody think he let must him, be somebody listening. Somebody let him know. Somebody let, let him know. know. Yeah, they're talking about you. <laughs> I think he's, he's watching and listening, I oh. think. So he's on there. So he needs, yeah, he is. Look, he's showing you the stream. He's, Look he's, at the camera and wave. Look at the camera. Look at the camera. camera? He's not Where? listening. The camera in front of you. <laughs> the one that end. Look at that. Look at the camera that end and smile. No, in front of you. There you go. <laughs> it's not a trick question, Good Stephane. job, Stefan. Yeah. Hey, there. congratulations on uh, moving forward into the semifinals tomorrow. Uh, you've really played some great tennis. Why don't you come over here? Come over here and talk to us. I'll get to you in a second. <laughs> How about you come over here and talk to us for a minute? Stefan, come over here and... Okay. 
come over and talk to us for a second if you get a chance, okay? We'd love to hear about how your match is and how you feel. And there maybe Message received. Message received. Wow, that was a good one. Yeah, it just takes a little time to, <laughs> for us to talk and for it to get through the airways. Probably goes up to some satellite and then back down and over to him. You know, so, so that there is a little bit of I got a good story there. about bananas today. Bananas yeah, or bananas. bananas? Well, okay, yeah. see, the British comes out bananas, okay, right? Okay, yeah. Um, so today, I, it, I had a request sorry. yesterday for yellow bananas, and I'm just being a little facetious, and it wasn't anything bad. Here we go. I'll tell my banana story in a minute. Am I getting to interview yes, here? Wow, Mr. W Mr. Walker's letting me interview you. We're, we're quite proud of that you're listening to us. Yeah, it was quite funny, actually. I, I, I was watching from the hotel room. I just took a shower and everything. And then I came up here and I actually just put on my phone just to, to, <laughs> to watch Facebook or something. And all of a sudden, you're starting talking about me. And it was a picture of me. I'm like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> It was a, obviously we're a second delayed. So I was like, "Hey, look this way! Look this way!" You were really confused. Yeah. yeah. So um, we obviously didn't get to see your match today because we were doing this one. Tell us how it went today. Um, no, I was playing great. Uh, again, uh, today didn't do any mistakes. Um, Nico didn't play his best tennis for sure, not. Um, but I, I, I was solid. I did like I did the rest of the days. So I really kept kept fighting and I really played. Really played well, so I'm really happy. And uh, now through to the semis, I'm, we will see tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be a totally different match against Joe. Um, but I'm really looking forward to it. Going in, obviously, with your round robin with no losses, out of round robin with no losses, obviously has to give you some confidence. Definitely, yeah. The, the, the confidence is high. Um, uh, but uh, the, the job is not done yet. So, I mean, you have to do the job tomorrow as well. Otherwise, uh, I'm not going to win. So, so it's all about the, uh, the, all about the, the work. Tomorrow. Absolutely. So, this is your first time in Orlando, or you've been here before? I've been to Disney World once, actually. Oh, just once. Yeah. How old were you? <laughs> actually, I think I was like 25 or something. So, uh, you were 25 or 25 years ago? No, 25. So it's not too long ago. Not too long ago. No, we had a road trip to uh, Bucharest where I won uh, of the tournaments were back then. Okay. Um, so me and uh, my buddy Anders Hard from Sweden, we just decided to uh, go to Disney World for a day. Fun. <laughs> yeah. Any time to go there afterwards this time? Unfortunately not. Um, my flight is already Sunday night um, to go back home to the family. Okay, and obviously, I don't know whether when you talked to him the other day, but obviously this is our new home of American tennis. And you, you don't have to be nice and tell me <laughs> if it's really good, but tell me just some thoughts, some initial thoughts about it. I love it. I absolutely love it. Like all the, from the details straight away. Um, I've heard like the, uh, all the signs are like, uh, what did you call you? you that I painted them, remember? <laughs> That's what he I said. I told you that yeah, I painted yeah, those on, right? Painted them, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but everything is like totally great with that and the whole facility. It's it's awesome to have these kind of many courts. of have never seen these many courts and even with the small courts over there um, that is fun for for all the family that's what I'm, i was thinking maybe if i if i'm in for next year maybe i'll bring my family and i'll play with my little guy over there little guy yeah and tomorrow you're gonna you're gonna experience a different atmosphere here tomorrow i mean the campus has been built for massive massive um events yeah. right uh, we've had super seniors here with like 1,600 people playing, but tomorrow all the clay courts will be filled with 500 people here. So I think you know I think it's a little different for you guys too because you are playing in a this is a public facility, so anyone can come here and play. So I don't know some of the surroundings, the kids' day, the noises and stuff. I mean, I've played and it never really bothered me, but for me, I'm not I'm not that easily bothered. Um, uh, as long as I'm in my zone from the beginning, it's, it's usually not a problem. So, uh, the, like, I mean, the, the more people is going to come and watch, the, the, the more fun it's going to be. So try and see it that way instead of, like, being annoyed about the, the noise. Yeah, well, there'll be 500 people here. I think they start their matches at 8 a.m. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. So they'll be here tomorrow, and hopefully they'll come out, and they'll be the whole, here the whole weekend, too. So I'm, I'm excited for the different feel tomorrow because be you'll feel a different feel for sure. Yeah, that's, that's really fun. That's going to be cool. Well, Stefan, thank you for coming over and thanks for listening <laughs> thank to you. us. You know? yeah, hey, Appreciate fun. it. You're doing a good job. And we'll, we'll hopefully talk to you after your semi tomorrow, maybe, or mm -hmm. Joe, whoever. We will see. <laughs> I can't say hopefully you because that sounds bad, but either you or Joe will yeah. come and see us again yeah, um, after your semi tomorrow. Yeah, I'm hoping for me, but you never know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> thanks. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thanks.
My first interview, I quite feel quite proud, Paul Walker. <laughs> Back. Well, Joe, I'm going to tell you from a spectator's standpoint, you uh, <laughs> you were you were wonderful, really good. Now it's a it's just a simple conversation with uh, uh, the with the class act, uh, Stefan Olson, and um, he had some really nice things to say about the tournament and about this uh, environment here. And I'll tell you, he had the right things to say in regards to things like crowd and, and maybe some of the noise and everything like that as a, as a true professional tennis player and that kind of stuff is, is stuff that should not uh, be in your head in regards to annoying you it's it's stuff that you either embrace and uh, say hey this is this is why we play the game uh, we play it in front of people or or in silence if nobody else is around but we play because we love it and uh, that kind of distraction is not going to be something that gets into a guy like Stefan Olsen's head yeah and as he said he said himself right whether he's in when he's in his zone when he's in the zone and I think that when you're not in the zone that's when you let everything else around you really interrupt your game right and it does I mean and you and as a tournament director too I mean I listen to all the players and I listen to the positives and the negatives and I really try and see how I can improve the tournament um, you know whether it's the US Open wheelchair or whether it's the tournament here or whether it's a local adult tournament that we may be putting on and you listen to the players but a lot of times too you have to understand where the players are coming from um, you know and, and understand where they're at too because if they've just lost they may come at you <laughs> and be really negative and you just have to understand that and take it almost with a grain of salt and you have to not take stuff personally either right. i mean and just in life in general you I can't agree. do that so you know but I, I keep coming back to the point with stefan uh made this reference a couple of times he's he's a father now uh he's married he's a father uh his perspective on things is, is completely different than it was 10 years ago when he was playing the game and it was a little younger and, and, and maybe a little bit more immature and I don't mean that in any derogatory way towards Stefan just meaning that when you're younger you tend to be that way right and so now as he's a little bit older and a little bit more established in life he sees things through a different lens and I think with a much more mature outlook and I think that is what is producing his best tennis he's just really comfortable with yeah. who he is and where he's at in life and very happy yep and so here we are in the first game of the second set at Deuce, Shingo Cuneta serving. Ever important first game, momentum wise. It's Cuneta with the first chance here. To Again, that's, that's that half volley ball on the rise, however you want to say it. And more on the rise, I would guess, than a half volley moving in. But again, really kept his head down low, pushed his hand through the ball. And I know you'll be glad, or whoever's here uh, doing some work tomorrow, will be happy to interview either Joe or Stefan. We're not uh, we're not playing favorites. No, not we're at all. We're wishing them both uh, a really great match. They're both great players, great fine young men. Yep. And so it's going to be uh, the guy who executes. Oh my. You know when they take us when when Gordy takes a swing like that and it looks so unorthodox, but you know you half of those at least or more go in, and you don't know what the outcome is going to be when it goes up like that. But yeah, that those one. those balls are kind of those balls are the ones where you just go wow. You know, look at that push from Good Lord Chingo yeah, there. Yeah, to get to it is amazing and like, pushing oh, back might again. Not be over. Yeah, and it is. Yeah, and he knows that was that was a good fight too to get to that ball. Mm -hmm. The upper body strength, the way that he obviously leaned forwards a little bit just to get a little bit more speed with the chair. Definitely using that ice. I can hear the ice in there. It's a quick little nutritional supplement in there. And on his way he goes. And switching out the wristbands. Even on a cool night, these guys are yeah, perspiring and working hard. Of course, it's not that cool. I don't. Th I mean, I say it's nice. It's it actually feels really nice out tonight. It's comfortable. So, yeah, yeah. And, the, and uh, as I'm looking at the flags throughout the day, uh, the breeze is still there a little bit, but certainly has died down. So it's it's pretty calm. I bet it's playing pretty true down there on the court.
really solid overhead. MC Hammer time right there, <laughs> Joe. <laughs> That's a good one here. I, I, as I said, he's, I, I like, I like the way all these guys play. Yeah. But this one here, he knew he was gonna. Okay. He's like, he's like, Please come over. Yeah. Bang. Look at that able bodied with the hand up, right? Yep. Of yeah, course. Pointing it out. Just slightly different on the follow through. Obviously, not coming across the right side of his body and finishing, mm -hmm. kind of stopping in front. Definitely using probably a little bit more wrist action than the person that's standing up. It's kind of like a volleyball spike right there. Pulled up a little bit there. Yeah, a little errant return. Yep. For Haven't seen many of those. I mean, Shingo's played a really clean match so far. Yep. But both players played well, but it has been Shingo who's been cleaner. Uh, if we look at a stat line, I'm sure it's uh, Gordon with a few more unforced errors. And so there's the difference uh, as to why Shingo's up one set to love. Oh, look at that target. That was amazing. You know, following up again on something that Stefan said uh, when you brought up the fact that he's 3-0 and in, in pool play and, and that that, you know, did that build some confidence for him and, and he acknowledged that it did, of course. Uh, but then he quickly quickly shifted gears. I mean, he made acknowledgement of his accomplishment so far in the tournament, but he quickly shifted to, to his focus, which is the work isn't done. Yeah, And course. he's not here to just get out of pool play. No. Nope. He's here to win that thing. And, and pool play is to put yourself in a position to possibly to win a tournament, right? Yeah, of course. And so he's got the right mentality about, hey, I got a tough semifinal match tomorrow against Joe Girard, which I'm going to have to play my best Beautiful at to shot. win. And then maybe I'll have a chance to play for the finals. Yeah. Um, so uh, I really, again, uh, a lot of respect for his, his approach and mature outlook on how to attack this tournament. Two great, great points there. Really aggressively... Another one, that's three. I mean, high percentage play right there, but very, very aggressive. And and lethal, right? Yeah. I mean, just, you know, not not out of control, not anything outrageous, just, just relentlessly good tennis. Yep. He'd love to go up here, a break in the second set. Yeah. Yeah, he's feeling it right there and, and yes. that and that run of points. Uh you can tell uh, talking about zone. Uh, he was in it there for that little sequence. He certainly was. Going over for a change of rackets. For the new balls. Yep. A lot, he, of play, a lot of players do that. Go with the um, new racket for the new balls. Strings probably a little tighter. Balls a little more lively, so tighten up. Little, a little tighter on the strings. Yep. Keep that balance of control and power. Exactly. Uh, a really big game for Gordon right here. I think uh, almost desperately he's going to need this break. A three-game lead could be could be almost insurmountable the way Shingo's playing right now. Great big world picture right there of this tennis facility and this match here at center court. As it's Gordon Reed with the first point of this third game of the second set. It's a good shot there of Gordon uh, holding the racket in his fingers, which uh, we, we talk a lot about when we go to some of our camps and teach some of the recreational players and, and some, maybe some players who are pushing with a racket for the first time. And a lot of times they want to they want to grip that racket in their palm and expose their fingers and use the fingers for pushing. But the, the fingers are really inefficient pushers. So it's hold the racket in the fingers and uh, expose that bigger part of the hand and, and combination of that and the racket on the wheel is what's uh, what we use to propel on the racket hand. He 
fits that inside out so well. Mm -hmm. He's just going to pin him over there for a while. Oh, Gordy on the, on the attack are looking for it. Yep, yep. That's a great point. Great angle. Yeah, a lot of great stuff going on at that point. A lot of interesting things. Shingo on the attack. Gordon looking to get back on the counterattack. Ultimately, it's an angled winner by Gordon Reed. This one here is really good defensive shot right there. And then that's the one where he's pulled way off the court. Just use his hands. Look how soft he was Nicely with that. Nicely rolled over. You know, not yep. over hit. Knowing that it's going to be the angle that wins the point, not the power. Great shot. Textbook right-handed swing out wide serve. Ball left in the middle of the court. You know, no, no rush, no impatience there. Just got to it. Puts it in the corner for the winner. Just misses it. Shingo just plays at a higher percentage. He and you know we we talked a little bit about that with Huday mm -hmm. in his match, his last match, right? And said that he plays really high percentage. That Shingo's just got a little bit more on his shots than um, Stefan, but still plays very very high percentage. With Gordon playing a little lower percentage. Yep, yeah, and that's, uh, you know, and, and it's just that subtle difference there in a match like this against these two highly skilled players that's going to create the difference. And it's the guy that can execute on the on the really the simpler game plan, which is what Shingo's operating on, and forcing Gordon into playing that, as you mentioned, lower percentage tennis that's uh, riskier. And so live and die by that approach. But with a double fault, it's Gordon Reed giving... All right, correction, it's uh, Shingo giving Gordon Reed a, a little look here at an opportunity to get back in this set. Shingo taking his time. Gordon knowing that this is an important point. There's that forehand again. He just took just mm. enough off. Yep. To let the ball drop. Yep, but there is there's that boatload of spin on that thing that just, just pulls it down. Just gravity working and spin. Uh, but they got into a heck of a slice fest there between the two of them. Both of them executing those shots beautifully. Went back to Deuce. Shot. Even Gordon on the wheels knows no way he's getting to that one. You know, that's having a real uh, sense of your of your quadrants, as I would call it, on the court, knowing, yep. you know, uh, I'll just utilize all the court, drop a ball into this quadrant, yep. and uh, real simple execution for a guy of shingle skill. Great disguise, too, because there was no way Gordon was going to tell whether that was going to be short as a drop shot or a deep slice. But Gordon knows how important this game is, too. Yeah, and speaking of quadrants, it's uh, a great shot to that deep quadrant there by Gordon that gets it back to Deuce and keeps him alive.
He lined it up. Good. Is there Shingo knows that look? He was like, ooh, that was <laughs> if that gone over, I think. But yeah. But, you know, but that's back to that uh, that yeah. risk reward. You know, that's yeah, percentage, high percentage. You know, that's going to be a winner, and and he's going to stroll over to the ad side up. If that goes in, no question about it. No, nothing Shingo can do about it if he hits that shot. But man, there's a lot of uh, a lot of factors that go into that one going in. Number one being the net. Gordon missed that one actually pretty bad. It's really rolled that quick instead of pushing it out. Kind of got it behind him a little bit. Number three here, I think. Gordon desperately needs this game. He does not want to go down three zero. No, not the way Shingo's playing tonight. No, he knows that that would be a really huge deficit that would be probably very difficult to to get out from under. Shingo's consistently been pumping that serve out to the forehand. He goes a little bit backhand here. Oh yeah. There's again one of the one of the better forehand strokes by Gordon Reed into the corner for the winner and the break. He needed that too. That was a good return as well. Really, wow. Kind of off a half volley, second yep. bounce half volley right there. Great acceleration through that ball. Gordon asking for that banana. Oh, I was going to tell you my banana story. I forgot yeah. about that. Banana story, sorry. All right. So, yeah, yesterday we got asked for bananas. So, um, and apparently they, you know, we'd had them for a little while, so they'd gone a little brown. So I think the umpire, it wasn't a player, actually asked for yellow bananas. Okay, so this morning, <laughs> didn't have any. I tried to use a marker. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Tried uh, to, like, sh like, I like tried the to highlight, like to a highlighter to highlight the brown out? Yeah, I tried to, but it didn't work last night. You know, when you're tired and you've been here for 15-hour days, you, you do some crazy things. Uh, clearly. So this morning, um, on the I stopped at the grocery store early Good energy. this morning. Good energy by Gordon there. Yeah, really yeah. good. Stopped at the so store at 7 a.m. this morning and got a case of bananas for the players. And I wrote notes on all the peels, the skins of the bananas. And I actually saw one of the players taking a picture of it this morning <laughs> when she had it. And I said, oh, what does your banana say? And she said, it says, have a great day. And I was like, oh, that's really nice. I didn't tell her. Yep. Some of the others I said, yellow banana. Mm -hmm. And then on one of them I put yellowish banana. But yeah, you, know, you got to have a little fun while you're I here. I think you do, Joe. I think you have do. Have a great day and smile. And Surprisingly enough, it, uh, honestly, it, it sounds silly, but it, it is simple and little things like that sometimes that can make a difference in somebody's day. It sounds kind of corny or whatever you want to call it, but uh, you're right. You know, maybe that person uh, needed to see that on the banana today. Yeah. You know, maybe they needed to see have a great day just to get them off to a good start. So uh -huh. good on you there, tournament director. So... Get it. That's a great shot. Wow. And yeah, one of the flatter Heavy, ones. Yeah. One of the flatter forehands we've seen Shingo hit in the Beautiful. course of this match. Let's that ball travel into him there a little bit. Gordon hit a good ball. That just. It's just a mm. good shot. Yep. Yep. Didn't move real great there. No, no. Good return. Stuck. Good return, but yeah, deep with a lot of action on it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Gotta keep. I mean, right now with Reed, you know, being down to one as well, it's he's always going to be playing. He's playing from behind, obviously, right? So every game is so important because he just doesn't want to be down that, you know, that 
three one every time two games. Mm -hmm. It's kind of harder to come back. Is that cut again? Oh. Nope. First one was great slice. Yep, yep. That That's slice uh, again. That's that slice where find a lot of the wheelchair players cut it a lot more as well and it goes it's got a lot more movement from left to right on it or right to left depending if you're lefty or righty okay. um, as opposed to a little bit more straighter um, if you're not playing in a chair but it's I love seeing that yep and very effective we've seen a number of players using that very effectively yep That's a good shot. No give up. No. no. Oh, boy. That's a... And that's that's, a, that's where I'm meaning held, hold it. And there's no need to hold it there. He, mm -hmm. could, he should have stayed really aggressive. And snap that he, thing yeah, off. Yeah, he just should have taken it early and stayed aggressive. He didn't need to hold it at that point. When you get those, you know, you see a lot as well, whatever you're coaching and someone has a short ball and they just have to, you just, you should pick your spot and just go play it. And I think he just, again, changed his mind. Well, maybe he didn't change his mind. He knew where he was going, but he tried to be a little too smart with it instead of needing to. Yeah. And, and that's back to your point about, you know, how do you hit a winner? You know, and that, that was <laughs> going to be just hit that ball to that location and and the chances are it's going to be a winner yeah, exactly. and at a minimum it might be forced error and and then the worst case scenario is just comes back but probably not strong and so there's really a bunch of uh, a bunch of scenarios that all are in your favor there if you just kind of really go aggressively into a decent location there are you so, going to use that question with some of your players i am now how do you hit a winner how do you hit a winner oh well you hit a winner by getting a short ball and no you don't well yeah you do but <laughs> Uh, but it's a good early reply by Gordon there with a return to serve winner. But 3-1 Shingo Cronita, one set to love in his favor. Is that it, he did the right thing. I love that. And like s snuck in. It's just missing those those balls that just shouldn't really. He, he does that ninety ninety nine percent of the time. Makes those balls. And he knows with each one of those missed opportunities that uh, you know he just continues to allow Shingo to stay confident, stay loose. Yep. Uh, you know, really probably enables him to stay aggressive. By a, virtue of the free points. Got a good view there of Shingo's team. Oh. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Tried to put it right on his back. Oh. Cat and mouse right here. Oh, and oh that's a miss there. hit winner. Yeah. <laughs> All that point, and then it ends like that. Gordon's like, Ugh. yeah, he's pointing yeah, to the sideline thinking that one was side. out. That, that was, was a great a, point, yeah. though. Yeah, I mean, he tries to put that one mouse, right on his yeah, back. Yeah. They're playing an interesting game of cat and mouse there. But that is, you can hear that on the replay. Yeah. Even. And, you know, you, you talk about people sometimes, they say, oh, got lucky there. Right? And say, oh, it was luck, but. You know, you create your own luck. Yeah. And, I mean, and I'm a firm believer in creating your own luck. And, yeah. When you're as technically uh, efficient and proficient as Shingo is, you know, it's it's mishits that are going to be forgiving versus mishits that are going to be unforgiving. Correct. That's uh, a great slice. A great cut, though. And I'm reaching there. Yeah. Oh. oh. That was out. That looked about as out as the other ball was. Yeah, right. Yeah, maybe that's the makeup call. No, that was definitely. Yeah, 
Oh, it's pretty clear cut. Yeah. And I think Shingo would like to have that one back. He had a really good look at that. Gordy was in a tough spot. But 30 love. Still up 3-1 and in control. Looking to extend that control. Constant pressure, though. Shingo's yep. putting on Gordon. I've always, I've always thought Shingo has a look on his face. Uh, all the matches I've watched him play, like, like he knows something that everybody else doesn't, doesn't know. know. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, I mean, it's just a, it's just a certain look he always has, and uh, obviously. Being as great a player as he is, maybe maybe he does, right? Yeah, maybe but he does. But to me, it's just always kind of that, yeah. Love the way Gordon's trying to pump himself up here, though, you know? Missed a couple easy, vo easy balls that could have really gone bad for him, but he's, playing, he's sticking to his game. He's sticking to it. Yeah. yeah, he knows he's not, like, out of this thing. He knows yeah. he's right there. I mean, it's so close. Uh, it's tight. He's had a number of these deuce games that just mostly have gone Shingo's way. And if he can just kind of flip that around to his favor, you know, he can kind of turn the tide a little bit. But he's got to do it sometime soon here. It's a good shot. That forehand has been uh, as good a forehand as we've seen from Gordon uh, all tournament. And he's hit that shot right there a number of times to that exact target. Yep. And so uh, that's no fluke. That's, uh, that's, a, that's a ball that he's very comfortable with right now from that same location. Yep. But again, still really high percentage. Mm -hmm. Advantage read. Big serve by Shingo there. Yeah, really went after that one. Pretty aggressive there up the tee. It's Gordy now that wants to take a little time and maybe let Shingo cool off for a second. Shingo ready to go to work. Yeah, I, um, like, it. I like it that Gordon just did that, though, yeah. making Shingo wait, because it's been the other way around. Mm -hmm. So I like that. Yeah, that's that's uh, controlling the tempo. It's important uh, for young players to know there's ways to do that um, without being, you know, uh, sh you know, showing it off or, or to being unsportsmanlike. It's just within the confines of of the game, keep the tempo moving or, or slow it down a little bit. Disguises it so well, but that's an unbelievable get. He's going to get it, and he's that's there. and he's going to be here too. Wow. And the point starts over. Yeah. Oh. Well, let's do it on that side. He says. Good wow. Lord. <laughs> that's a display right there. I mean, that's that's just. You know what that is, Joe? Shingo Kunita. <laughs> It is. That was, a, if you just watch that, here, this right here, uh, just resetting that point right there and then saying, oh, let's see if you can get to this one. Yeah. Right? And he knows it. It was big. That was a big game right there. It was. You know, you talked a few seconds ago about the, um, uh, the time in between points. At the U.S. Open, we've done uh, some rule innovations, not only for the wheelchair players, but also for the, you know, the... Um, the quality tournaments and that one of the rules they implemented was the time in between points they had a, like a countdown clock and it was interesting because we talked a lot before the tournament about the countdown clock for the wheelchair players and you know how much time they would need and how much time and a lot of it obviously is based on tv right so not having too much dead time for 
you know, just for anything, just really interactive with tennis and making it really fun. And there's there's no downtime. And it was interesting because we we gave a little bit of extra time for the quads, obviously because they need to tape. And there were some people that said, no, I think they need more time. And they we didn't. We stuck with it. And we had no issues with timing either. You know, it was it was very interesting. But that's one of the things as well. You know, U.S. Open plays pretty fast. And the players the players usually play when they're ready and play at a good speed. They There's not many people out there that do it purposefully. You know, Nadal is just so OCD about yeah. all his rituals, yeah, right? Yeah. That that's what takes him longer. <laughs> Same as Sharapova. They're, yeah. It's just it's just what they've been taught about their rituals about taking time. But I was pretty impressed with, you know, so how it worked out this year at the Open. You're telling me that somebody taught Rafael Nadal to dig into his shorts <laughs> before every point? <laughs> he, he was taught that? Uh, I don't know, that part... Okay. Well, I mean, that's the one that sticks out to the, me. Yeah. Well, yeah, of course. But the one to me is fixing the hair and yeah. bouncing the ball X number of times. And, I mean, Djokovic does that. Yeah. You know, well, he cleaned the that up a little bit. He was bad for yeah, a while. But, exactly. Uh, he did fix that a little bit. But it's, it's whatever rituals they want, right? Mm -hmm. What's going on there? Gordon Reed serving in a, in a pretty big hole here. Down a set in 4-1. That's a great angle. It's... Uh, a relentless attack by Shingo Kanita that's put him there. Wow. Mm. Wow. Mm. How mm. did he hit a forehand there? That wow. is poetry right there. Yeah. That is, I, I, you know, I don't know what to say about that. That's watch, great. watch this. I look, it just, just see on this as well when he comes in and then he gets lobbed. All right. It, that amazes me. He's just pushing, and he just, I cannot believe he got around that to hit a forehand. Again, though, really high but percentage the, uh, forehand. The, the chair control, the speed control, getting the speed up and then allowing his body to maneuver the chair around that um, only through training. And again, uh, I say that time and time again. That's something he's he's trained on. You know, he's he's got somebody throwing a ball up. He's he's in at the at the tee and he's getting out and he's circling around to understand exactly how he wants to play that shot. Yep. He never looks like he's straining when he's when he's pushing the chair. I mean, it's hard and he's working and he's pushing, but it doesn't ever look like he's fighting the chair or muscling it. It's just fluid. Wow, that's a great shot. You can tell he's he's into this match tonight. He is. Yeah, really from the from the get go. He's got he's in the groove too. Yeah. I mean, you know, if this match holds true to the way it's going, he and Gustavo tomorrow. <sighs> I'm excited for that one. I I agree. I mean, really, the the, the matchups uh, across the board yeah. are, are looking great. Yeah, and then Stefan and Joe too. Yep. This is going to be two really really good matches. Now he's looking really relaxed. Yeah, tough, uh, tough situation now for uh, Gordon Reed as he drops the serve to drop to a set down in five one. I don't know if you'll see the dejection on his face as he realizes what he's up against right now. Still got two. <clears throat> no, I'll yeah maybe. I know we've got one match going on here still on court number two. The ladies. Baus and De Groot. And it's Gordy with a return to serve winner and a little come on. I mean, you know, he's not he's not looking to be done. I mean, he's played good tennis tonight. It's just Shingo has played great tennis, I think. There's that drop shot again. He's gonna get it though. Yep, he's there. And wow. Ah. Again, that, that drop shot's worked so well for Shingo today. I mean, he's not only taking it down, he's not only taking it cross court, but he's taking it down the line too. Just really, it's been a good choice for him today. And he's been so well positioned to follow it up on the times that Gordon is, has been able to track it down. Not relying on the shot itself to, to win the, just setting things up, saying, all right, I'll be waiting for it when it comes back. Wow, that last backhand. 
Wow. There you go. That's a good point. Great point. Yep. And that again. One, that one backhand from Shingo again, way behind his back. Beautiful. This one. No. Next. No. This very next backhand right here. Uh, no. Next one. Sorry. <laughs> and it's coming. No. Miss, I think it was the one before that. Close, though. <laughs> but, I mean, sh those backhands are just outside the court, way, way back. He was the guy that, that really transformed the game with that shot. And then it's going out of the court, reversing heavy out. I'm not talking just slightly. I'm talking deep and out. And instead of throwing up defensive or neutral, he was able to change the game by going almost into, into offensive modes with the shots wow. that he was hitting from back there. And it was about, you know, I don't know, probably close to about a decade ago that, that he came onto the scene with that kind of game. And it really changed things. And it's why he dominated for so many years. Um, and it's just been one of his trademark shots, and so. Um, but it's with Gordon, uh, a couple opportunities to break here. But uh, that is that is something that uh, Shingo Kanita is really well known for. Gordon staying aggressive in this last game there, but in this in this game, sorry, shouldn't mm -hmm. say this last game, this game here. And these are the paid kind off, of but made that mistake again. As you yeah. said, that's that's the payoff, right? Yeah, and that's just been the difference. Um, that's been why Shingo has, uh, has separated himself here tonight. Oh, catch his tape. Game read. Good and job for Reese, Gordon there. Yeah, hanging in the hair. Yep, yeah, right Have from the start. Two. I give him credit with his first point in that game, even down 5-1. Uh, he gets one one winner, and he can hear his come on. Update on court number two, a set and 3-1 to Van Coot against Baus. And there it is. Pretty as a picture. And from court, here you go, six four three one, and um, a quick little shot there of Marjolein Baus serving to Anik Van Koot, both girls from the Netherlands. Um, wasn't it those two that teamed up to win yes, the uh, Uniqlo doubles masters? Yes, they did two yeah. weeks ago. Coming Good friends, of, yeah. They, coming out of pool play yeah. on the downside of things, yeah. you know, having to fight their way back out. Yeah. I know that, that Anik talked to the kiddos about that today, too, mm. saying that she's got to play one of her, you know, best friends right. in this match. And then um, down on court number four, Yui Kamiji with a win over Munt Jane. Yeah. Munt Janey. Yui Kamiji wins that one. So it's Yui that comes out as well, 3-0 uh, yeah. and o in her pool. So uh, as the 2018 calendar it's ready to close out. It, it continues to be world number one Dita de Groot and world number two Yui Kamiji separate themselves from the pack. Um, the rest are kind of just trying to hang in there, but it's those two that uh, remain at one and two. Class Reed. of the field. Yeah. yeah. Reed needs, looks to hold. And those are the misses that Gordon's Stand. had today that, that just uh, too many of those uh, unforced errors there uh, where Shingo is just you know, been relentless and not let him off the hook with easy misses like that. How much would Shingo like to close this out right here as opposed to have to serve for it? Yeah, just, just energy, right? Just energy converse, uh, conservation. You know, willing to put forth a little oh, on the line. That's a great shot. Yeah. He's had a couple of streaks here in this uh, in this set alone. He had the one earlier that was just... Crazy good. Just really focusing on his breathing here, stretching, keeping his shoulders, you know, pulled back a little bit. I think he's, uh, I think he's very cognizant of, of, of many momentums and that like right there. All right, so Gordon gave me a freebie, but I'm gonna work hard now just to not let him get back to 15 all. That three point psychological, 30, 30 love lead psychological edge is what's gonna keep the pressure on Gordon. And uh, I think he believes greatly in stringing points together. It 
next three match points for Shingo Kunida. Just like that. like having a conversation with I, himself. I, 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 go, I, go say, I said, I'm not sure what that was when he hit the ball, when he grunted there, but I think he said, I'm going to hit a winner and I just made it through to semis. Sounds a lot like that. Is that, that what he said? Me. Yeah, yeah. It's a loose translation. Right? Yeah, He's I like, agree. come on, I'm going to make that. Yeah. That's a great match from Shingo. That was a determined man tonight. He was. And that's no knock on Gordon Reed because uh, I'll tell you what, he played some good tennis, but it was Shingo who played great tennis tonight. And... Uh, you know, secured his position in the semifinals. You see that smile and uh, proud of himself for the accomplishment that he, he uh, had tonight. Yeah, very proud of himself. Good match from Shingo. That's my little buddy with the R2-D2 shirt <laughs> on. That's what I was looking for there. Cute little dude right there. Yeah, very much so. Putting those rackets away and probably get some more restrung tonight, I would yeah. say, or tomorrow yeah. morning. What do they call that? The stringing bar here at the at the tennis. The racket bar. The racket bar. The racket bar. Right? Racket bar. Racket bar. Yeah, kind yep. of cool play right there. There's that notebook. Oh, oh he. Oh wow. Oh, Look yeah. at that. Uh -huh. Notes pulled out right there. That's, that's some good stuff right there in there. Mm, good lessons. Yeah, Just very a, good uh, lessons. Now there. getting right on the on the recovery, uh, bringing out some probably some recovery tools that he uses, nutrition wise. So, this, yeah, this is definitely going to be yeah, the recovery. Gordon, is tough. I mean, you know, I, f I feel sorry for him because he, you know. It looks a little lopsided on the scoreboard, uh, yeah. but, it, but it is not indicative of how competitive the not. match was and how well Gordy played. I mean, he, might say, he might say otherwise, but uh, really, um, you have to give all credit to, to Shingo for pressing the action from the from the starting gun. Absolutely. Love the way the players, at those, these players have come prepared too, came prepared with all the, you know, all the meal prep stuff, all the during stuff, you know, obviously his trainer there put the ice down for him, but sign of a true professional when you come with everything you need. You know, we talked about the beef jerkies last night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? And now all the different recovery, you know, they want to get the recovery drinks in them as quick as they can so they stay hydrated you know, for tonight, um, Gordon, good, you know, tough match, but again, playing someone that's just got so much experience as well. See him loading up waters into the, into the take home kit right there. Yep. Uh, and again, uh, this is, this is science that we're talking about here. And these guys know the importance of how quickly you get that into your system, how match. quickly you begin the recovery. Yeah. Match point right here in this mm -hmm. forehand alley. That's the one where he willed that in. Yeah, pretty and much. And he knew it when he hit it, too. That's, I want to know what he said. Well, he was, was confident aware. all night yep. uh, with, his with team, those shots. His team, his wife there, I believe, in the middle. Those bananas, they don't... Oh, does it say, have a great day? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I don't think I got down to the bottom of that box. It I says, may be, arigato. And that's us thanking him for, you know, some really spectacular tennis. Do have... I know we've got different people here, obviously, NEC, and I think we've got some, you know, different broadcasts picking this up, so it's exciting. He's talking about... I'd love to be... I'd love to know what they're talking about right now. Mm -hmm. He looks very yeah, happy, looks very, happy, very animated, yeah. excited. It's funny to see him pushing around because he does use his feet to push around a little bit, you know? They're kind of just there, and as soon as he um, gets out of his tennis chair, he uses... The regular chair and his foot's pushing him along. Mm -hmm. Always yeah, laid definitely. back in his chair. Yeah. Look at him. He's getting after that banana. He's like, I want it in me. I want it. Yeah. No, but that's a, su a huge part of obviously the recovery as we talk about, you know, as well. So very important to get that in. Yeah. These guys are, are literally, they're, they're machines that need to be fed the fuel. And recap for tomorrow, Paul, Mr. Shingo Kaneda against Gustavo Fernandez. What are we going to expect there? Ah, geez, Louise, we're gonna we're gonna expect physicality from Gustavo as we've seen throughout this tournament so far, and we're gonna expect fluidity from Shingo Kunita. But we're gonna really expect great tennis. I mean, that's that's the only thing I can expect tomorrow between yeah. those two. And then Mr. Then Mr. Olson and Mr. Gerard. 
Yeah, I mean it's been it's been the slice backhand of Stefan Olsen. I mean we we talk so much about the top spin that everybody hits on tour, but honestly, it the, to me the the shot of the tournament so far has been the utilization of Stefan Olsen's dynamic slice backhand and how he is setting up points with that relentless attack off the off the backhand slice, and we'll see how Joe matches up with that tomorrow. But to me, that's the so far that's been the shot of the tournament. And then obviously we're going to start off tomorrow morning with um, the quad semifinal with Lapthorn and Sugino. You know, uh, Sugino is kind of the, the dark horse here in this uh, quad draw. I mean, he's come through into the semifinals, his first ever NEC Wheelchair Tennis Masters, and uh, he's really performed well. He pushed Dylan uh, Alcott around a little bit, uh, straight set loss, but it was 7-5, 6-4 in their round-robin match. And so I think that's a pretty impressive performance. Uh, Andy Lapthorne has kind of had some up and down matches here at the tournament, having had a great match against David Wagner, but then slipping a little bit today against Lucas Satoli. And, uh, you know, sometimes you don't know what to expect. Uh, so with Andy, it's, it's, it's what his level of focus is going to be tomorrow. Um, but uh, it's going to be lefty versus lefty in that match. And it's going to be lefty. And we got three left-handers in the quad draw. Yeah. You know, got Lucas, Andy, and Koji, all left-handers. But I've been impressed with Koji and his forehand and his slice serve and how well he uh, utilizes that as a weapon. So, um, yeah, I think it's just going to be good good tennis from start to finish tomorrow, Joe. And then we go 11 o'clock with the other quad semi with Satoli and Alcott. What's that? You know, uh, I'm going to have to give Dylan a pretty significant edge there. Uh, I think he's got the significant head-to-head -head advantage oh. over Lucas, and, and that hasn't meant much in this tournament so far. But uh, I think Dylan, uh, when he's on his game, is, is the toughest guy to beat uh, in the tournament. Um, he's just got so many weapons at his disposal. He moves, he moves the chair so well. But uh, it was Lucas who was comfortable today against Andy and hitting, hitting really well and clean. But it's just how long he can sustain that. And I think Dylan will ride out some of those waves that Lucas uh, has sometimes when he's on fire. Uh, but it's tough to sustain at that level against a guy who can cover the court like Dylan Alcott. And then a quick recap for the women. So we've got DeGroote playing the winner, I believe, of this match still down here. Okay. Van Coot so an and Baus, I believe. Yep, an old Dutch semi. So I, I could be wrong with that because I don't have the draw in front of me, but I'm right. pretty sure that's the case tomorrow. So, again, another, you know, DeGroote's just, I mean, she's not, she's playing really well right now. She's definitely, I think, a favorite, her backhand just being super aggressive, you know, and she seems really relaxed here as well. Well, it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be Kamiji versus Kapochi. Yep. They and know. it's going to be the they winner know. of the Van Coot right and uh, Baus match against so then, the group. So then we've got Kamiji and Kapochi, and mm -hmm. Kamiji's obviously the backboard that we talked about, yeah. and Kapochi's kind of the little bit of a surprise from here, right? Her first yeah. singles masters, she, and being super aggressive and coming in. I actually like a game. She has a really good all-around game. Yeah, the only thing, and I and I saw her out after her match uh, tonight. I mean, she struggled mightily in that match against with Lucy Sugar with her serve. Yep. And uh, I saw her out practicing afterwards, so I'm sure her and her coach spent some time on that. But that has been the minor glitch in her so far. Uh, and if she gets into that tomorrow against Yui Kamiji, uh, it's going to be a problem. Okay, so I think we're done for the night. Mr. Walker, congratulations for another great day. Thanks for letting me join you. Oh, great having you. We will be back at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time and 3 p.m. Greenwich Time. There it is. And good night to everyone from the USTA National Campus here in Lake Nona, Florida.